Volume One, Chapter One of A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope. Volume One, Chapter One. To be frank with you, Mr. Diamond, I don't believe Dr. Bodkin understands my son's genius. I beg your pardon, madam. You said your son's genius, sir, the bent of his genius. Algy's is not a mechanical mind. Mrs. Errington slightly tossed her head as she uttered the word mechanical. Mr. Diamond said, oh, and then sat silent. The room was very quiet. The autumn day was fading, and the mingling of twilight and firelight and the stillness of the scene were conducive to mute meditation. It was a long, low room with an uneven floor, a whitewashed ceiling crossed by heavy beams, and one large bow window. It was furnished with the spindle-legged chairs and tables in use in the last century. A crimson druguet covered the floor, and in front of the hearth lay a rug made of scraps of black and colored cloth, neatly sewn together in a pattern. Over the high wooden mantelpiece hung on one side a faded watercolor sketch of a gentleman with powdered hair, and on the other an oval miniature of much later date, which represented a fair, florid young lady, with large, languid blue eyes and a red mouth, somewhat too full-lipped. Notwithstanding the years which had elapsed since the miniature was painted, it was still sufficiently like Mrs. Errington to be recognized for her portrait. There was an old harpsichord in the room, and a few books on hanging shelves. But the only handsome or costly object to be seen were some delicate blue and white china cups and saucers, which glistened from an oaken corner cupboard, and a large work-box of tortoise-shell, inlaid with mother-of-pearl, lined with amber satin, and fitted with the implements of needlework, in richly chased silver. The box, like the china cupboard, stood wide open to display its contents, and was evidently a subject of pride to its possessor. It was entirely incongruous with the rest of the furniture, which, although decent and serviceable, was very plain and rather scanty. Nevertheless, the room looked snug and homelike. The coal-fire burnt with a deep glowing light, a small copper kettle was singing cheerily on the hob. Tea things were laid on a table in front of the fire, and a fitful moaning wind that rattled now and then against the antique casement enhanced the comfort of the scene by its suggestion of forlorn chilliness without. But however the influence of the time and place might incline Mr. Diamond to silence, they had no such effect on Mrs. Errington. After a short pause, during which she seemed to be awaiting some remark from her companion, she observed once more, no i do not think the doctor understands algy's genius and that is why i was anxious to ask your advice on this proposition of mr philthorpe's but madam why should you suppose me likely to understand algernon better than dr bodkin does oh because in the first place you are younger nearer algy's own age ah there is a wide gap though between his eighteen and my eight and twenty a wider gap than the mere ten years would necessarily make in all cases Mrs. Errington glanced at the speaker, and thought, in the maternal pride of her heart, that there was indeed a wide difference between her joyous, handsome Algernon and Matthew Diamond, second master at the Whitford Grammar School, and she thought, too, that the difference was all to her son's advantage. Mr. Diamond was a grave-looking young man with a spare, strong figure, and a face which, in repose, was neither handsome nor ugly. His clean-shaven chin and upper lip were firmly cut, and he had a pair of keen gray eyes but such as it was it was a face which most persons who saw it often fell into a habit of watching it raised an indefinite expectation you were instinctively aware of something latent beneath its habitual expression of seriousness and reserve what the something might be was variously guessed at according to the temperament of the observer then there is another reason why i wish to consult you pursued mrs errington i have a great opinion of your judgment from what algy tells me i assure you algy thinks an immense deal of your talents mr diamond you must not think i flatter you no replied mr diamond very quietly i do not think you flatter me and therefore i have told you the state of the case quite openly and i would not have you hesitate to give your advice from any fear of disagreeing with my opinion Mr. Diamond leaned his elbow on the table and his face on his hand, which he held so as to hide his mouth, an habitual posture with him, and looked gravely at Mrs. Errington. "'I trust,' continued the lady, "'that I am superior to the weakness of requiring blind acquiescence from people.' Mrs. Errington spoke in a mellow, measured voice, and had a soft, smiling cast of countenance. 
both these were frequently contradicted in a startling manner by the words she uttered for in truth the worthy lady's soul and body were no more like each other than a peach stone is like a peach her velvety softness was not affected but it was merely external and the real woman was nothing less than tender sensitive persons did not fare very well with mrs errington who withal had the reputation of being an exceedingly good-natured woman if you think my advice worth having said mr diamond i do really now pray don't be shy of speaking out interrupted the lady reassuringly i must tell you that i think your cousin's offer is much too good to be refused and it opens a prospect which many young men would envy you advise us to accept it yes why then mr diamond i don't believe you understand algy one bit better than the doctor does exclaimed mrs errington leaning back in her chair and folding her large white hands together in a resigned manner i warned you you know that i might not answered mr diamond composedly a prospect which many young men would envy well perhaps many young men yes i dare say but for algy do but think of it mr diamond to sit all day on a high stool in a musty office you must own that for a young fellow of my son's spirit the idea is not alluring oh if the question be merely for algernon to choose some method of passing his time which shall be alluring mrs errington drew herself up a little no said she that is certainly not the question mr diamond at the same time before embracing mr philthorpe's offer i thought it only reasonable to ask myself may we not do better can we not do better i begin to perceive thought matthew diamond within himself that mrs errington's meaning when she asks advice is pretty much like that of most of her neighbours having already made up her mind how to act she would like to be told that her decision is the best and wisest conceivable he said nothing however but bowed his head a little to show that he was giving attention to the lady's discourse we have an alternative you must know said mrs errington turning her eyes languidly on mr diamond but not moving her head from its comfortable resting-place against the back of her well-cushioned armchair. we are not bound hand and foot to this bristol merchant by the way you spoke of him as my cousin i beg your pardon is he not so no not mine my poor husband's with a glance at the portrait over the mantelpiece none of my family ever had the remotest connection with commerce ha the good fortune was all on the side of the erringtons this time mrs errington turned her head so as to look full at her interlocutor there met her view the same calm forehead the same steady eyes the same sheltering hand gently stroking the upper lip which she had looked upon a minute before my good sir she answered in a tone of patient explanation my own family the ancrams were people of the very first quality in warwickshire my grandfather never stirred out without his coach and four ah oh yes algy's prospects in life ought to be very very different from what they are of course he ought to go to the university but i cannot afford to send him there i make no secret of my circumstances college is out of the question for him poor boy unless he entered himself as a what do you call it a sort of pauper a caesar and i suppose you would hardly advise him to do that no i should by no means advise it i was a caesar myself really ah oh, well then you know what it is and i am quite sure it would never suit algy's spirits i am quite sure it would not mrs errington's good opinion of the tutor's judgment which had been considerably shaken began to revive i see you know something of his character said she smiling well then the case stands thus algy has turned eighteen he has had the best education i could give him indeed my chief motive for settling in this obscure little hole when i was left a widow was the fact that dr bodkin who was an old acquaintance of my husband was head of the grammar school here and i knew i could give my boy the education of a gentleman up to a certain point at small expense he has had this offer from the bristol man and he has had another offer of a very different sort from my side of the house indeed oh yes perhaps if i had begun by stating that circumstance you might have modified your advice eh mr diamond this was said in a tone of mild raillery why answered mr diamond slowly i must own that my advice usually does depend somewhat on my knowledge of the circumstances of the case under consideration now that's candid and i love candour as i told you the fact is lord seely married an ancrum there was a pause mrs errington looked inquiringly at her companion you have heard of lord seely she said i have seen his name in the newspapers in the days when i used to read newspapers he is a most distinguished nobleman another pause well continued mrs errington condescendingly i cannot expect all that to interest you mr diamond 
perhaps there may be a little family partiality in my estimate of lord seely however be that as it may he married an ancrum she was of the younger branch my father's second cousin when algy first began to turn his thoughts towards a diplomatic career eh a uh, diplomatic oh didn't you know yes he has had serious thoughts of it for some time algernon certainly and in confidence mr diamond i think it would suit him admirably i fancy it is what his genius is best adapted for well when i perceived this bend in him i made indirectly application to lady seely and she returned also indirectly a most gracious answer she should be happy to receive mr algernon ancrum errington whenever she was in town is that all 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 that you have to tell me to modify and so on that would lead to more don't you see lord seely has enormous influence and i don't know any one better able to push the fortunes of a young man like algy but has he promised anything definite he could hardly do that seeing that as yet he knows nothing of my son whatever my dear mr diamond when you know as much of the world as i do you will see that it does not do to rush at things in a hurry you must give people time especially a man like lord seely who of course cannot be expected to to do you mean that you seriously contemplate dropping the substance of philthorpe for this shadow of seely mr diamond what very extraordinary expressions mr diamond took his hand from his mouth clasped both his hands on his knee and sat looking into the fire as abstractedly as if there had been no other person within sight or sound of him mrs errington apparently taking it for granted that his attitude was one of profound attention to herself proceeded flowingly to justify her decision for it evidently was a decision to decline the bristol merchant's offer of employment and a home for her son besides algy's genius there were other objections mr philthorpe had a vulgar wife and a vulgar daughter of course they must be vulgar that was clear and who could say that they might not endeavour to entangle algy in some promise or engagement to marry the daughter nay it was very certain that they would make such an endeavour possibly probably that was old philthorpe's real object in inviting his young relative to accept a place in his counting-house indeed they might confidently consider that it was so of course algy would be a bait to these people and as to lord seely mr diamond did not know how should he seeing that he had been little more than a twelvemonth in whitford and out of that time had scarcely ever had an hour's converse with her that she mrs errington was a person rather apt to hide and diminish than unduly blazon forth her family glories and she was moreover scrupulous to a fault in the accuracy of all her statements nevertheless she must say that there was perhaps no nobleman in england whose patronage would have more weight than his lordship's and whether or not the brilliancy of algy's parts and the charm of his manners would be likely to captivate a man of lord seely's taste and cultivation that she left to the sense and candour of any one who knew and could appreciate her son mr diamond uttered an odd smothered kind of sound eh said mrs errington mellifluously there was no answer hello cried a blithe voice as the door was suddenly thrown open why you're all in the dark here dear me exclaimed mr diamond jumping to his feet and then sitting down again i believe i'm afraid i was almost asleep end of volume one chapter one volume one chapter two of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume one chapter two algernon errington came gaily into the dim room bringing with him a gust of fresh cold air his first act was to stir the fire which sent up a flickering blaze the light played upon the tea-table and the two persons who sat at it and also of course illuminated the newcomer's face and form which were such as to justify much of his mother's pride in his appearance he was of middle height with a singularly elegant figure and finely shaped hands and feet his smooth blooming face was perhaps somewhat too girlish looking but there was nothing effeminate in his bearing all his movements were springy and elastic his blue eyes less large but more bright than his mother's were full of vivacity and a smile of mischievous merriment played around his mouth mr diamond he exclaimed as soon as he perceived who was the other occupant of the room besides his mother you're late said the tutor pulling from his waistcoat pocket a large silver watch and examining the clumsy black figures on its face by the firelight why said algernon i had no idea you were here i thought my mother had sent word to ask you to put off our reading this evening you promised to write a note mother didn't you send it it appeared that mrs errington had not sent a note had not even written one had forgotten all about it her mind was so full of other things 
and then when mr diamond appeared she did not explain at once that algernon would probably not come home in time for his lesson because she wanted to have a little conversation with mr diamond and they began to talk and the time slipped away besides she knew that mr diamond had nothing to do with an evening so it was not of much consequence was it algernon winced at this speech and cast a quick furtive look at his tutor who however might have been deaf for any sign he gave of having heard it he rose from his chair and addressing mrs errington declared with his usual brevity that as no work was to be done he must forthwith wish her good evening no now no nonsense said mrs errington you'll do nothing of the kind stay and have a cup of tea with us for once in a way thank you no i never it is not my habit not your habit to be sociable i know that and it is a great pity what would you be doing at home only poring over your books till you got a headache a little cheerful society would do you all the good in the world you are all but dropping asleep just now and no wonder i am sure after teaching all day in a close school full of boys buzzing like so many blue bottles one would feel as stupid as an owl oneself perhaps i am peculiarly susceptible to stupefying influences said mr diamond with a rueful shake of his head and as he spoke there played round his mouth the faint flicker of a smile now put your hat down and take your seat cried mrs errington authoritatively i am very sorry to be ungrateful but i had asked little rhoda to come up after tea and keep me company thinking i should be alone but he won't mind rhoda she knows her place mr diamond paused in the act of buttoning his coat across his breast you are very kind he murmured there sit down and i will undertake to give you a cup of excellent tea i hope you know good tea when you get it there are some people who couldn't tell my fine pico from sloe leaves algy bring me the kettle and mrs errington betook herself to the business of making tea to her it seemed perfectly natural almost a matter of course that matthew diamond should stay since she was kind enough to press it but algernon who knew his tutor better could not refrain from expressing a little surprise at his yielding why mother said he as he poured the boiling water into the teapot you may consider yourself singled out for high distinction mr diamond has consented at your request to stay after having said he would go i don't believe there's another lady in whitford who has been so honoured if algernon had not been peering through the clouds of steam to ascertain whether the teapot were full or not he would have perceived an unwanted flush mount in matthew diamond's face up to the roots of his hair and then slowly fade away and how did you find the doctor and all of them asked mrs errington of her son when they were all seated at the tea-table oh the doctor's all right he only came in for a few minutes after morning school what did he say to you algy oh i don't know something about not altogether neglecting my studies now that i had left school whatever path in life i chose he always says that sort of thing you know answered algernon carelessly and mrs bodkin oh she's all right too and minnie oh she's all no she was not quite so well as usual i think mrs bodkin said she had a bad attack of pain in the night but minnie didn't mention it she never likes to be condoled with and pitied you know so of course i didn't say anything it is so unpleasant to have to keep noticing people's health poor thing said mrs errington what a misfortune for that girl to be a hopeless invalid for the rest of her life is her disorder incurable asked mr diamond oh quite i believe spine you know an accident and they say that when a child she was such an active creature her brain is active enough now observed mr diamond musingly with his eyes fixed on the fire i don't know a keener quicker intellect what minnie bodkin exclaimed algernon pausing in the demolition of a stout pile of sliced bread and butter i should think so she's as clever as a man i mean he added reading and answering his tutor's satirically raised eyebrows as rapidly as though he were replying to an articulate observation i mean of course i know she's a deuced deal cleverer than lots of men but i mean that minnie bodkin is clever after a manly fashion not a bit missish by jove i wish i knew as much greek as she does i do not at all approve of blue stockings in general said mrs errington but in her case poor thing one must make allowances i think she's pretty announced algernon condescendingly she would be if she didn't look so sickly no complexion said mrs errington intently observing her own florid face unnaturally elongated in the bowl of a spoon don't you think her pretty sir asked algernon turning to mr diamond a great deal more than pretty you don't go there very often i think said mrs errington interrogatively no madam well now you really ought i know you would be welcome the doctor has more than once told me so and mrs bodkin is so very affable i am sure you need not hesitate about going there algernon jumped up to replenish the teapot with an unnecessary amount of bustle 
and began to rattle out a volley of lively nonsense, with the view of diverting his mother's attention from the subject of Mr. Diamond's neglect of the Bodkin family. He dreaded some rejoinder on the part of the tutor, which should offend his mother beyond forgiveness. He had had experience of some of Matthew Diamond's blunt speeches, of which Dr. Bodkin himself was supposed to be in some awe. It was clearly no business of Mrs. Errington's where Mr. Diamond chose to bestow his visits. Neither could she in any degree be aware what reasons he might have for his conduct. "'And the worst of it is, he's quite capable of telling my mother so if she goes too far,' reflected Algernon. So he chatted and laughed, as if from overflowing good spirits, until the peril was past. This young gentleman was so quick and flexible, and had so buoyant a temperament, that he was reputed more careless and thoughtless than was altogether the case.' His mind moved rapidly, and he had an instinctive habit of uttering the result of its calculations, in the most impulsive way imaginable. You could not tell by observing Algernon's manner whether he were giving you his first thought or his second. When the meal was over, Mrs. Errington rang to have the table cleared. A little prim servant-maid, in a clean, coarse apron and bib, appeared at the sound of the bell, and began to gather the tea-things together. Algernon sat down at the old harpsichord, and, after playing a few chords, commenced singing softly in a pleasant tenor voice some fragments of the sentimental ballads in vogue at that day. Does the reader ask, and when was that day? He must content himself with the information that it was within a year or two of the year 1830. Mr. Diamond walked to the window, and, holding aside the blind, stood looking out at the dark sky. All at once, when the servant opened the door to go out, there came up from the lower part of the house the sound of singing, slow long-drawn rather tuneless singing of a few voices male and female oh dear oh dear oh dear exclaimed mrs errington oh dear me sarah how is this algernon made a comical face of disgust and put his hands to his ears it be as mr powell's a come back mum said sarah with much gravity really really said mrs errington in the tone of one protesting against an utterly unjustifiable offence come back where has he been asked algernon carelessly on his rounds please sir i do wish mr powell would choose some other time for his performances cried mrs errington when the servant had left the room now thursday on thursday for instance we are going to a whist party at the bodkins and then he might squall out his psalms and shout and rave without annoying anybody he'd only annoy the neighbours said algernon and that wouldn't matter he was smiling with a sort of contemptuous amusement and touching random notes here and there on the harpsichord with one finger there will be no getting rhoda upstairs to-night said mrs errington poor little thing she's in for a whole evening of psalm singing algernon rose from the instrument with a clouded brow his face wore the petulant look of a spoiled child whose will has been unexpectedly crossed deuce take mr powell and all the welsh methodists like him said he my dear algy no no i cannot approve of that though mr powell is a dissenter besides such language in my presence is not respectful beg pardon ma'am said algernon laughing and with the laughter the cloud cleared from his brow clouds never rested there long will you have a game of cribbage with me mr diamond this naughty boy will scarcely ever play with me or if you prefer it dummy whist no whist for me interposed algernon decisively it is such a botheration and i play so atrociously that it would be cruel to ask mr diamond to sit down with me with that he returned to the harpsichord and began singing softly to himself in snatches cribbage then said mrs errington in her mellow measured tones mr diamond let fall the blind from his hand so roughly that the wooden roller rattled against the wainscot and advanced to the table where mrs errington was already setting forth the cards and cribbage board he sat down without a word cut the cards as she directed shuffled dealt and played in a moody sort of silent manner which however did not affect mrs errington's nerves at all meanwhile there went on beneath algernon's love songs and the few utterances of the players which the game necessitated a kind of accompanying bourdon of voices from downstairs sometimes one single voice would rise in passionate tones almost as if in wrath then came singing again which softened by distance had a wild wailing character of ineffable melancholy algernon paused in his fitful playing and singing as though unwilling to be in dissonance with these long-drawn sounds mrs errington calmly continued to exclaim fifteen six and two for his heels without regard to anything but her game when the rubber was at an end, Mr. Diamond rose to take his leave. He lingered a little in doing so. He lingered in taking up his hat, and in buttoning his coat across his breast. "'Have you not anything warmer to put on?' said Mrs. Errington. "'Dear me, it is very wrong to go out of this snug room into the air, and the wind has got up too, with no more wrap than you have been sitting in here by the fire. Algy, lend him your greatcoat.' 
thank you no good night said the tutor and walked off without further ceremony he still lingered however in descending the stairs and yet more in passing the door of a parlour whence came a murmur of voices finally he let himself out at the street door and encountering a bleak gust of wind set off down the silent street at a round pace what a fool you are matthew was his mental ejaculation as he strode along with his head bent down and his gloveless hands plunged deep into his pockets End of Volume 1, Chapter 2volume one chapter three of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume one chapter three mrs errington had lodged in mr maxfield's house ever since she first came to whitford jonathan maxfield commonly called old max kept a general shop in that town the shop was underneath mrs errington's sitting-room and the great bow-window of which mention has been made jutted out beyond the shop-front and overhung the street the house was old and larger than it appeared from the street running back some distance there was a private entrance a point much insisted upon by mr maxfield's sister-in-law and housekeeper in letting the lodgings to mrs errington and a long passage divided the shop entirely from the dwelling-rooms on the ground floor old max was reported to be somewhat of a miser which report he rather encouraged than the reverse finding that it had its conveniences and to have amassed a large sum of money for one in his position in life old max whitford people would say why old max could buy up half the town old max might retire to-morrow old max has no need ever to stand behind a counter again old max however continued to stand behind his counter day after day as he had done for the last thirty or forty years and would serve a child with a pennyworth of gingerbread or a rich man's cook with stores of bacon and flour in an impartially crabbed manner he was a grey man grey from head to foot he had grey hair closely cropped twinkling grey eyes and a grey stubble on his shaven chin he usually wore a suit of coarse grey clothes with black calico sleeves tied on at the elbow but even these had an iron grey hue from being more or less dusted with flour as indeed were all his garments and even his face when mrs errington first came to live in whitford jonathan maxfield was a widower for the second time he had two sons by his first wife and by his second one daughter whose birth cost her mother's life the sister of his first wife had kept house for him ever since his second widowhood this woman betty grimshaw by name had been servant in a great family and at her master's death had received a legacy which together with her own savings had sufficed to purchase a small annuity she had been able to lay by the greater part of her annuity since she had lived in whitford and announced her intention of bequeathing her savings to her nephew james maxfield's second son the elder son had married a farmer's daughter with some money and turned farmer himself within a few miles of whitford thus the family living at home on the autumn night on which our story opens consisted of jonathan maxfield betty grimshaw his sister-in-law his son james and his daughter rhoda the sound of the street door closing violently behind mr diamond startled this family partly assembled in the parlour together with mr david powell methodist preacher they were all seated at a table on which lay hymn-books and a large bible old maxfield sat nearest to the fire in his grey suit just as he appeared in his shop except that the black calico sleeves had been removed from his coat he had a harsh face a harsh voice and a harsh manner so much could be observed by any who exchanged ten words with him next to him on his left hand sat his son james a tall sickly-looking young man of six-and-twenty he had a stoop in the shoulders a pale face with high cheekbones eyes deeply set light eyebrows which grew in thick irregular tufts and hair of a reddish flaxen colour there was a certain family likeness between him and his aunt mrs grimshaw as she was called in whitford despite her spinsterhood she too was tall bony and hard-featured with a face which looked as if it had been painted and varnished and reminded one in its colour and texture of those hollow wooden pears full of tiny playthings which used to be and probably still are sold at country fairs and in toy-shops of a humble kind the preacher sat next to betty grimshaw he seemed to belong to a different order of beings from the three persons already described a striking face this dark and full of fire he had sharply cut handsome features and eyes that seemed to blaze with inward light when he spoke earnestly his raven black hair was worn long and fell straight on to his collar but although this made his aspect strange it could not render it either vulgar or ludicrous the black locks set off his pale dark face as in a frame of ebony 
He was young and seemed vigorous, though rather with nervous energy than muscular strength. The last person in this group was Rhoda Maxfield, Little Rhoda, as Mrs. Errington had called her, but the epithet had been used to express rather her social insignificance than her physical proportions. Rhoda was, in fact, rather tall. She was about nineteen years old, but scarcely looked her age. She had a broad and beautiful brow, on which the rich chestnut hair was smoothly parted, a sensitive mouth, not over small, and bright hazel eyes, which looked out on the world with an open gaze that was at once timid and confiding. Her skin was of remarkable delicacy, with a faint flush on the cheeks, which came and went frequently. And yet Rhoda Maxfield was not much admired among her own compeers. There was something in her face which did not please the taste of the vulgar. And although, if you had asked Whitford persons, is not Rhoda Maxfield wonderfully pretty? Most of those so addressed would have answered, Yes, Rhoda is a pretty girl, yet the assent would probably have been cold and uncertain. Rhoda, at nineteen years old, had never been known to have a sweetheart, and this fact militated against the popular appreciation of her beauty, for a very cursory observation of the world will suffice to show that on the score of good looks, as on most other subjects, public opinion is apt to find nothing successful but success. "'What a wind there must be to make the door bang like that!' exclaimed Betty Grimshaw, when the loud sound above recorded reached her ears. "'Who went out?' asked James. "'I suppose it would be that Mr. Diamond, the schoolmaster,' replied his aunt. They both spoke in a subdued voice, and cast further glances at Mr. Maxfield, as though fearful of being reprehended, for interrupting the evening devotions. But as they spoke, he closed his hymn-book, and drew his chair away from the table towards the fireside. Upon this signal, Betty Grimshaw rose and bustled out of the room, declaring that she must see about getting the supper, for that that little Sarah could never be trusted to see to the roast potatoes alone. There was a suspicious alacrity in Betty's departure, suggestive that she experienced some sense of relief at the breaking up of the devotions. James soon sauntered out of the room after his aunt. Mr. Powell rose. "'Good night,' said he, holding out his hand to the old man. "'Nay, won't you stay and eat with us, Brother Powell? The supper will be ready directly.' Mr. Powell shook his head. "'You know I never eat supper,' he said, smiling. "'Well, well, perhaps you're in the right,' replied old Max very readily. "'And I am not clear,' continued the preacher, "'but that it would be better for you to leave off the habit.' "'Me? Oh, no, I need it for my health's sake.' but would it not suit your health better to take your supper early say at six o'clock or so so that you should not go to bed with a full stomach no it wouldn't answered the old man crabbedly david powell stood meditating with his head at his chin i am not clear about it he murmured but maxfield either did not hear or chose to ignore the words father may i go upstairs to mrs errington asked rhoda softly i don't want any supper the old man grunted out an inarticulate sound and seemed to hesitate "'Go upstairs to Mrs. Errington,' he said, answering his daughter, but looking sideways at the preacher. "'Let's see. You promised, didn't you?' "'Yes, you gave me leave, and I promised before, before we knew that Mr. Powell would come to-night.' Rhoda was gifted with a sweet voice by nature, and she spoke with a purer accent and expressed herself with greater propriety than the other members of her family. Mrs. Errington had amused herself with teaching the motherless girl, who had been a lonely, shy little child when their acquaintance first began, and Rhoda was a quick and apt scholar. "'Well, a promise. I can't have you break your word. Don't you stay late, mind. Not one minute after ten o'clock. Do you mind, Rhoda?' Rhoda, with a bright smile of pleasure on her face, promised to obey, and left the room with a step which it cost her an effort to make as staid as she knew would be approved by her father and Mr. Powell. When she got outside the door, they heard her run along the passage as light and swift as a greyhound. Maxfield turned to Mr. Powell with a little constrained, apologetic air, and began expatiating on Mrs. Errington's fondness for Rhoda, and how kind she had always been to the girl, and how he thought it a duty almost to let the good widowed lady have as much of Rhoda's company as she could give her without neglecting duties. "'Betty Grimshaw is a worthy woman,' he observed dryly, "'but no companion for my Rhoda.' Rhoda features her mother, and has her mother's nature very much. Mr. Powell stood still in the same meditative attitude, with his hand to his chin. "'This Mrs. Addington is unconverted,' he said, without raising his eyes. "'Oh, Rhoda won't take much harm from that.' "'Much harm?' The dark, lustrous eyes were upraised now, and fixed searchingly on the old man. "'Well, it won't do her any harm,' the latter answered testily. "'I know Rhoda, and I have her welfare at heart, as I suppose you'll believe.' I don't know who should have if it isn't me. Brother Maxfield, said the preacher earnestly, are you sure that you have a clear leading in this matter? 
have you prayed for one maxfield shifted in his chair and made no answer oh consider what you do in trusting that tender soul among worldlings i do not say that these are wicked people in a carnal sense but are they such as can edify or strengthen a young girl like rhoda who is still in a seeking state and has not yet that blessed assurance which we all supplicate for her i have laid the matter before the lord said maxfield almost sullenly powell was silent for a moment standing with his hands forcibly clasped together as though to control them from vehement action and when next he spoke his voice had a tone in it which told of strong effort of will to keep it in subdued monotony then have you thought of it said he there is the young man algernon what of algernon cried maxfield turning sharply to face the preacher he is fair to look upon and specious and has those graces and talents which the world accounts lovely may there not be a snare here for rhoda she who is so alive to all the beauty and graciousness in god's world and in god's creatures may it not be very perilous for her to be thrown unguardedly into the society of this youth maxfield looked into the fire instead of at powell as he said what has been putting this into your head i have had a call to say it to you for some time past before i went away this summer it was on my mind i sinned in resisting the call for for reasons which matter to no one but myself i sinned in putting any human reason above my master's service it may be as you would have done better to resist speaking now said maxfield slowly it may be as it was rather a temptation than a leading from heaven made you speak at all powell started back as if he had been struck the blood rushed into his face and then suddenly receding left him paler than before but he answered after a moment in a low sweet voice and without a trace of anger you cannot mistrust me more than i mistrusted myself but i have wrestled and prayed and i am assured that i have spoken this thing with a single heart well 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 it may be as you say said maxfield a shade less harshly than he had spoken before but you have neither wife nor daughter nor sister and you cannot understand these matters as well as i do who are more than double your years and have had the guidance of this young maid from a baby upward nay answered powell humbly it is not my own wisdom i am uttering god forbid that i should set up my carnal judgment against a man of your years that's very well said very rightly said exclaimed maxfield nodding twice or thrice ay but i must speak when my conscience bids me i dare not resist that admonition for any human respect why to be sure but do you think yours is the only conscience to be listened to i tell you i follow mine young man you can ask any of our brethren here in whitford who have known me for the last thirty or forty years whether i have gone far astray powell sighed wearily i have released my soul he said and just hearken pursued old maxfield in a lowered voice don't say a word of this to rhoda nay don't interrupt me i've listened to your say now let me have mine because you might be putting something into her thoughts that wouldn't have come there of itself and keep a discreet tongue before betty and james least said soonest mended and i'll tell you something more if observe i say if i saw that rhoda's heart was strongly set upon anything anything that wasn't wrong in itself i should be very loath to thwart her david powell turned a startled attentive face on the old man who proceeded with a sort of dogged monotony of voice and manner christian charity teaches us there's good folks in all the communions of believers and there's different ranks and different orders of the world some has one thing and some has another some has fine family and great connections among the rulers of the land others has the goods of this world earned by honesty and diligence and frugality and these three bring a blessing some is fitted to be gentlefolks by nature let em be born where they will others like my sister-in-law betty is born to serve we are all the lord's creatures and we are all in his hand but as clay in the hand of the potter but there's different kinds of clay you know this kind is good for making coarse delf and that kind is fit for fine porcelain we'll just keep these words as have passed between you and me to ourselves if you please and now i think we may drop the subject may the lord give you his counsel said powell in a broken voice amen i've had my share of wisdom and have walked pretty straight for the last half century thanks be to him observed old max dryly if it were his good pleasure how gladly would i cease for evermore from speaking to you on this theme but it matters nothing what i desire or shrink from i must deliver my master's message when it is borne in upon me to do so and with a solemnly uttered blessing on the household the preacher departed the master of the house sat thinking alone by his fireside 
he began by thinking that he had a little over-encouraged david powell maxfield considered praise from himself to be very encouraging and calculated to uplift the heart when powell had first come among the whitford methodists old max had taken him by the hand and had declared him to be the most awakening preacher they had had for many years he was never tired of vaunting powell's zeal and diligence and eloquence backsliders were brought again to the right way sinners were awakened believers were refreshed under his ministry the fame of powell's preaching drew many unwanted auditors to the little chapel and of those who came at first merely from curiosity many were moved by his words to join the wesleyan connection on all this jonathan maxfield looked with great satisfaction the young man had been truly a burning and a shining light but now might it not be that the preacher's heart had become puffed up with spiritual pride was he not unduly exalting himself when he assumed a tone of censorship towards a pillar of the community such as jonathan maxfield the old man had been for many years accustomed to much deference alike from preacher and congregation the exhortations and admonitions which were doubtless needful for his neighbors were entirely out of place when addressed to himself his piety and probity were established on a rock and the lord had moreover seen fit to gift him with so large a share of the wisdom of the serpent as had enabled him to hold his own and to thrive in the midst of worldlings a dull fire of indignation against david powell began to smoulder in the old man's heart as he pondered these things other thoughts too more or less disquieting passed through his brain he thought of rhoda's mother of that second wife whom he a man past middle life had married for her fair young face and gentle ways much to betty grimshaw's disgust and the surprise of most people he looked back on the long dusty dreary road of his life and in the whole landscape the only spot on which the sun seemed to shine was that brief year of his second marriage not that he had been or that he now was an unhappy man his life had satisfactions in it of a sober sombre kind he did not grow soft or sentimental in reviewing the past he was accustomed to the chill gray atmosphere in which he lived but he had felt warm sunlight once and remembered it and he had a notion inarticulate indeed and vague that rhoda needed more light and warmth in her life than was necessary for his own existence or for james or betty grimshaw's or in fact for most people's there was no amount of hardness he could not be guilty of to most people and indeed he was hard enough to himself but for rhoda there was a soft place in his heart nevertheless there were many hopes fears speculations and reflections connected with rhoda just now which had anything but a softening effect on mr maxfield's demeanour insomuch that betty and james coming in presently to supper found the head of the family in so crabbed a temper that they were glad to hurry through the meal in silence and slink off to bed end of volume one chapter three chapter four of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope chapter four mention has been made of a whist party at dr bodkin's to which mrs errington announced her intention of going it took place on the thursday after that evening on which mrs errington was first introduced to the reader that is to say on the second night following whist parties were almost the only social entertainment ever given amongst the genteel persons in whitford the rev cyrus bodkin d d liked his rubber so did robert smith esq m r c s and mr dockett the attorney and miss chubb and one or two more cronies who were frequently seen at the doctor's green card tables the bodkins lived in a gloomy stone house adjoining the grammar school of which indeed it formed part the house was approached by a gravelled courtyard surrounded by high stone walls the garden at the back ran sloping down to a broad green meadow which in turn was bounded by the little river wit all overhung with willows and covered by a floating mass of broad water lily leaves just opposite the doctor's garden gate in the full summer time the view from the back of the house was pretty and pastoral enough but in autumn and winter the meadow was a swamp whose vivid green looked poisonous as indeed it was exhaling ague and rheumatism from its plashy surface and a white brooding mist trailed itself morning and evening along the sluggish wit like a fallen cloud condemned by some angry prince of the air to crawl serpent-like on earth instead of soaring and sailing in the empyrean such fancies never came into dr bodkin's head however nor into his wife's either good anxious unselfish sad little woman into his daughter minnie's brain all sorts of wild fantastic notions would intrude as she lay on her sofa looking out upon the garden and the river and the meadow and the gnarled old willows and the flying scud in the sky 
but she very seldom spoke of her fancies to any one she spoke of other matters though freely enough she had many visitors who came and sat around her couch or beside the lounging chair on which on her good days she reclined she was better acquainted with the news of whitford than most of the people who could use their limbs to go abroad and see what was passing she was interested in the progress of the boys at the grammar school and knew the names and a good deal about the characters of every one of them she would chat and laugh and joke by the hour with the frequenters of her father's house but of herself of her own thoughts feelings and fancies minnie bodkin said no word to them nor did she in truth ever speak much on the subject all her life and there were days black days in the calendar of her poor anxious little mother when minnie would remain shut into her room refusing to see or speak with any one and suffering much pain of body with a proud stoicism which rejected sympathy like a wall of granite there is no suggestion of granite about her now however as she lies propped up by crimson cushions on a sofa in her father's drawing-room the room is bright and warm despite the white kraken of mist that is coiled around the outer walls of the house wax lights shine in tall old-fashioned silver candlesticks on the mantelpiece and on the centre table and on a pianoforte beside which stands a canterbury full of music books a great fire blazes in the grate and makes its immediate neighbourhood too hot for the comfort of most people but minnie is apt to be chilly and loves the heat some delicate ferns and hothouse plants adorn a stand between the windows they are rather a rare luxury in whitford but minnie loves flowers and always has some choice ones about her a still rarer luxury hangs on the wall opposite to her sofa in the shape of a very fine copy on a reduced scale of raphael's madonna di san sisto minnie had fallen in love with a print from that famous picture long ago and the copy was procured for her at considerable pains and expense the furniture of the room is of crimson and dark oak minnie delights in rich colours and picturesque combinations in a word there is not an inch of the apartment from floor to ceiling in the arrangement of which minnie's tastes have not been consulted and in which traces of minnie's influence are not plainly to be seen by those who know that household minnie has a face which if you saw it represented in time-darkened oil colours and framed on the walls of a picture gallery you would pronounce strikingly beautiful such faces are sometimes seen in flesh and blood and strange to say do by no means excite the same enthusiasm in ordinary beholders who for the most part like the picturesque in a picture and nowhere else and who to paraphrase what was said of voltaire's intellect admire chiefly those women who have more than other young ladies the prettiness which all young ladies have minnie's face is pale and rather sallow her skin is not transparent but fine in texture like fine vellum and it seldom changes its hue from emotion when it does it grows dark red or deadly white pleasing blushes or pallors are never seen on it she has dark thick hair worn short and brushed away from a high smooth rounded forehead in which shine a pair of bright brown eyes under finely arched eyebrows but the beauty of the face lies in the perfection of its outlines brow cheeks and chin are alike delicately moulded her mouth although the lips are too pale is almost faultless as are the small white teeth she shows when she smiles there is an indefinable air of sickness and suffering over this beautiful face and dark traces beneath the eyes and a pathetic weary look in them sometimes but when she speaks or smiles you forget all that there are people in this world whose intellects remind one of lamps too scantily supplied with oil the little feeble flame in them burns and flickers certainly but it is but a dull sort of dead light after all now minnie bodkin's spirit lamp if the phrase may be permitted illumined everything it shone upon and there were some persons who found it a great deal too dazzling to be pleasant. It is not at all too bright at this moment for Algernon Errington, who, seated close beside her couch, is giving her, sotto voce, a humorous imitation of the psalm-singing in old Max's parlour, and describing with great relish his mother's cool suggestion that the family prayer should be put off until she should be absent at a whist-party. "'Poor dear mother,' says Algernon, smiling. "'She can't forget that she's an Ancrum, "'and sometimes comes out with one of her grand dame speeches, "'as if she were addressing my grandfather's Warwickshire tenantry forty years ago.' "'At which simple candid words Minnie shoots out a queer keen glance "'at the young fellow from under her eyelids. "'And the Methodist preacher? What is he like?' she asks. "'Whitford is, or was, a little inclined to go crazed about him. "'I don't know whether the enthusiasm is burning itself out, "'as such fires of straw will do.' but a few weeks ago i heard that the little wesleyan chapel was crowded to overflowing whenever he preached and that once or twice when he addressed the people out of doors on whit meadow there was such a multitude as never was seen there before i was quite curious to see the man who could so move our sluggish whitfordians 
Algernon had taken up a sheet of note paper and a pen from Minnie's letter writing table whilst she was speaking. Look here, he says, here's the preacher, and he holds out the paper on which he has drawn, with a few rapid strokes, a caricature of David Powell. Minnie looks at it with raised eyebrows. Oh, says she, is he like that? I'm disappointed. This is the common, conventional, long haired Methodist that one sees in every comic print. And in truth, Algernon's portrait is not a good likeness, even for a caricature. He had drawn a lank, hook-nosed man with long black hair, expressed by two blots of ink falling on either side of his face. "'He wears his hair just like that,' says Algy, contemplating his own work with a good deal of satisfaction. The card-playing has not yet begun. Mrs. Bodkin, small, thin, with a questioning, sharp little nose, and a chin which narrows off too suddenly, and an odd resemblance altogether to a little melancholy fox, is presiding at a tea-table. Besides tea and coffee, it is furnished with substantial cakes of many various kinds. Whitford people, for the most part, dine early, so that they are ready for solid food again by about eight o'clock, and will probably sustain nature once more with sandwiches and mulled wine before they sleep. It is not a large party. There is Mrs. Errington, majestic in a dyed silk and a real lace cap, the latter a relic of the better days she is fond of reverting to, Miss Chubb, a stout spinster with a languishing fat face as round as a full moon, and little rings of hair gummed down all over her forehead, and halfway down her plump cheeks. Mr. Smith, the surgeon, black-eyed, red-faced, and smiling. The Reverend Peter Warlock, curate of St. Chad's, a serious ghoul-like young man who rends great bits out of his muffin with his teeth, in a way to make you shudder if you happen to be nervous or fanciful. Mr. Dockett, the attorney, and his wife, each dressed in black, each with a huge double chin and smothered voice, and altogether comically like one another. On the hearth-rug, with his back to the fire, and his coffee-cup in his hand, stands Dr. Bodkin. He is short and thick. He has an air of command. He looks at the world in general, as if it were liable to an imposition of ever so many hundred lines of Latin poetry, and as if he were ready to enforce the penalty at brief notice. He is not a hard man at heart, but nature has made him conceited, and habit has made him a tyrant. The boys kowtow to him at the school, and his wife bends submissively to his will at home. There is only one person in the world who habitually opposes and sets aside his assumption of infallibility, and that person, his daughter Minnie, he loves and fears. He tramples on most other people, in the firm persuasion that it is for their good. He is bald, large-faced, with a long upper lip, which he shoots out into a funnel shape when he talks. He is an honest man in his calling, has a fair share of routine learning, and imparts it laboriously to the boys under his tuition. Presently the people seem to slacken in eating and drinking. "'Another cup of tea, Mrs. Arrington. Won't you try any of that pound-cake, Mr. Warlock?' "'Note well. He has eaten three muffins unassisted, but they do not prosper with him. He has a hungry glare. "'Mrs. Stockett? No?' Mrs. Bodkin looks round, and lifts her meek, foxy little nose interrogatively at each member of the circle. No one will eat or drink more. The doctor prepares to make up the tables. The card tables are always set out in an inner drawing-room, adjoining that in which our friends are taking tea. Dr. Bodkin hates to hear any noise when he is at his rubber, so there are thick curtains before the door of communication between the two rooms, and the door is shut, and the curtains drawn, whenever Minnie desires to have music on whist evenings. The sound of the piano penetrates to the card-players, nevertheless, but Mrs. Bodkin declares that she can never hear a note when she is in the little drawing-room with the door shut and the curtains drawn, and although the doctor wears a frown on his bald forehead and is more than ordinarily severe on his partner whenever the piano begins to sound during a game, yet he never takes any step to have the instrument silenced. The players file off in the wake of the host. There is a quartet at the doctor's table. At another, Mrs. Dockett, Mrs. Warlock, and Mr. Smith play dummy. Algernon Errington hates cards, and naturally doesn't play. The Reverend Peter Warlock also hates cards, but is wanted to make up the rubber, and, naturally, plays. Mrs. Bodkin hovers between the two rooms, and Minnie and Algernon are left almost tête-à-tête. -tête. "'And so you really, really think of going to London?' says Minnie gravely. "'To seek my fortune,' answers Algernon with a smile. "'Turn again, Addington. I don't know why that shouldn't be rung out on Bow Bells. You see my name has the same number of syllables as Whittington.' I declare that is a good omen. Whittington made himself useful to the cook, and took care of his kitten. I wonder what you will do, Algy, to deserve fortune. Do you think fortune favours the deserving? They paint her as a woman, cries Master Algernon, with a saucy grimace. Algy, I like you. We are old chums. Have you considered this step? Have you any reasonable prospect of making your way, if you refuse the Bristol man's proposition? Minnie seldom speaks so earnestly as she is speaking now. 
still seldomer volunteers any inquiry into other people's affairs algernon is sensible of the distinction and flattered by it he forthwith proceeds to lay his hopes and plans before her that is to say he talks a great deal with astonishing candour and fluency and says wonderfully little his mother is so anxious these seelys are her people it would vex the dear lady so terribly if he were to prefer the bristol side of the house though perhaps that would be selfishly speaking the right policy ah i see exclaims minnie sinking back among her cushions when he has done speaking by and by one or two more guests drop in young pawkins of pudcombe hall some six miles from whitford lieutenant colonel whistler on half pay with his two nieces rose and violet mcdougall and with them alethea dockett who is still a day boarder at the girls school in whitford and has been spending the afternoon with the misses mcdougall the latter young ladies never play whist little ally dockett sometimes takes a hand if need be and acquits herself not discreditably but sixteen rushes in where two and thirty fears to tread rose and violet are on the doubtful borderland of life and keep up a brief skirmishing warfare with their enemy tyne they would not give that wily old traitor the triumph of putting themselves at a whist table for anything short of a bona fide offer of marriage with a good settlement all these guests minnie receives very graciously with a sort of royal condescension she is quite unconscious that the misses mcdougall of whose intelligence she has truth to say a disdainful estimate are alive to the fact that she thinks them fools and that they take a good deal of credit to themselves for bearing with her airs poor thing but then she is so afflicted oh minnie what's that do let me see is it one of your caricatures you wicked thing cries rose darting on the portrait of david powell it is better drawn than minnie can do says violet with an air of having evidence wrung from her on oath it may be that and yet not very good answers minnie carelessly mr addington has been trying to give me an idea of some one i have never seen and probably never shall see it's the methodist preacher by jove says young pawkins with his glass in his eye i heard him and saw him last summer on whit meadow colonel whistler after holding the paper out at the utmost stretch of his arm solemnly puts on a pair of gold spectacles and examines it monstrous good he pronounces very well errington that's just the cut of that kind of fellow have you seen him colonel asked minnie no no i can't say i have seen him don't like these irregular practitioners miss minnie but i know the sort of fellow that's just the cut of em i wish i could draw miss bodkin says a voice behind minnie at the head of the sofa i would show you a better likeness of the man than that minnie puts her thin white hand over her shoulder to the newcomer whom she cannot see mr diamond she exclaims very softly how can you tell i know your voice End of chapter four volume one chapter five of a charming fellow this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope Volume 1, Chapter 5 The little group round Minnie's sofa dispersed as Mr. Diamond came forward. He was barely known by sight to most of them, and merely bowed gravely and shyly without speaking. "'Who's that?' asked Colonel Whistler in a loud whisper of his eldest niece. "'Eh? Oh, oh, second master. Yes, yes, to be sure.' and the gallant gentleman walked off to the card-room and joined the party at mrs dockett's table where there was a vacant place it must be owned that the colonel's appearance was by no means rapturously hailed there he was a notoriously bad player fate however allotted him as a partner to mr warlock mrs dockett and mr smith exchanged glances of satisfaction and the gloom on mr warlock's brow perceptibly deepened as the colonel polite smiling and eager for the fray took his seat opposite to that clerical victim Algy give mr diamond your chair said miss bodkin it was in this imperious manner that she occasionally addressed her young friend in her eyes he was still a schoolboy and then she was four years his senior and had been a young woman grown when he was still playing marbles and munching toffee algy by no means considered himself a schoolboy but he had excellent tact and temper he rose directly shook hands with his tutor and then standing opposite to minnie put his knuckles to his forehead after the fashion in vogue amongst rustic children by way of salute and said meekly yes um please um minnie laughed you don't mind do you algernon she said looking up at him not at all miss bodkin you have merely cast another blight over my young existence i am going to look like the reverend peter in consequence of your ill usage don't you perceive a ghastly hue upon my brow no ah oh, well you would if you had any feeling here let me put this cushion better for you will that do 
capitally thanks and look here algy i can't bear any music to-night so will you get mamma to set the mcdougalls down to a round game and play yourself there's a good boy oh minnie you ought to have been mrs nero there never was such a tyrant well pawkins and i must make ourselves agreeable i suppose for england home and beauty here goes and algernon speedily had the two miss mcdougalls and mr pawkins and althea dockett engaged in a game of vingt et un played in a very infantine manner by the first-named ladies and with a good deal of business-like gravity by little althea who liked to win mr diamond looked at the group with his hand over his mouth after his habit isn't he a nice fellow asked minnie watching mr diamond's face curiously errington of course very but now tell me do sit down here i want to talk to you you come so seldom i wonder why you came to-night i chanced to meet mrs bodkin in the street and she asked me so pressingly she is so good minnie's face wore a pained look it is a pity mamma should have teased you she said in a low voice matthew diamond took no notice of the words perhaps he did not hear them i am not fit to go to evening parties he continued the very wax lights dazzle me i feel like a bat or an owl too wise for your company that means how can you say so no i assure you i was compared to an owl the other evening by a lady and i felt the justice of the comparison by a lady what lady mr diamond smiled a little amused smile at the authoritative tone of the question minnie did not see it she was leaning her elbow on a cushion and had her face turned toward mr diamond but her eyes which usually looked out open and unabashed were half veiled by their lids the lady was mrs errington answered the tutor after a moment's pause she called you an owl that eagle well she has this aquiline quality i believe she could stare the sun himself out of countenance you were asking me to tell you said mr diamond to tell me oh yes about the methodist preacher that character is not like him you say not at all it is a vulgar conception of the man and the man is not vulgar i am glad of that tell me about him matthew diamond had heard the preacher more than once the first time had been by chance on whit meadow the other times were in the crowded close wesleyan chapel into which he had penetrated at the cost of a good deal of personal inconvenience so greatly had powell's eloquence impressed him the man is like a flame of fire he said it is wonderful he must be like garrick according to the descriptions i have heard and then this fellow is so handsome wild and oriental looking i always longed to clap a turban on his head and a great flowing robe over his shoulders minnie listened eagerly with parted lips to all that diamond would tell her of the preacher that is for his manner she said at length now as to the matter mr diamond paused the man is an enthusiast you know he answered gravely but as to his doctrine give me some idea of the kind of thing he says not now yes now this moment excuse me i cannot enter into the subject now minnie raises her brown eyes to his steel grey ones and then drops her own quickly will you ever she asks meekly perhaps i don't know miss bodkin is not accustomed to be answered with such unceremonious curtness but perhaps on account of its novelty mr diamond's blunt disregard of her requests in that house minnie's requests have the weight of commands does not ruffle her she bears it with the most perfect sweetness and proceeds to discourse of other things don't you think it a pity she says that algernon errington should have refused his cousin's offer a great pity for him ah you think mr philthorpe of bristol is not to be condoled with on the occasion mr diamond's firmly closed lips remain immovable minnie looks at him wistfully and then says do you know i like algy very much there is something so bright and winning and gay about him i have known him so long ever since he came here as a small child in a frock and papa knew his father dr errington he was a very clever man brilliant talker and greatly sought after in society algy inherits all that and he has what they say his father had not a temper that is almost perfect thoroughly sound and sweet i wish you liked him who tells you that i do not like him you are mistaken in fancying so i think addington one of the most winning fellows i ever knew in my life yes but you don't think so well of him as i do perhaps that is hardly to be expected and pardon me miss bodkin but you don't know i know nothing about your thoughts on the subject interrupts minnie quickly and with a bright mischievous glance forgive my interrupting you but when i am to have a cold shower bath i like to pull the string myself now it's over you think me a terrible bear says diamond looking down on her beautiful animated face 
ah take care if i know nothing about your thoughts how do you pretend to guess mine besides i am not so zoological in my choice of epithets as your friend mrs errington papa nearly quarrelled with that lady on the subject of algy's going away but you know it is not all mrs errington's fault algy chooses to try his fortune under the auspices of lord seely i can see that plainly enough and what algy chooses his mother chooses he has been terribly spoiled it is a great misfortune to be spoiled for him to have lost his father when he was a child otherwise he might not have been so pampered though fathers spoil their children sometimes mine spoils me i think but then there is an excuse after all for spoiling me my dear miss bodkin you cannot suppose that i had any such meaning you oh no you are honest you never speak in innuendos but it is true you know my father and mother have spoiled me poor father and mother i am but a miserable frail little craft for them to have ventured so much love and devotion in it was not in mortal man not even in mortal man whose heart was filled with a passion for another woman to refrain from a tender glance and a soft tone in answer to minnie's pathetic little plaint her beauty and her intellect might be resisted her helplessness and acknowledgment of peculiar affliction could not be ah said matthew diamond who would not embark all their freight of affection in such a venture as the hope that you would love them again i think your parents are paid it has been said that mr diamond's calm grave face raised an indefinite expectation in the beholder when he said those words to minnie bodkin you would have thought if you had been watching him that you had found the key of the puzzle and that an ineffable tenderness was the secret that lay hid beneath that grave mask the stern mouth smiled the stern eyes beamed the straight brows were lifted in a compassionate curve minnie had never seen his face with that look on it and the change in it gave her a curious pang half of pain half of pleasure strong conflicting feelings battled in her she was strung to a high pitch of excitement and her eyes brightened and her pulse beat quicker all for a look a smile a beam of the eye from this staid quiet schoolmaster what do we know of the thought in our neighbour's brain of the thrill that makes his heart flutter we do not care for this air bubble how can he it is yonder beautiful transparent ball all radiant with prismatic colours that we expend our breath upon up it goes up 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 look no our stupid neighbour is watching his own airy sphere which is not nearly so beautiful and which we know will burst presently the game of vingt et un comes to an end almost at the same moment the whist players break up and come trooping into the drawing-room trooping and talking rather noisily to say the truth as though to indemnify themselves for the silence which dr bodkin insists upon during the classic game mrs bodkin bustles up to her daughter hopes she is not tired thinks she looks a little fagged wonders why she did not have any music as she generally likes rose mcdougall's scotch ballads supposes mr diamond preferred not to play as she sees he has been sitting out and trusts he has not been bored but of all the people present mrs bodkin alone guesses that minnie has enjoyed her evening and why and with her mother's and woman's instinct she knows that minnie's pleasure would have been spoiled by guessing that it had been guessed for the rest this small anxious-faced woman cares but little she would tear your feelings to mincemeat to feed the fancies of her daughter as ruthlessly as any maternal vixen would slay a chicken for her cubs although for herself no hare is milder or more timid the misses mcdougall are in good spirits they have won and they have had the two young men all to themselves for Ally Dockett in short frocks doesn't count. Also, Minnie Bodkin has kept aloof. That bright lamp of hers is not favourable to such twinkling little rush lights as Rose and Violet are able to display. But this evening they have not been quenched by a superior luminary, and are quite radiant and cheerful. Dr. Bodkin, too, is contented in his lofty manner, for there has been no music, and he has enjoyed his rubber in peace. Colonel Whistler has lost, but the stakes are always modest at Dr. Bodkin's table, and he doesn't mind it over the feelings of the rev peter warlock it will perhaps be best to draw a veil the rev gentleman stalks in and sits down in a corner whence he can stare at minnie unobserved it is the only comfort he enjoys throughout the evening and for this he thinks it worth while to submit to the pen fault et dieu of playing whist with colonel whistler for his partner mrs errington sails toward minnie's sofa and suddenly stops short and opens her eyes very wide mr diamond who is the object of her gaze rises and bows good evening madam he says unable to repress a smile at her manifest astonishment on beholding him there why how do you do mr diamond dear me i little expected to see you this evening dear minnie how are you now well this is a surprise 
Then, as Mr. Diamond moves away, Mrs. Errington takes his chair beside Minnie, and says to her confidentially, "'Now, I hope, Minnie, that you won't owe me a grudge for it, but I must confess that if it hadn't been for me, you wouldn't have had that gentleman to entertain this evening.' "'What on earth do you mean?' cries Minnie, with scant ceremony, and flashes an impatient glance at the lady's soft, smiling, self-satisfied visage. "'My dear, I advised him to come here a little oftener. I think he felt diffident, you know, and all that. Poor man, he is rather dull, although Algy is always crying up his talents. But it really is kind to bring him forward a little. I asked him to tea the other night. You see, he must feel it a good deal when people are affable, and so on, for—' Here her voice sank to a whisper— he told me himself that he had been a scissar. With all which benevolent remarks, Miss Bodkin is, of course, highly delighted. She does not forget them either, for after the negus has been drunk, and the sandwich is eaten, and the company has departed, she says to her father, Papa, was Mr. Diamond a scissar? I don't know, child, very likely. None the worse for that, if he were. The worse? No, returns Minnie with a superb smile. Who says he was? Mrs. Errington? Pooh! Ten to one, it isn't true, then. She has her good points, poor woman, but the Ancrams are all liars, every one of them. Greatest liars in all the Midland counties. It runs in the family like gout. It does not seem likely, certainly, that Mr. Diamond should have confided the circumstance to Mrs. Errington, observed Minnie thoughtfully. Confided? No, I never knew a man less likely to confide anything in anybody. However, after all, it is a thing which all the world might know, isn't it, Papa? Dr. Bodkin was not interested in the question. He gave a great loud yawn, and declared it was time for Minnie to go to bed. It doesn't follow that I'm sleepy because you yawn, Papa, she said saucily. You are tired, though, Puss, I see it in your face. Go to bed. Mrs. Bodkin, get Minnie off to rest. He bent to kiss his daughter and bid her good night. Say God bless me, Papa, she whispered, drawing his head down and kissing his forehead. "'Don't I always say it? God bless you, my darling.' There were tears in Minnie's eyes as she turned her head away among her cushions, but nobody saw them. She talked to the maid who undressed her, about Mr. Powell, the Methodist preacher, and asked her if she had heard him, and what folk said about him in the town. "'No, Miss Minnie, I've never heard him, and I know Master wouldn't think it right for any of us to be going to a dissenting chapel. But I do think, as there's some good to be got there, Miss, for my brother Richard, him that lives groom at Pudkin Hall, he went and got, got conversion, I think they call it, at Mr. Powell's, and since then he's never touched a drop of liquor, nor a bad word never comes out of his mouth, and he says he's quite happy and comfortable in his mind, miss. Is he? How I envy him! End of chapter 5volume 1, chapter 6 of A Charming Fellow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope Volume 1, Chapter 6 It is exceedingly disagreeable to find that a scheme you have set your head on, or a prospect which smiles before you, is displeasing to the persons who surround you. It gives a cold shock to the glow of anticipation. Algernon did not perhaps care to sympathize very keenly with other folks' pleasure, but he certainly desired that they should be pleased with what pleased him, which is not quite the same thing. His mother informed him, perhaps with a dash of the Ancrum colouring, although he have seen how unjustly the worthy lady was suspected of falsehood by Dr. Bodkin on a late occasion, that Mr. Diamond disapproved of his refusing Mr. Philthorpe's offer, and of his resolve to go to London. Dr. Bodkin, Algernon knew, did not approve it, neither did Minnie, although she had never said so in words. How unpleasantly chilly people were, to be sure. Mrs. Errington did not like Mr. Diamond. She mistrusted him. His silence and gravity, his odd sarcastic smiles and taciturn politeness made her uneasy. Despite the patronizing way in which she had spoken of him to Minnie Bodkin, in her heart she thought the young man to be horribly presuming. "'I am sure he doesn't appreciate you at all, Algy,' she declared, winding up a list of Mr. Diamond's defects and misdemeanors with this culminating accusation. Algy had a shrewd notion that Mr. Diamond's appreciation of himself was likely to be a just one, and he was a little vexed and discomfited that his tutor had given him no word of praise behind his back. Mrs. Errington saw that she had made an impression, and began to heighten and embellish her statements accordingly. "'But, my dear boy,' said she, "'how can we expect him to recognize talents like yours? Gentlemanly talents, so to speak. The man himself is a mere plodder. 
why he was a Cesar at college algy felt himself to be a very generous fellow for continuing to stand up for old diamond as he phrased it well ma'am plenty of great men have been poor scholars dean swift was a Cesar, and dean swift died in a madhouse so you see algy mrs errington plumed herself a good deal upon this retort and returned to the attack upon mr diamond with fresh vigour being one of those persons whose mode of warfare is elephantine and who never content with merely killing their enemy must ponderously stamp and mash every semblance of humanity out of him algernon did not like all this his vanity was at least during this period of his life a great deal more vulnerable than his mother's and she although she doted on him would say unpleasant things indignantly repeat mortifying remarks which had been made and in a hundred ways unconsciously wound the sensitive love of approbation which was one of algernon's tenderest not to say weakest points it was all very disagreeable but it was not the worst he had to look forward to there was one person who would be so cast down so despairing at the news of his going away that it would be quite painful for a fellow to witness such grief and yet it could not be expected it could never have been expected that he should stay in whitford all his life he must point that out to rhoda poor rhoda for ten years that is to say for more than half her life algernon errington had been an idol a hero to her from the first day when peeping from behind the parlour door she had beheld the strangers enter mrs errington majestic in a huge hat and plume such as young readers may have seen in obsolete fashion books the mode was so absurd fifty years ago and had none of that simple elegance which distinguishes your costume my dear young lady and algy a lovely fair child in a black velvet suit and falling collar from that moment the boy had been a radiant apparition in her imagination how small and poor and shabby she felt as she peeped out of the parlour at that beautiful blooming mother and son not poor and shabby in a milliner's sense of the word but literally of no account or beauty or value in the world little shy motherless thing she had an intense delight in beauty this whitford grocer's daughter and all her little life the craving for beauty in her had been starved not wilfully but because the very conception of such food as would wholesomely have fed it was wanting in the people with whom she lived that was a great day when she first by chance attracted mrs errington's notice she was too timid and too simple to scheme for that end as many children would have done although she tremblingly desired it what a surprisingly splendid sight was the tortoise-shell work-box full of amber satin and silver what a delightful revelation the sound of the old harpsichord touched by mrs errington's plump white fingers what a perennial source of wonder and admiration were that lady's accomplishments and condescension and kind soft voice as to algernon there never was such a clever and brilliant little boy at eight years old he could sing little songs to his mother's accompaniment in the sweetest piping voice he could recite little verses he even drew quite so that you could tell or rhoda could his trees houses and men from one another in all the stories his mother told about the greatness of her family and in all the descriptions she gave of her ancestral home in warwickshire rhoda's imagination put in the boy as the central figure of the piece she could see him in the great hall hung round with armour although she knew that he had never been in the family mansion in his life in the grand drawing-room with its purple carpet and gilt furniture above all in the long portrait gallery of which rhoda was never tired of hearing heaven knows how she innocently and mrs errington exercising her hereditary talent embellished and transformed the old brick house in its deer park or what enchanted landscapes the child at all events conjured up among the gentle slopes and tufted woods of warwickshire even the period of hobbledehoydom fatal to beauty to grace almost to civilized humanity in most schoolboys algernon passed through triumphantly he had a great sense of humour and fastidious pampered habits of mind and body which enabled him to look down with more or less disdain a good-humoured disdain always algy was never bitter upon the obstreperous youth at whitford grammar school one fight he had he was forced into it by circumstances against his will not that he was a coward but he had a greater and more candidly expressed regard for the ease and comfort of his body than his schoolfellows conceived to be compatible with pluck however our young friend if less stoical was a great deal cleverer than the majority of his peers and perceiving that the moment had arrived when he must either fight or lose caste altogether he frankly accepted the former alternative he fought a boy bigger and heavier than himself got beaten not severely but fairly well beaten and bore his defeat in the dialect of his compeers took his licking admirably he was quite as popular afterwards as if he had thrashed his adversary who was a loutish boy the cock of the school as to strength 
had he bruised his way to the perilous glory of being cock of the school himself it would have behoved him to maintain it against all comers which is an anxious and harassing position algy had not vanquished the victor but he had taken his licking like a trump and on the whole may be said to have achieved his reputation at the smallest cost possible under the circumstances his mother and rhoda almost shrieked at beholding his bruised cheek and bleeding lip when he came home one half holiday from the field of battle algy laughed as well as his swollen features would let him and calmed their feminine apprehensions nor would he accept his fond parents enthusiastic praise of his heroism mingled with denunciations of that murderous young ruffian master manet poor ma'am said the hero it's all brutal and low enough we bumped and thumped each other as awkwardly as possible i fought because i was obliged and i didn't like it and i shan't fight again if i can help it it is so stupid the young fellow's great charm was to be unaffected even his fine gentlemanism sat quite easily on him and was displayed with the frankest good humour some one reproached him once with being more nice than wise we can't all be wise but we needn't be nasty returned algy with quaint gravity his temper was as minnie bodkin had said nearly perfect he had a singular knack of disarming anger or hostility you could not laugh algernon out of any course he had set his heart upon a rare kind of strength at his age but it was ten to one he would laugh you into agreeing with him every one of his little gifts and accomplishments was worth twice as much in him as it would have been in clumsier hands if you had a heartache i do not think that you would have found algy's companionship altogether soothing sorrow is apt to feel the very sunshine cruelly bright and cheerful but if you were merry and wanted society or bored and wanted amusement or dull and wanted exhilarating no better companion could be desired he was genial with his equals affable to his inferiors modest towards his superiors and had not a grain of veneration in his whole composition at seventeen years old algernon left the grammar school but he continued to read with mr diamond for nearly a twelvemonth my son is studying the classics with mr diamond mrs errington would say i can't send my boy to the university where all his forefathers distinguished themselves but he has had the education of a gentleman it was a very desultory kind of reading at the best and it was interrupted by the long midsummer holidays during which mr diamond went away from whitford no one knew exactly whither and during these same holidays mrs errington who said she required change of air had taken lodgings in a little quiet welsh village and obtained mr maxfield's permission to have rhoda with her that was a time of joy for the girl it did not at all detract from rhoda's happiness that she was required to wait hand and foot on mrs errington to bring her her breakfast in bed to trim her caps to mend her stockings to iron out scraps of fine lace and muslin to walk with her when she was minded to stroll into the village to order the dinner to make the pudding a culinary operation too delicate for the fingers of the rustic with whom they lodged to listen to her patroness when it pleased her to talk and to play interminable games of cribbage with her when she was tired of talking all these things were a labour of love to rhoda and mrs errington was kind to the girl in her own way and above all was not algy there those were happy days in the welsh village on the long delicious summer afternoons when mrs errington was asleep after dinner rhoda would sit out of doors with her sewing on a bench under the parlour window so as to be within call of her patroness and algy would lounge beside her with a book or make short excursions to get her wild flowers which he would toss into her lap laughing at her ecstasy of gratitude oh algy she would cry oh how good of you how lovely they are the words written down are not eloquent but rhoda's looks and tones made them so they are not half so lovely algy would answer as properly educated garden flowers no so sweet either but i know you like that sort of herbage rhoda never forgot those days how should she forget them since it was at this period that algernon first discovered that he was in love with her perhaps he might never have made the discovery if they had stayed in whitford there he saw her as he had seen her since her childhood surrounded by coarse common people and living their life more or less it is not every one who can be expected to recognize your diamond if you set it in lead rhoda was always sweet always gentle always pretty but she formed part and parcel of old max's establishment when the boy and girl were quite small she used to help him with his lessons her one year's seniority made a greater difference between them then than it did later and had always been used to do him sisterly services in a hundred ways and all this was by no means favourable to the young gentleman's falling in love with her but at lawn ryden rhoda appeared under quite a different aspect she looked prettier than ever before algernon thought and perhaps she really was so for there is no such cosmetic for the complexion as happiness 
apart from her vulgar relations and treated as a lady by the few strangers with whom they came in contact it was surprising to find how good her manners were and how much natural grace she possessed mrs errington had taught her what may be termed the technicalities of polite behaviour from her own heart and native sensibility she had learnt the essentials the people in the village turned their heads to admire her as she walked modestly along who could help admiring her algernon decided that there was not one among the young ladies at whitford who could compare with rhoda she is ten times as pretty as those raw-boned macdougalls and twenty times as well bred as alethea dockett and ever so much cleverer than miss pawkins he reflected minnie bodkin never came into his head in the list of damsels with whom rhoda could be compared minnie occupied a place apart quite removed from any idea of love-making dear little rhoda how fond she was of him altogether rhoda appeared in a new light and the new light became her mightily yes algy was certainly in love with her he acknowledged to himself there was no scene no declaration it all came to pass very gradually in rhoda the sense of this love stole on as subtly as the dawn before she had begun to watch the glowing streaks of rose colour it was daylight and then how warm and golden it grew in her little world how the birds chirped and fluttered and the flowers breathed sweet breath and a thousand diamond drops stood in the humblest blades of grass if she had been nine years old instead of nearly nineteen she could scarcely have given less heed to the worldly aspects of the situation algernon perhaps more consciously set aside considerations of the future he was but a boy however and he always had a great gift of enjoying the present moment and sending janice headed care that looks forward and backward to the deuce as yet there was no lord seeley on his horizon no london society no diplomatic career the latter indeed was but an anachronism of his mother's when she spoke of it to mr diamond and algy at that time had never entertained the idea of it so these two young persons sat side by side on the bench outside the welsh cottage and were as happy as the midsummer days were long but long as the midsummer days were they passed then came the time for going back to whitford the day before their return home rhoda received a shock of pain the first but not the last which she ever felt from this love of hers at these words said carelessly but in a low voice by algy as he lounged at her side watching the sunset rhoda darling you must not say a word to any one about about you and me you know not say a word what had she to say and to whom no algy she answered in a faint little voice and began to meditate the idea had been presented to her for the first time that it was her duty or algy's duty to drag their secret from its home in fairyland and subject it to the eyes and tongues of mortals but being once there the idea stayed in her mind and would not be banished her father mrs errington what would they say if they knew that that she had dared to love algernon the future began to look terribly hard to her the glittering mist which had hidden it was drawn away like a gauze curtain how could she not have seen it all before would any one believe for evermore that she had been such a child such a fool so selfishly absorbed in her pleasant day-dreams as not to calculate the cost of it for one moment until now oh algy the poor child broke out lifting a pale face and startled eyes to his if we could only go on for ever as we are if it would be always summer and we two could stay in this village and never go back or see any of the people again except father she added hastily and a pang of remorse smote her as her conscience told her that the father who loved her so well and who was so good to her whatever he might be to others, was not at all necessary to the happiness of her existence henceforward. "'Don't let's be miserable now, at all events,' returned Algernon cheerfully. "'Look at that purple bar of cloud on the gold. I wonder if I could paint that. I wish I had my colour-box here. The pencil sketches are so dreary after all that colour. Rhoda had no doubt that Algernon could paint that or anything else he applied his brush to. After a while, she said, with her heart beating violently, and the colour coming and going in her cheeks, don't you think it would be wrong deceitful to if we not to tell poor rhoda could not frame her sentence and was obliged to leave it unfinished deceitful am i generally deceitful rhoda oh i say don't cry there's a pet don't my darling i can't bear to see you sorry but look here rhoda dear i'm so young yet that it wouldn't do to talk about being in love or anything of that sort though i know i shall never change they would declare i don't know my own mind and would make a joke of it this shot told with rhoda who shrank from ridicule as a sensitive plant shrinks from the north wind and bother my our lives out can't you see old grim griffin's great front teeth grinning at us it was in these terms that algy was wont to allude to that respectable spinster miss elizabeth grimshaw 
Rhoda knew that Algy wished and expected her to smile when he said that, and she tried to please him, but the smile would not come. Her lip quivered, and tears began to gather in her eyes again. She would have sobbed outright if she had tried to speak. The more she thought, the sadder and more frightened she grew. Ridicule was painful, but that was not the worst. Her father, Mrs. Errington, she lay awake half the night, terrifying herself with imaginations of their wrath. Algy found an opportunity the next morning to whisper to her a few words. "'Don't look so melancholy, Rhoda. They'll wonder at Whitford what's the matter if you go back with such a worn face. And as to what you've said about deceit, why, we shan't pretend not to love each other. Look here, we must have patience. I shall always love you, darling, and I'm sure to get my own way with my mother in the long run. I always do.' So then there would be obstacles to contend with on Mrs. Errington's part, and Algy acknowledged that there would. Of course she had known before that it must be so, but Algy had declared that he would always love her. That was the one comforting thought to which she clung. Rhoda had grown from a child to a woman since yesterday. Algy was only older by four and twenty hours. After their return to Whitford came Mr. Philthorpe's letter, then his mother's application to Lady Seely, brought about by an old acquaintance of Mrs. Errington, who lived in London, and kept up an intermittent correspondence with her. Both these events were talked over in Rhoda's presence. Indeed, the girl filled the part toward Mrs. Errington that the confidant enacts towards the prima donna in an Italian opera. Mrs. Errington was always singing Sainas to her, which, so far as Rhoda's share in them went, might just as well have been uttered in the shape of a soliloquy. But the lady was used to her confidant, and liked to have her near, to take her hand in the impressive passage, and to walk up the stage with her during the symphony. So Rhoda heard Algernon's prospects convassed. In her heart, she longed that he should accept Mr. Philthorpe's offer. It would keep him nearer to her in every sense. She had few opportunities of talking with him alone now, far fewer than at dear Landryden, but she was able to say a few words privately to him one afternoon, the very afternoon of Dr. Bodkin's whist-party, and she timidly hinted that if Algy went to Bristol, instead of to London, amongst all those great folks, she would not feel that she had lost him so completely. "'My dear child!' exclaimed Algy, whose outlook on life had a good deal changed during the last three months. "'How can you talk so? Fancy me on Phil Thorpe's office stool!' "'London is such a long way off, Algy,' murmured the girl plaintively. "'And then, amongst all those grand people, lords and ladies, you may grow different.' "'Upon my word, my dear Rhoda, your appreciation of me is hardly flattering. For my part, it seems to me more likely that I should grow different in the society of Bristol tradesmen than amongst my own kith and kin, people like myself and my parents in education and manners. I am a gentleman, Rhoda. Lord Seely is not more.' Rhoda shrank back abashed before this magnificent young gentleman. Such a flourish was very unusual in Algernon. But the Ancrum strain in him had been asserting itself lately— he was sorry when he saw the poor girl's hurt look and downcast eyes, from which the big tears were silently falling one by one. He took her in his arms and kissed her pale cheeks and brought a blush on to them, and an April smile to her lips, and called her his own dear pretty Rhoda, whom he could never, never forget. "'Perhaps it would be best to forget me, Algy,' she faltered, and although his loving words and flatteries and caresses were inexpressibly sweet to her, the pain remained at her heart." She never again ventured to say a word to him about his plans. She would listen, meekly and admiringly, to his vivid pictures of all the fine things he was to do in the future, pictures in which her figure appeared, like the donor of a great altarpiece, full of splendid saints and golden-crowned angels, kneeling in one corner. And she would sit in silent anguish, whilst Mrs. Errington expatiated on her son's prospects, wherein, of late, a great alliance played a large part, but she could not rouse herself to elation or enthusiasm. This mattered little to Mrs. Errington, who only required her confidant to stand tolerably still with her back to the audience. But it worried Algernon to see Rhoda's sad, downcast face, irresponsive to any of his bright anticipations. It must be owned that the young fellow's position was not entirely pleasant. Yet his admirable temper and spirits scarcely flagged, he was never cross, except now and then, just a very little to his mother, and if no one else in the world less deserved his ill-humour, at least no one else in the world was so absolutely certain to forgive him for it. End of chapter 6 Volume 1, Chapter 7 of A Charming Fellow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope Volume 1, Chapter 7 Parliament was to meet early in February. It seemed strange that that fact should have any interest for Rhoda Maxfield. Nevertheless, so it was. Algernon was to go to London. 
but it was no use to be there unless lord seely our cousin were there also and my lord our cousin would not be in town before the meeting of parliament thus the assembling of the peers and commons of this realm at westminster was an event on which poor rhoda's thoughts were bent pretty often in the course of the twenty-four hours mrs errington announced to the whole maxfield family that algernon was going away from whitford and accompanied the announcement with florid descriptions of the glory that awaited her son in the highest ancrum style of embellishment well said old max after listening a while and will this lord get mr algernon a place mrs errington could not answer this question very definitely the future was vague though splendid but of course algy would distinguish himself that was a matter of course perhaps he might begin as lord seely's private secretary a secretary humph i don't think much of that grunted mr maxfield my dear man you don't understand these things how should you many noblemen's sons would only be too delighted to get the position of private secretary to lord seely a man of such distinction hand and glove with the sovereign max did not altogether dislike to hear his lodger hold forth in this fashion he had a certain pleasure in contemplating the future grandeur of mr algernon whose ears he had boxed years ago on the occasion of finding him enacting the battle of waterloo with a couple of schoolfellows in the warehouse behind the shop and attacking a hugemont of tea-chests and flour-barrels so briskly as to threaten their entire demolition maxfield was weaving speculations in connections with the young man of so wild and fanciful a nature as would have astonished his most familiar friends could they have peeped into the brain inside his grizzled old head but this rose-coloured condition of things did not last one afternoon mrs errington looked into his little sitting-room on her way upstairs and finding him with an account-book in which he was not making but reading entries she stepped in and began to chat if any speech so laboriously condescending as hers to mr maxfield may be thus designated her theme of course was her son and her son's prospects that'll all be very fine for mr algernon to be sure said old max slowly after some time but it'll cost money not so much as you think for low persons who feel themselves in a false position no doubt find it necessary to make a show but a real gentleman can afford to be simple but i take it he'll have to afford other things besides being simple he'll have to afford clothes and lodging and maybe food you aren't rich mrs errington admitted the fact algernon ought to find a wife with a bit of money said the old man looking straight and hard into the lady's eyes those round orbs sustained the gaze as unflinchingly as if they had been made of blue china it is not at all a bad idea mrs errington said graciously but then he wouldn't just take the first ugly woman as had a fortin oh dear no nor yet an old un good gracious man of course not young pretty good and a bit of money that's about his mark eh mrs errington shook her head pathetically she ought to have birth too she said but the woman takes her husband's rank unless she added correcting herself and with much emphasis unless she happens to be the better born of the two oh she does eh the woman takes her husband's rank ah oh, well that's scriptural i've never troubled my head about these vain worldly distinctions but that is scriptural mrs errington was not there to discuss her landlord's opinions or to listen to them but he served as well as another to be the recipient of her talk about algernon which accordingly she resumed and indulged in ever higher flights of boasting her mendacity like george withers muse as it made wing so it made power the fact is there is more than one young lady on whom my connections in london have cast their eye for algy miss pickleham only daughter of the great drysalter who was such an eminent member of parliament blanche fitznowden judge whitelam's lovely niece one of major-general indigo's charming girls all of them perfect specimens of the eastern style of beauty their mother was an indian princess and enormously wealthy but i am in no hurry for my boy to bind himself in an engagement it hampers a young man's career career broke out old max who had listened to all this and much more with an increasingly dismayed and lowering expression of countenance why what's his career to be he's been brought up to do nothing it'd be his only chance to get a hold of a wife with a bit of money then he might act the gentleman at his ease and maybe his fine friends would help him when they found he didn't want it but as for career it's my opinion he'll never earn his salt and with that the old man marched across the passage into the shop taking no further notice of his lodger and she heard him slam the little half-door giving access to the storehouse 
with such force as to set the jingling bell on it tinkling for full five minutes mrs errington was so surprised by this sally that she stood staring after him for some time before she was able to collect herself sufficiently to walk majestically upstairs maxfield's temper becomes more and more extraordinary she said to her son with an air of great solemnity the man really forgets himself altogether do you suppose that he drinks algy or is he do you think a little touched she put her finger to her forehead really i should not wonder there has been a great deal of preaching and screeching lately since this powell came and you know they do say that these ranters and methodists sometimes go raving mad at their field meetings and love feasts you need not laugh my dear boy i have often heard your father say that nothing was more contagious than that sort of hysterical excitement and your father was a physician and certainly knew his profession if he didn't know the world poor man was old max hysterical ma'am asked algernon his whole face lighted up with mischievous amusement and the notion so tickled him that he burst out laughing at intervals as it recurred to him all the rest of the day betty grimshaw and sarah the servant-maid and james helping his father to serve in the shop and the customers who came to buy all suffered from the unusual exacerbation of maxfield's temper for some time after that conversation of his with mrs errington it increased also the resentful feeling which had been growing in his mind towards david powell the young man's tone of rebuke in speaking of rhoda's associating with the erringtons had taken maxfield by surprise at the time and he had not he afterwards thought been sufficiently trenchant in his manner of putting down the presumptuous reprover he blew up his wrath till it burned hot within him and the more so inasmuch as he could give no vent to it in direct terms to question and admonish was the acknowledged duty of a methodist preacher conference made no exceptions in favour of even so select a vessel as jonathan maxfield but maxfield thought nevertheless that powell ought to have had modesty and discernment to make the exception himself no inquisitor no priest sitting like a mysterious eastern idol in the inviolate shrine of the confessional ever exercised a more tremendous power over the human conscience than was laid in the hands of the methodist preacher or leader according to wesley's original conception of his functions but besides the essential difference between the romish and methodist systems that the latter could bring no physical force to bear on the refractory there was this important point to be noted namely that the inquisitor might be subjected to inquisition by his flock the priest might be made to come forth from the confessional box and answer to a pressing catechism before all the congregation in the band meetings and select societies each individual bound himself to answer the most searching questions concerning his state sins and temptations it was a mutual inquisition to which of course those who took part in it voluntarily submitted themselves but the spiritual power wielded by the chiefs was very great as their own subordination to the conference was very complete its pernicious effects were however greatly kept in check by the system of itineracy which required the preachers to move frequently from place to place there are few human virtues or weaknesses to which on one side or the other methodism in its primitive manifestations did not appeal benevolence self-sacrifice fervent piety temperance charity were all called into play by its teachings but so also were spiritual pride narrow-mindedness fanaticism gloom and pharisaical self-righteousness only to the slothful and such as love their ease above all things early methodism had no seductions to offer jonathan maxfield's father and grandfather had been disciples of john wesley the grandfather was born in seventeen ten seven years before wesley and had been among the great preacher's earliest adherents in bristol traditions of john wesley's sayings and doings were cherished and handed down in the family they claimed kindred with thomas maxfield wesley's first preacher and conveniently forgot or ignored as greater families have done those parts of their kinsman's career which ran counter to the present course of their creed and conduct for thomas maxfield seceded from wesley but the grandfather and father of jonathan continued true to methodism all their lives they married within the society as was strictly enjoined in the first conference and assisted the spread of its tenets throughout their part of the west of england in the third generation however the original fire of methodism had nearly burnt itself out and a few charred sticks remained to attest the brightness that had been never perhaps in the case of the maxfields a cramp-natured harsh breed had the fire become a hearth glow to warm their homes with it had rather been like the crackling of thorns under a pot the driest and sharpest will flare for a while old max nevertheless looked upon himself as an exemplary methodist 
he made no mental analysis of himself or of his neighbours he merely took cognizance of facts as they appeared to him through the distorting medium of his prejudices temper ignorance and the habits of a lifetime when he did or said disagreeable things he prided himself on doing his duty and his self-approval was never troubled by the reflection that he did not altogether dislike a little bitter flavour in his daily life as some persons prefer their wine rough but to do and say disagreeable things because it is your duty is a very different matter from accepting or listening to disagreeable things because it is somebody else's duty to do and say them it was not to be expected that jonathan maxfield should meekly endure rebuke from a young man like david powell and now crept in this exasperating suspicion that the young man might have been right in his warning maxfield watched his daughter with more anxiety than he had ever felt about her in his life looking to see symptoms of dejection at algernon's approaching departure he did not know that she had been aware of it before it was announced to himself one day her father said to her abruptly rhoda you're looking very pale and out of sorts your eyes are heavy they were swollen with crying and your face is the colour of a turnip i think i shall send you off to duckwell for a bit of change duckwell farm was owned by seth maxfield's eldest son i don't want a change indeed father said the girl looking up quickly and eagerly i had a headache this morning but it is quite gone now that's what made me look so pale from that time forward she exerted herself to appear cheerful and to shake off the dull pain at the heart which weighed her down until her father began to persuade himself that he had been mistaken and over-anxious she always declared herself to be quite well and free from care and i know she would not tell me a lie thought the old man alas she had learned to lie in her words and her manner she had for the first time in her life a motive for concealment and she used the natural armour of the weak duplicity rhoda had been good hitherto because her nature was gentle and her impulses affectionate she had no strong religious fervour but she lived blamelessly and prayed reverently and was docile and humble-minded she had never professed to have attained that sudden and complete regeneration of spirit which is the prime glory of methodism but then many good persons lived and died without attaining assurance whenever rhoda thought on the subject which to say the truth was not often for her nature though sweet and pure was not capable of much spiritual aspiration and was altogether incapable of fervent self-searching and fiery enthusiasm she hoped with simple faith that she should be saved if she did nothing wicked her father and david powell would have pointed out to her that her doing or leaving undone could have no influence on the matter but their words bore small fruit in her mind her father's religious teaching had the dryness of an accustomed formality to her ears it had been poured into them before she had sense to comprehend it and had grown to be nearly meaningless like the everyday salutation we exchange a hundred times without expecting or thinking of the answer david powell was certainly neither dry nor formal but he frightened her she shut her understanding against the disturbing influence of his words as she would have pressed her fingers into her pretty ears to keep out the thunder and then her dream of love had come and filled her life in most of us it wonderfully alters the focus of the mind's eye with its glamour that dream to rhoda it seemed the one thing beautiful and desirable and to say all the truth the pain of mind which she felt other than that connected with her lover's going away and which she attributed to remorse for the little deceptions and concealments she practised was occasioned almost entirely by the latent dread lest the time should come when she should sit lonely looking at the cold ashes of algy's burnt-out love for she did mistrust his constancy although no power would have forced the confession from her this blind obstinate clinging to the beloved was perhaps the only form in which self-esteem ever strongly manifested itself in that soft timid nature there was one person who watched rhoda more understandingly than her father did and who had more serious apprehensions on her account david powell knew as did nearly all whitford by this time that young errington was going away and he clearly saw that the change in rhoda was connected with that departure he marked her pallor her absence of mind her fits of silence broken by forced bursts of assumed cheerfulness her feigning did not deceive him albeit of almost equally narrow education with jonathan maxfield powell had gained in his frequent changes of place and contact with many strange people a wider knowledge of the world than the whitford tradesman possessed he perceived how unlikely it was that people like the Arringtons should seriously contemplate allying themselves by marriage with old max but that was not the worst to the preacher's mind the girl's position was in the highest degree perilous 
for he conceived that what would be accounted by the world the happiest possible solution to such love as rhoda's would involve nothing less than the putting in jeopardy her eternal welfare he could not look forward with any hope to a union between rhoda and such a one as algernon errington the son is a shallow-hearted fickle youth with the vanity of a boy and the selfishness of a man the mother a mere worldling living in decent godlessness such was david powell's judgment he reflected long and earnestly what was his calling his business in life to save souls he had no concern with anything else he must seek out and help not only those who needed him but those who most needed him all conventional rules of conduct all restraining considerations of a merely social or worldly kind were as threads of gossamer to this man whensoever they opposed the higher commands which he believed to have been laid upon him jonathan maxfield was falling away from godliness he too evidently was willing to give up his daughter into the tents of the heathen the pomps and vanities of this wicked world had taken hold of the old man satan had ensnared and bribed him with the bait of worldly ambition from jonathan there was no real help to be expected in the little garret chamber where he lodged in the house of a widow one of the most devout of the methodist congregation the preacher rose from his knees one midnight and took from his breast the little worn pocket bible which he always carried a bright cold moon shone in at the uncurtained window but its beams did not suffice to enable him to read the small print of his bible he had no candle but he struck a light with a match and by its brief flare read these words on which his finger had fallen as he opened the book how hast thou counselled him that hath no wisdom and how hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is to whom hast thou uttered words and whose spirit came from thee he had drawn a lot and this was the answer the leading was clear he would speak openly with rhoda himself he would pray and wrestle he would argue and exhort he would awaken her spirit lulled to sleep by the sweet voice of the tempter it would truly be little less than a miracle should he succeed by the mere force of his earnest eloquence in persuading a young girl like rhoda to renounce her first love but then david powell believed in miracles end of chapter seven volume one chapter eight of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume one chapter eight all that she had heard of the methodist preacher had taken strong hold of minnie bodkin's imagination mr diamond's description of him especially delighted her it was in piquant contrast with her previous notions about methodists who were associated in her mind with ludicrous images this man must be something entirely different picturesque and interesting but there was a deeper feeling in her mind than the mere curiosity to see a remarkable person minnie was not happy and her unhappiness was not solely due to the fact of her bodily infirmities she often felt a yearning for a higher spiritual support and comfort than she had ever derived from her father's teachings she passed in review the congregation of the parish church most of whom were known to her and she asked herself what good result in their lives or characters was produced by their weekly church-going was mrs errington more truthful miss chubb less vain mr warlock less gloomy her father for minnie in the pride of her keen intellect spared no one less arrogant and overbearing she herself more patient gentle hopeful and happy than if the old bell of st chad's were silent and the worm-eaten old doors shut and the dusty old pulpit voiceless for evermore yet there were said to be people on whom religion had a vital influence she wished she could know such she could judge she thought by seeing and conversing with them whether or not there were any reality in their professions minnie seldom doubted the sufficiency of her own acumen and penetration no she was not happy and might it not be that this methodist man had the secret of peace of mind was there in truth a physician who could minister to a suffering spirit she thought of powell with the feeling half of shame half of credulity with which an invalid hankers after a quack medicine minnie had been taught to look upon dissenters in general as quacks and upon methodists as arch quacks dr bodkin professed himself a staunch churchman and a hater of cant he considered that protestantism and the right of private judgment had justly reached their extreme limit in the church of england as by law established he detested enthusiasm as a dangerous and disturbing element in human affairs and he viewed with especial indignation the pretensions of unlearned persons to preach and proselytize 
although he had no leaning to romanism he would rather have admitted a jesuit into his house than a methodist indeed he sometimes defined the latter to be the jesuit of dissent only as he would take care to point out a jesuit without learning culture or authority i can listen to a gentleman although i may not agree with him the doctor would say albeit in truth he had no great gift of listening to any one who opposed his opinions but am i to be hectored and lectured by the cobbler and the tinker minnie had no taste for being hectored or lectured but it seemed to her that what the cobbler and tinker said was more important than the fact that it was they who said it she thought and pondered and wondered about the methodist preacher and about her chance of ever seeing or hearing more of him until a thought darted into her mind like an arrow little rhoda she was a methodist born and bred and knew this preacher and minnie would send for little rhoda when she announced this resolution to her mother mrs bodkin found several difficulties in the way of its fulfilment what do you want with her minnie i want to see her mrs errington talks so much of her i remember her coming here with a message once when she was a child i recollect only little fair face and shy eyes under a coal scuttle straw bonnet don't you mamma and i want to talk to her about several things added minnie with resolute truthfulness oh dear me what will your papa say i don't see how papa can object to my asking this nice little thing to come over to me for an afternoon when he doesn't mind your boring yourself to death with goody barton whose snuff-taking would try the nerves of a rhinoceros nor forbid my inviting the little jobsons who are unpleasant to look upon and stupid beyond the wildest flights of imagination he lets me have any one i like yes but you teach the little jobsons the alphabet my dear and that is charitable work and rhoda will amuse me and i am sure that is a charitable work minnie would get her own way of course she always did that same evening minnie said to her father with her frank bright smile papa may i not ask rhoda maxfield to take tea with me some afternoon rhoda what little maxfield the grocer's daughter papa said minnie boldly mrs bodkin bent nervously over her knitting what on earth for why do you want to associate with such folks have you not plenty of friends without no papa but i don't ask her because i'm in want of friends oh minnie said mrs bodkin in the quick low tones she habitually spoke in i'm sure nobody has more friends than you have everybody is so glad to come to you always you're my friend mamma and papa is my friend never mind the rest i want to have little maxfield to tea minnie laughed at herself the moment after she had said the words in the tone of a spoiled child dr bodkin crossed and uncrossed his legs kicked a footstool out of the way and then got up and stood before the fire if you want amusement isn't there miss chubb or the mcdougalls or plenty more said he shooting out his upper lip and frowning uneasily now papa can you say in conscience that you find miss chubb and the mcdougalls perennially amusing then with a sudden change of tone besides you know the other people are playing their parts in life and strutting about hither and thither on the stage and they find it all more or less interesting but i i am like a child at a peep-show i can but look on and i sometimes long for a change in the scene and the puppets the doctor began to poke the fire violently laura he said addressing his wife that last tea you got is good for nothing they brought me a cup just now in the study that was absolutely undrinkable is it smith's tea well try maxfield's you can have some ordered when the message is sent for the girl to come here in this way the doctor gave his permission the next day minnie dispatched her maid jane with the following note to mr maxfield will mr maxfield allow his daughter rhoda to spend the afternoon with miss bodkin miss bodkin is an invalid and cannot often leave her room and it would give her great pleasure to see rhoda the maid shall wait and accompany rhoda if mr maxfield permits and miss bodkin undertakes to have her sent safely home again in the evening old max was scarcely more surprised than gratified on reading this invitation he stood behind his counter holding the pink perfumed note between his flowery finger and thumb and turning over the contents of it in his mind whilst his son james served the maid with some tea miss minnie was a much looked up to personage in whitford and here was miss minnie inviting rhoda just as though she had been a lady and sending her own maid for her this would be algy's doing the old man decided algy had more sense than his mother algy knew that rhoda was fit to go anywhere and could hold her own with the best the young fellow was very thick with dr bodkin's family and had no doubt talked to miss minnie about rhoda all sorts of ideas thronged into old max's head which nevertheless looked as obstinately ideal as a one as could well be imagined as he stood conning the pink note with his grey eyebrows knotted together and his heavy underlip pursed up perhaps not the feeblest element in his feeling of exultation was the sense of triumph over david powell 
Powell might approve or disapprove, but anyway he would see that he was wrong in supposing the Erringtons did not think that Rhoda good enough for them. If they had introduced her about among their friends, that meant a good deal, eh, Brother David? And that the invitation came by means of the Erringtons. Maxfield felt more and more convinced the more he thought of it. So many years had passed, and Miss Minnie had taken no notice of Rhoda. Why should she now? Maxfield was at no loss to find the answer. Maybe old Mrs. Errington had talked for talk's sake more than she meant. Maybe her boasting was in order to drive a hard bargain when Algy should come forward and offer to make Rhoda a lady. The Errington's friends were going little by little to make acquaintance with Rhoda, in view of the promotion that awaited her. Well, Rhoda could stand the test. Rhoda was quite different from the likes of him. He called his sister-in-law out of the kitchen, and in a few hurried words told her of the invitation, and bade her tell Rhoda to get ready without delay. He cut Betty Grimshaw short in her exclamations and inquiries. "'I've no time to talk to you now,' he said. "'The maid is waiting. Bid Rhoda clothe herself in her best garments.' "'What? Her Sunday frock, Jonathan?' exclaimed Betty in shrill surprise. "'Shh! Woman!' answered Maxfield, and gripped her wrist fiercely. He did not want that family detail to come to the ears of Miss Bodkin's maid. Rhoda was completely bewildered by the invitation, and by the breathless haste with which Betty announced it to her, and hurried her preparations. "'But I don't want to go,' murmured Rhoda plaintively. At the same time she suffered her clothes to be huddled on to her, in Aunt Betty's rough fashion. "'Ah, tell that to your parent, my dear. I have the mark of his fingers on my wrist at this moment. He was in such a taking, and so uncombounable. This latter was a word of Betty's own invention, and she frequently employed it with the air of great relish. The idea of going amongst strangers was more terrible to Rhoda than can easily be conceived by those who have never lived so secluded a life as hers had been. Had she been able to say a word to Algernon, she thought she should have derived a little comfort and support from him, but he and his mother were both from home. All the way from her house to Dr. Bodkin's, Rhoda uttered no word except to ask Jane timidly if she were sure Miss Minnie would be alone. Quite alone? The gloomy courtyard and the stone entrance hall of the house struck her with awe. The old manservant who opened the door seemed to look severely on her. She followed Jane with a beating heart up the wide staircase, whose thick carpet muffled her footsteps mysteriously, and then through a drawing-room full of furniture all covered with grey holland. There was the glitter of gilt picture frames on the walls, and the shining of a great mirror, and of a large, dark, polished pianoforte at one end of the room. And there was a mingled smell of flowers and cedar wood, and altogether the impression made upon Rhoda's senses, as she passed through the apartment, was one of perfume and silence and vague splendor. She had no time, even if she had had self-possession, to examine the details of what seemed to her so grand, for she was led across a passage and into a room opposite to the drawing-room, and found herself in Miss Bodkin's presence. The room was Minnie's bedroom, but it did not look like a sleeping chamber, Rhoda thought. To be sure, a little white curtained bed stood in one corner, but all the toilet apparatus was hidden by a curtain, which hung across a recess, and there were bookshelves full of books, and flowers on a stand, and a writing table. On one side of the fireplace, in which a bright fire blazed, there was a curious sort of long chair, and in it, dressed in a loose crimson robe of soft woolen stuff, reclined Minnie Bodkin. Rhoda was, as has been said, extremely sensitive to beauty and Minnie's whole aspect struck her with admiration. The picturesque, rich-colored robe, the delicate white hands relieved upon it, the graceful languor of Minnie's attitude, and the air of refinement in the young lady and her surroundings, were all intensely appreciated by poor little Rhoda, who stood dumb and blushing before her hostess. Minnie, on her part, was a good deal taken by surprise. She welcomed Rhoda with her sweetest smile, and thanked her for coming, and made her sit down by the fire opposite to herself, and when they were alone together, she talked on for some time with a sort of careless good nature, which little by little succeeded in setting Rhoda somewhat at her ease. But careless as Minnie's manner was, she was scrutinizing the other girl's looks and ways very keenly. She's absolutely lovely, thought Minnie, and so graceful and ladylike. Yes, positively, that is the word. She is shy as a fawn, but no more awkward than one. It is not what I expected." Perhaps Minnie could scarcely have said what it was that she had expected. Probably a quiet, pretty-looking, well-behaved young person like her maid Jane. Rhoda was something very different, and the young lady was charmed with her new protégé. Only she was obliged to admit, before the afternoon was over, that she had failed in the main object for which she had invited Rhoda to visit her. There was no clear and vivid account of Powell, his teaching, or his preaching, to be got from Rhoda. Rhoda could not remember exactly what Mr. Powell said 
Rhoda could not say what it was which made all the people cry and grow so excited at his preaching. Rhoda cried herself sometimes, but that was when he talked very pitifully about poor people and little children and things like that. Sometimes, too, she felt frightened at his preaching, but she supposed she was frightened because she had not got assurance. Many of the congregation had assurance. Yes, oh yes, the people said Mr. Powell was a wonderful man, and the most awakening preacher, who had been in Whitford for fifty years. Minnie looked at the simple, serious face, and marked the childlike demureness of manner, with which Rhoda declared Mr. Powell to be an awakening preacher. "'I don't think he has awakened you to any very startling extent,' thought Minnie. "'This girl seems to have received no strong influence from him.' This was in great measure the fact. But also Rhoda was held back from speaking freely, by the conviction that her Methodist phraseology would sound strange and perhaps absurd in the young lady's ears. Moreover, it did not help to put her at ease that she felt sundry uneasy pricks of conscience, for not bearing testimony with more fervour. She knew that David Powell would have had her improve the occasion to the uttermost. But how could she run the risk of being disagreeable to Miss Minnie, who was so kind to her? That was the form in which Rhoda mentally put the case. The truth was, hers was not one of those natures, to which the invisible ever becomes more real and important than the visible. It was incomparably more necessary to her happiness to be in agreeable and smooth relations with the people around her than to feel herself in higher spiritual communion with unseen powers. When Minnie at length reluctantly desisted from questioning her on the subject of Powell and her chapel-going and her religious feelings, she was surprised to find how the girl's frigid, constrained manner thawed and how her tongue was loosened. She chatted freely enough about her visit to Lawn Ryden in the summer and about Duckwell Farm, where her half-brother Seth lived, and above all about Mrs. Errington. Mrs. Errington had been so good to her, and had taught her and talked to her, and did Miss Minnie know what a change it was for a lady like Mrs. Errington to live in such a poor place as theirs? For although she had the best rooms, of course, it was very poor compared with the castle she was brought up in. About Algernon she said very little, but it slipped out that she was in the habit of being present when Mr. Diamond came to read with the young gentleman and then Miss Minnie was very much interested in hearing what Mr. Diamond said to his pupil, and how Rhoda liked Mr. Diamond, and what she thought of him, and when it appeared that Rhoda had thought very little about him at all, but considered him a very clever, learned gentleman, perhaps a little stiff and grave, but not at all unkind, Miss Minnie smiled to herself and said, "'He is a little stiff and grave, Rhoda, not the kind of person to attract one very much, eh?' And then the tea was brought, and Rhoda sipped hers out of a delicate porcelain cup, like those which Mrs. Errington had in her corner cupboard. And there were some delicious cakes, which Rhoda was quite natural enough to own she liked very much. And then Mrs. Bodkin came in and sat down beside her daughter, and finally, at Minnie's request, she took Rhoda into the drawing-room and played to her on the grand piano. "'Rhoda likes music,' she says, Mamma, but she has never heard a good instrument. Do play her a bit of Mozart.' "'I'm no great performer, my dear,' said Mrs. Bodkin, opening the piano, "'but I keep up my playing on my daughter's account. "'She is not strong enough to play for herself.' "'Minnie had her chair wheeled into the drawing-room in order, "'as she whispered to her mother, "'to enjoy Rhoda's face when she should hear the music. "'Rhoda sat by and listened in a trance of delight, "'while Mrs. Bodkin made the keys of the instrument "'delicately sound a minuet of Mozart, "'and then give forth more volume of tones in The Heavens Are Telling.' This was different, indeed, from the tinkling old harpsichord at home. The music transported her. When it ceased, she was breathing quickly, and her eyes were full of tears. "'Oh, how beautiful!' she faltered out. "'Why, child, you are a capital audience,' said Mrs. Bodkin, smiling kindly. Then it was time to go home. She was made to promise that she would come again and see Minnie whenever her father would let her. She left Dr. Bodkin's house in a very different frame of mind from that in which she had entered it, yet she was as silent on her way home as she had been in the afternoon. How happy gentlefolks must be, who always can have music and flowers and talk in such soft voices, and are so polite in their manners and so dainty in their persons. She could not help contrasting the coarse rough ways at home with the smoothness and softness of the life she had had a glimpse of at Dr. Bodkin's. She tried to hold fast in her memory the pleasant sights and sounds of the day. In this mood, half enjoying, half regretful, she arrived at her father's house to find the little parlour full of people. Besides her own family and Powell, there were two or three neighbours who joined in the exercises, and a prayer meeting, just culminating in a long-drawn hymn, bawled out with more zeal than sweetness by the little assembly. End of chapter 8
by francis eleanor trollope volume one chapter nine rhoda stood with her hand on the parlour door for a minute or so little sarah the serving-maid who had admitted her into the house and had left the parlour in order to do so for all the maxfield household was held bound to join in these weekly prayer meetings told her that the hymn would be over directly rhoda felt shy of entering into the midst of the people assembled and of encountering the questions and expressions of surprise which her unprecedented absence from the evening's devotions would certainly occasion presently the singing ceased rhoda ran as quickly and noiselessly as she could along the passage and halfway up the stairs from her post there she heard the neighbours go away and the street door close heavily behind them now she might venture to slip down every one was gone the house was quite still she ran into the parlour and found herself face to face with david powell her aunt betty was piling the hymn-books in their place on the little table where they stood there was no one else in the room where's father asked rhoda hastily then she recollected herself and bade mr powell good evening he returned her salutation with his usual gentleness but with more than his usual gravity oh exclaimed betty grimshaw looking round from the books it's you is it rhoda your father's gone with mr gladwish to his house for a bit they have some business together he'll be back by supper it very seldom happened that maxfield left his house after dark still such a thing had occurred once or twice mr gladwish the shoemaker was a steward of the methodist society and maxfield not unfrequently had occasion to confer with him their business this evening was not so pressing but that it might have been deferred but maxfield did not choose to give powell an opportunity of private conversation with himself at that time he wanted to see his way clearer before he took the decided step of openly putting himself into opposition with the practice of his brethren and the advice of the preacher and he knew powell well enough to be sure that evasions would not avail with him therefore he had gone out as soon as the prayers were at an end i must see to the supper said betty and bustled off without another word nothing would have kept her in mr powell's society but the masterful influence of her brother-in-law she escaped to her haven of refuge the kitchen where the moral atmosphere was not too rarefied for the comfortable breathing of ordinary folks david powell and rhoda were left alone together rhoda made a little half timid half impatient movement of her shoulders she wished powell gone more heartily than she had ever done before in the course of her acquaintance with him powell stood with his hands clasped and his eyes cast down in deep meditation at length rhoda took courage to murmur a word or two about going to take her cloak off aunt betty would be back presently if mr powell didn't mind for a minute or two she was gliding towards the door when his voice stopped her tarry a little rhoda said the preacher looking up at her with his lustrous earnest eyes i have something on my soul to say to you rhoda's eyes fell before his as they habitually did now she felt as though he could read her heart and she had something to hide in it she did not seat herself but stood with one hand on the wooden mantel-shelf, looking into the fire. In her other hand she held her straw bonnet by its violet ribbon, and her waving brown hair shone in the firelight. "'What is it, Mr. Powell?' she asked. She spoke sharply, and her tone smote painfully on her hearer. He did not understand that the sharpness in it was born of fear. "'Rhoda,' he began, "'my spirit has been much exercised on your behalf.' he paused but she did not speak only bent her head a little lower as she stood leaning in the same attitude rhoda i fear your soul is unawakened you are sweet and gentle as a dove or a lamb is gentle but you have not the root of the matter as a christian hath it the fabric is built on sand fair as it is a breath may overthrow it there is but one sure foundation whereon to lay our lives and yours is not set upon it I i try to be good stammered rhoda in whom the consciousness of much truth in what powell was saying struggled with something like indignation at being thus reproved with a sense of a painful shock from this jarring discord coming to close the harmonious impressions of her pleasant day and with an inarticulate dread of what was yet in store for her i say my prayers and i don't think i'm so very wicked mr powell no one thinks i am but you oh rhoda oh my child his voice grew tender as sad music, and as he went on speaking, all trace of diffidence and hesitation fell away, and only the sincere purpose of the man shone in him, clear as sunlight. My heart yearns with compassion over you. Are those the words of a believing and repentant sinner? You try? You say your prayers? You are not so wicked? Rhoda, behold, I have an urgent message for you, which you must hear. She started and looked round at him. He read her thought no earthly message rhoda and from no earthly being ah child the eager look dies out of your eyes 
Rhoda, do you ever think how much God loveth us? How much he loveth you, poor perishing little bird, fluttering blindly in the outer darkness of the world, that darkness which comprehended not the light from the beginning? Rhoda's tears were now dropping fast. Her lip trembled as she repeated once more, I try, I do try to be good, with an almost peevish emphasis. Nay, Rhoda, I must speak. In his hand all instruments are alike good and serviceable. He has chosen me, even me, to call you to him. However much you may despise the messenger, the message is sure, and of unspeakable comfort. Oh, Mr. Powell, I don't despise you. Indeed, I don't. I know you mean, I know you are good. But I don't think there's any such great harm in going to see a young lady who is too ill to go out. I'm sure she is a very good young lady. I'm sure I do try to be good. That was the sum of Rhoda's eloquence. She held fast by those few words in a helpless way, which was at once piteous and irritating. "'Are you speaking in sincerity from the very bottom of your heart?' asked Powell, with the invincible patient gentleness which is born of a strong will. "'No, Rhoda, you know you are not. There is harm in following our own inclinations, rather than the voice of the Spirit within us. There is harm in clinging to works, to anything we can do.' There is harm in neglecting the service of our master to pleasure any human being. I did forget that it was prayer meeting to-night, admitted Rhoda, more humbly than before. Her natural sweetness of temper was regaining the ascendant, in proportion as her dread of what might be the subject of Powell's reproving admonition decreased. She could bear to be told that it was wrong to visit Minnie Bodkin. She should not like to be told so, and she should refuse to believe it, but she could bear it, and she began to believe that this visit was held to be the head and front of her offending. Powell's next words undeceived her, and startled her back into a paroxysm of mistrust and agitation. "'But it is not of your absence from prayer to-night that I would speak now. You are entangling yourself in a snare. You are laying up stores of sorrow for yourself and others.' You are listening to the sweet voice of temptation, and giving your conscience into the hand of the ungodly to ruin and deface. He made a little gesture towards the room overhead with his hand, as he said that Rhoda was giving her conscience into the hands of the ungodly. I do not know what you mean, Mr. Powell, and I don't think it's charitable to speak so of a person, of persons that you know nothing of. She was entirely taken off her guard. Her head felt as if it were whirling round, and the words she uttered seemed to come out of her mouth without her will. Between fear and anger she trembled like a leaf in the wind. She would have fled out of the room, but her strength failed her. Her heart was beating so fast that she could scarcely breathe. Her distress pained Powell to the heart, pained him so much as to dismay him with a vivid glimpse of the temptation that continually lay in wait for him, to spare her and soothe her and cease from his painful probing of her conscience. "'Oh, there is a bone of the old man in me yet,' he thought remorsefully. "'Lord, Lord, strengthen me, or I fall. "'How hast thou counselled him that hath no wisdom, "'and how hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is?' "'The remembrance of the lot he had drawn came into his mind "'as an answer to his mental prayer. "'It was natural that the words should recur to him vividly at that moment, "'but he accepted their recurrence as an undoubted inspiration from heaven.' The belief in such direct and immediate communications was a vital part of his faith, and to have destroyed it would in great part have paralyzed the impetuous energy and quenched the burning enthusiasm which carried away his hearers and communicated something of his own exaltation to the most torpid spirits. He murmured a few words of fervent thanksgiving for the clear leading which had been vouchsafed to him, and without an instant's hesitation addressed the tearful, trembling girl beside him. "'Listen to me, Rhoda. If it be good for your soul's sake that I lay bare my heart before you, and suffer sore in the doing of it, shall I shrink? God forbid. By his help I will plentifully declare the thing as it is. I have watched you, and your feelings have not been hid from me. No, nor your fears, and sorrows, and hopes, and struggles. I have read them all so plainly, that I must believe the Lord has given me a special insight in your case, that I may call you unto him with power.' You are suffering, Rhoda, and sorry, but you have not thrown your burden upon the Lord. You have set up his creature as an idol in your soul, and have bowed down and worshipped it. And you fancy, poor unwary lamb, that such love as yours was never felt before by mortal, and that never did mortal so entirely deserve it. And you say in your heart, Lo, this man talks of what he knows not. It is easy for him. Well, I tell you, Rhoda, that I too have a heart for human love. 
i have eyes to see what is fair and lovely and fancies and desires and passions i love there is a maiden whom i love above all god's creatures but by his grace i have overcome that love in so far as it perilled the higher love and the higher duty which i owe to my father in heaven i have wrestled sore god knoweth and he hath helped me as he always will help those who rely not on their own strength but on his rhoda was hurried out of herself carried away by the rush of his eloquence in whose powerful spell the mere words bore but a small part eyes voice and gesture expressed the most absolute self-forgetting enthusiasm the contagion of his burning sincerity drew a sincere utterance from his hearer but you talk as if it were a crime does any one call you wicked and godless because you have human feelings i never should call you so and i believe we were meant to love to love ah yes rhoda to love for evermore and in a measure we can but faintly conceive here below the young maiden i love is still dearer to me than any other human being it may be that even the angels in heaven know what it is to love one blessed spirit above the rest but her soul is more precious to me than her beauty or her sweet ways or her happiness on earth oh rhoda look upward yet a little while and the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest and there cometh peace unspeakable this earthly love is but a fleeting show can you say that you connect it with your hope of heaven and your faith in god does he whom you love reverence the things you have been taught to hold sacred is he awakened to a sense of sin no no a thousand times no rhoda for his sake for the sake of that darkened soul if not for your own yield not to the temptation which makes you untrue in word and deed and chills your worship and weighs down the wings of your spirit tell this beloved one that although he were the very life-blood of your heart yet if he seek not salvation you will cast him from you rhoda had sunk down half crouching half kneeling with her arms upon a chair and her face bowed down upon her hands she was crying bitterly but silently but at the preacher's last words she moved her shoulders like one in pain and uttered a little inarticulate sound powell bent forward listening eagerly i speak not as one without understanding he said after an instant's pause i plentifully declare the thing as it is and as i know it your love rhoda your little twinkling flame compared to the passionate nature in me is as the faint light of a taper to a raging fire as a trickling water brook to the deep dreadful sea child child you know not the power of the lord his voice has said to my unquiet soul be still and it obeys him shall he not speak peace to your purer clearer spirit also shall he not carry you as a lamb in his bosom now it may be even now as i speak to you that his angels are about you moving your heart towards him rhoda rhoda will you grieve those messengers of mercy will you turn away from that unspeakable love the girl suddenly lifted her face it was a tear-stained wistfully imploring face and yet it wore a singular expression of timid obstinacy she was struggling to ward off the impression his words were making on her she was unwilling and afraid to yield to it but when she looked up and saw his countenance so pale so earnest without one trace of anger or impatience or any feeling save profoundest pity and sweetness and sorrow her heart melted the right chord was touched she could not be moved by compassion for herself but she was penetrated by sorrow for him in an impulse of pitying sympathy she exclaimed oh don't be sorry for me mr powell i will try i will do what you say if the door opened and her father stood in the room rhoda sprang from her knees rushed past him and out at the open door man man what have you done cried powell wringing his hands then he sat down and hid his face jonathan maxfield stood looking at him with a heavy frown we must have no more of this he said harshly End of chapter nine chapter ten of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope chapter ten the time which elapsed between rhoda's first visit to minnie bodkin and the beginning of february february which was to carry algernon errington away to the great metropolis was a vexed and stormy one for the maxfield household jonathan maxfield had come to a downright quarrel with the preacher or to something as near to a quarrel as can be attained where the violence and vituperation are all on one side, and had ordered Powell out of his house. This was a serious step, and was sure to be searchingly convassed. Maxfield absented himself from the next class meeting on the plea of ill health. 
There was a general knowledge in the class and throughout the society that there had been a breach, and many members began to take sides rather warmly. Maxfield was not a personally popular man, but he had considerable influence amongst his fellow Wesleyans, the influence of wealth and a strong will, and the long habit of being a leading personage. David Powell, on the other hand, was not heartily liked by many of the congregation. The Whitford Methodists had slid into a sleepy, comfortable state of mind in their obscure little corner. They acquired no new members, and lost no old ones. Even the well-devised machinery of Methodism, so calculated to enforce movement and quicken attention, had grown somewhat rusty in Whitford. Frequent change of preachers is a powerful spur to sluggish hearers. But even this, among the fundamental peculiarities of Methodism, was very seldom applied to the Whitfordians. Circumstances and their own apathy had brought it to pass that two elderly preachers, steady, jog-trot old roadsters, had alternately succeeded each other in exhorting and preaching to this quiet flock for several years. There was, besides, Nick Green, foreman to Mr. Gladwish, the shoemaker, who enjoyed the rank of local preacher for a time, but who finally seceded from the main body, and drew with him half a dozen or so of the more zealous or excitable worshippers, who subscribed to hire a room over a corn-dealer's storehouse in Lady Lane, and by the stentorian vehemence of this Sunday devotion there, speedily acquired the title of ranters. Into this sleepy, comfortable Whitford society, David Powell had burst with his startling energy and fiery eloquence, and it was impossible to be sleepy and comfortable any longer. No one likes to be suddenly roused from a doze, and Powell had awakened Whitford as with the sound of a trumpet. Yet after the effects of the first start and shock had subsided, the Methodists began to take pride in the attention which their preacher attracted. Their little chapel was crowded. His field preaching drew throngs of people from all the countryside. Instead of being merely an obscure little knot of dissenters, about whom no outsider troubled himself, they felt themselves to be objects of general observation. Old men, who had heard Wesley preach half a century ago, declared that this Welshman had inherited the mantle of their founder. But then came, by no slow or doubtful degrees, the discovery that David Powell had inherited more than the traditional eloquence of John Wesley, and that, like that wonderful man, he spared neither himself nor others in the service of his master. He set up a standard of conduct which dismayed many, even of the leading Methodists, who did not share that exaltation of spirit which supported Powell in his disdain of earthly comforts. And the awful sincerity of his character was found by many to be absolutely intolerable, he made a strong effort to revive the early morning services, which had quite fallen into desuetude at Whitford. What? Go to pray in the cold little meeting-house at five o'clock on a winter's morning? There was scarcely one of the congregation whose health would allow of such a proceeding. Then his matter-of-fact interpretations of much of the gospel teachings was excessively startling. He would coolly expect you to deprive yourself not only of superfluities, but of necessaries, such, for instance, as three meals of flesh meat a day, which are clearly indispensable for health, in order to give to the poor. It must be owned that he practised his own precepts in this respect, and that he literally gave away all he had, beyond the trifling sum which was needful to clothe him with decency, and to feed him in a manner which the Whitfordians considered reprehensibly inadequate. Such asceticism savoured almost of monkery. It was really wrong. At least it was to be hoped that it was wrong. Otherwise... So the awakening preacher by no means had all his flock on his side when they suspected him to be in opposition to old Max. Jonathan's mind had been, as he expressed it, greatly exercised respecting his daughter. He was drawn different ways by contending impulses. To speak to Rhoda openly, to send her to Duckwell out of Algernon's way, to let things go on as they were going, for was not Rhoda's reception by the Bodkins manifestly a preliminary step to her permanent rise in the social scale? to talk openly to Algernon, and to demand his intentions, all these plans presented themselves to his mind in turn, and each in turn appeared the most desirable. Jonathan was not an irresolute man in general, because he never doubted his own perfect competency to deal with circumstances as they arose in his life, but now he felt his ignorance. He did not understand the ways of gentlefolks. He might injure his daughter by his attempt to serve her. And although he had fits of self-assertion, during which he made much of the value of his own money and of Rhoda's merits, all did not avail to free his spirit from the subjection it was in to gentlefolks. Again he was urged not to seem to distrust the Arringtons by a strong feeling of opposition to Powell. Powell had warned him against letting Rhoda associate with them, 
Powell had even gone so far as to reprehend him for having done so. To prove Powell wholly wrong and presumptuous, and himself wholly right and sagacious, was a very powerful motive with Maxfield. Then, too, the one soft place in his heart contributed no less than the above-mentioned feelings to make him pause before coming to a decisive explanation with the Arringtons, which might, yes, he could not help seeing that it might, result in a total breach between his family and them, and this increased his hesitation as to the line of conduct he should pursue. For the conviction had been growing on him daily that Rhoda's happiness was seriously involved, and Rhoda's happiness was a tremendously high stake to play. The discussion between himself and Powell did not trouble Maxfield so much. The world, his little world, as important to him as other little worlds are to the titled, or the rich, or the fashionable, or the famous, supposed him to be greatly chagrined and exercised in spirit on this account, and people sympathized with him or blamed him, according to their prejudices, their passions, or sometimes their convictions. But the truth was, old Max cared little about being at odds with the preacher, or with the congregation, or with both. He had been an important personage among the Whitford Methodists, all through the old comfortable days of sleepy concord. And was he now to become a less important personage in these new times of awakening? Better war than an ignominious peace. Nay, there came at last to be talk of expelling him from the Methodist society, unless he would confess his fault towards the preacher and amend it. Maxfield had no lack of partisans in Whitford, as has been stated, but then there was the superintendent. In those days the superintendent, or as some old-fashioned Methodist continued to call him in the original Wesleyan phrase, the assistant, of the circuit in which Whitford was situated, was a man of great zeal and sincere enthusiasm. For those unacquainted with the mechanism of Methodism, it may be well briefly to state what were this person's functions. Long before John Wesley's death, the whole country was divided into circuits, in which the itinerant preachers made their rounds, and of each circuit the whole spiritual and temporal business, so far as they were connected with the aims and interests of Methodism, was under the regulation of the assistant, afterwards styled the superintendent, whose office it was to admit or expel members, take lists of the society at Easter, hold quarterly meetings, visit the classes quarterly, preside at the love feasts, and so forth. The period for the superintendent's next visit to Whitford was rapidly approaching, Maxfield weighed the matter, and tried to forecast the result of a former reference of the disagreement between himself and Powell to this man's judgment. Had this superintendent, Mr. John Bateson by name, been a Whitford man, one of the old, comfortable, narrow-minded tradesmen over whom old Max had exercised supremacy in things methodistical for years, Maxfield would have felt no doubt, but that the matter would have ended in an unctuous admonition to Powell to moderate his unseemly excess of zeal, and in the establishment of himself, more firmly than ever, in his place as leader of the congregation. But Mr. Bateson could not be relied on to take this sensible view. He was one of the new-fangled, upsetting, meddling sort, and would doubtless declare David Powell to have been performing his bounden duty, in being instant, in season, and out of season. So that, thought Jonathan, I should not be master in my own house. And if he included in the notion of being master in his own house the power of shutting out his fellow Methodists, preacher and all, from the knowledge of his most private family affairs, the conclusion was a pretty just one. Moreover, it was one to which the very constitution of Methodism pointed a priori. But old Maxfield had never in his life been brought into collision with any one who carried out his principles to their legitimate and logical results, as did David Powell. Maxfield's creed was a thing to take out and air, and acknowledge at chapel and prayer meetings and field preachings and such like occasions, whilst his practice was, well, it certainly was not too bright or good for human nature's daily food. David Powell's uncompromising interpretation of certain precepts was intolerable to many besides Maxfield, but the majority of the Whitford Methodists look forward to Powell's removal to another sphere of action. His stay among them had already been longer than was usual with the itinerant preachers, but it was understood to have been specially prolonged in consequence of the abundant fruits brought forth by his ministrations in Whitford. Still, he would go sooner or later, and then there would be a relaxation of the strong tension in which men's minds and consciences had been strained by the strange influence of this preacher. But old Maxfield thought it very probable that before leaving Whitford, the preacher might compass his, Maxfield's, expulsion from the Methodist body. Then he took a great resolution. One Sunday, Jonathan James and Rhoda Maxfield, together with Elizabeth Grimshaw, were seen at the morning service in the Abbey Church of St. Chad's, and again in the afternoon. Dr. Bodkin himself stared down from his pulpit at the Methodist family. 
those of the congregation to whom they were known by sight, and these were the great majority, found their devotions quite disturbed by this unexpected addition to their number. The Maxfield kept their eyes on their prayer books, and outwardly took no heed of the attention they excited. Old Jonathan and his son James looked pretty much as usual. Rhoda trembled and blushed and looked painfully shy whenever the forms of the service required her to rise, so as to bring her face above the pew, those were the days of pews, and within easy range of the curious eyes of the congregation. But Betty Grimshaw held her head aloft, and uttered the responses in a loud voice and without glancing at her book, as one to whom the Church of England service was entirely familiar. Betty was heartily delighted with the family conversion from the errors of Methodism, and supported her brother-in-law in it with great warmth. Her Methodism had, in truth, been a mere piece of conformity, for peace and quietness' sake, as she avowed with much candour. And as she was fond of saying that she had been bred up to the church, by which phrase it must not be understood that Betty intended to convey to her hearers that she had entered on an ecclesiastical career. If the sensation created in the Abbey Church by the Maxfield appearance there was great, the surprise and excitement caused by their absence from the Methodist chapel was still greater. By the afternoon of that same Sunday it was known to all the Wesleyans, that old Max, with his family, had been seen at St. Chad's. No one deemed it strange that the whole family should have seceded in a body from their own place of worship. It appeared quite natural to all his old acquaintances that whither Jonathan Maxfield went, his son and his daughter and his sister-in-law should follow him. It is probable that, had he turned Jew or Mohammedan, they would equally have taken it for granted that his conversion involved that of the rest of his family, which opinion was certainly complimentary to old Max's force of character." and such force of character as consists in pursuing one's own way single-mindedly old max undoubtedly possessed a good solid belief in oneself tempered by an inability to see more than one side of a question will cleave its way through the world like a wedge we have seen however that into maxfield's mind a doubt of himself on one subject had entered and as doubt will do it weakened his action very considerably as regarded that subject but on all other matters he was himself and perhaps infused an extra amount of obstinacy and self-assertion into his behaviour, as though to counterbalance the one weak point. Towards his old co-religionists he showed himself inflexible. Mr. Bateson, the superintendent, duly arrived, but Jonathan refused to see him, and walked out of his shop when the superintendent walked into it. Maxfield was grimly triumphant, and kept out of the reach of any expression of displeasure from Mr. Bateson, if displeasure he felt. His defection was undoubtedly a blow to the Methodist community in Whitford, and much indignation, not loud but deep, was aroused in consequence against Powell, who was looked upon as the prime cause of it. What if the preacher did possess awakening eloquence and burning zeal to save sinners? Here was Jonathan Maxfield, a warm man, a respectable and a thriving man, an ancient pillar of the society, lost to it beyond recall by Powell's means. And by whom did Powell seek to replace such a man as old Max? by Richard Gibbs, the groom, brother of Minnie Bodkin's maid, who had hitherto enjoyed a reputation for unmitigated blackguardism, by Sam Smith the cobbler, once drunken, now drunken no longer, by stray vagrants who were converted at his field preaching, and by the poorest poor and wretchedest wretched generally. And the worst of it was that one could not openly find fault with all this. David Powell would, with mild yet fervent earnestness, quote some New Testament text which stopped one's mouth, if it didn't change one's opinion as if the words ought to be interpreted in that literal way. Well, he would go away before long, that was some comfort. The period during which this rift in the Methodist community was widening was a time of peculiar pleasantness to some of our Whitford acquaintance. One of these was Minnie Bodkin. By degrees the habit had established itself, among a few of her friends, of meeting every Saturday afternoon in Dr. Bodkin's drawing-room. Mr. Diamond usually made one at these meetings. Saturday was a half-holiday at the grammar school, and he was thus at leisure. He had grown more sociable of late, and Mrs. Errington was convinced that this change was entirely owing to her advice. There was Algernon, whose sparkling spirits made him invaluable. There was Mrs. Errington, who was made welcome, as other mothers sometimes are, in right of the merits of her offspring. There was Miss Chubb very often. There was the Reverend Peter Warlock nearly always. And of all the people in the world, there would often be seen Rhoda Maxfield, modestly ensconced behind Minnie's couch, or half hidden by the voluminous folds of Mrs. Errington's gown. No sooner had Mrs. Errington heard of Rhoda's first visit to Dr. Bodkin's house than she took all the credit of the invitation to herself. She decided that it must certainly be due to her report of Rhoda, 
and partly because she really wished to be kind to the girl, partly because it seemed pretty clear that Minnie was resolved to have her own way about seeing more of her new protégé, and Mrs. Errington was minded that this should come to pass with her cooperation, so as to retain her post of first patroness. The good lady fostered the intimacy by all means in her power. The Italians have a proverb to the effect that there are persons who will take credit to themselves for the sunshine in July. Mrs. Errington would complacently have assumed the merit of the whole solar system. Now at these Saturdays there grew and strengthened themselves many conflicting feelings and hopes and illusions. It was a game at cross-purposes, to which none of the players held the key except Algernon. That young gentleman's perceptions, unclouded and uncoloured by strong feeling, were pretty clear and accurate. However, the period of his departure was fast approaching, and after me, the deluge, might be taken to epitomize his sentiments in view of possible complications which threatened to arise among his own intimate circle of friends. To whatever degree the time might seem to be out of joint, Algy would never torment himself with the fancy that he was born to set it right. If there is to be a mess, I am better out of it, was his ingenuous reflection. Meanwhile, whatever thoughts might be flitting about under his bright curls, nothing save the most winning good humour, the most insouciant hilarity ever peeped for an instant out of his frank shining eyes, and the weeks went by, and February was at hand. End of chapter 10「Volume One, Chapter Eleven of A Charming Fellow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope. Volume One, Chapter Eleven. In how few cases would the power to see ourselves as others see us be other than a very malevolent and wicked fairy like gift? And perhaps the discovery of the real reasons why our friends like us would not be the least mortifying part of the revelation. Now the Bodkins liked Miss Chubb but they did not like her for her manners, her knowledge of the usages of polite society, her highly respectable clerical connections, or the little gum-down curls on her forehead, on all of which Miss Chubb prided herself. Dr. Bodkin liked her principally because she was an old acquaintance. It pleased him to see various people, and to do and say various things daily, often for no better reason than that he had seen the same people and done and said the same things yesterday, and throughout a long, backward-reaching chain of yesterdays. Mrs. Bodkin liked her because she was good-natured, and neither strong-minded nor strong-willed enough to domineer over her. Minnie liked her because she found her peculiarities very amusing. "'Miss Chubb has the veriest rag-bag of a mind,' said Minnie, "'and pulls out of it every now and then unexpected scraps of ignorance, as other folks display bits of knowledge in the oddest way.' She could often endure to listen to Miss Chubb's chatter, when the talk of wiser people irritated her nerves, and Minnie would speak with Miss Chubb on many subjects more unreservedly than she did with any other of her acquaintances. "'What Minnie Bodkin can find in that affected old maid to have her so much with her, when she is so reserved and standoffish, to, to quite superior persons and nearer her own age, I am at a loss to understand,' Violet MacDougall would say, tossing her thin spiral ringlets, and Rose, the bitterer of the two, would make answer raspingly, why, Miss Chubb toadies her, my dear. That's the secret. Poor Minnie, of course one wishes to make every allowance for her afflicted state, but there are limits. Miss Chubb is almost a fool, and that suits poor dear Minnie's domineering spirit. Unconscious of these and similar comments, Minnie and Miss Chubb continued to be very good friends. There sat Miss Chubb in Dr. Bodkin's drawing-room one Saturday about noon, her round face beaming, and her fat fingers covered with huge old-fashioned rings busily engaged in some bright-coloured worsted work. She had come early, and was to have luncheon with Mrs. Bodkin and Minnie, and was a good deal elated by the privilege, although she did her best to repress any ebullition of her good spirits, and to assume the languishing air which she chose to consider particularly genteel. Minnie and Miss Chubb were alone. Mrs. Bodkin was busy. Mrs. Bodkin was nearly always busy. She superintended the machinery of her household very effectively, but she was one of those persons whose labours met with scant recognition. Dr. Bodkin had a vague idea that his wife liked to be fussing about in kitchen and storeroom, and that she did a great deal more than was necessary. But, then, you see, it amused her. He very much liked order, punctuality, economy, and good cookery, and since it amused Laura to supply him with these, the combination was at once fortunate and satisfactory. "'My dear Minnie,' said Miss Chubb, raising her eyes to the ceiling with a languishing glance, which would have been more effective had it not been invariably accompanied by an odd wrinkling up of the nose, did you ever, in all your days, 
hear of anything so extraordinary as the appearance of those methodist people at church on sunday it was strange strange my dear love it was amazing but it ought to be a matter of congratulations to us all to see dissenters embracing the canons of the church and the methodists especially are such dreadful people i believe they think nothing of foaming at the mouth and going into convulsions in the open chapel i wonder if those maxfields felt anything of the kind on sunday it would have been a terrible thing my dear if they had had to be carried out on stretchers or anything of that sort what would mr bodkin have said i don't think there's any fear of papa's sermons throwing anybody into convulsions of course not my dear child pray don't imagine that i hinted at such a thing no no mr bodkin is ever gentlemanlike ever soothing and composing in the pulpit but people you know who have been used to convulsions they really might not be able to leave them off all at once you may smile my dear minnie but i assure you that such things have been known to become quite chronic and once a thing gets to be chronic miss chubb left her sentence unfinished as she often did but remained with an expressive countenance which suggested horrible results from things getting to be chronic it seems an odd caprice of fate said minnie who had been pursuing her own reflections that no sooner do i make rhoda maxfield's acquaintance for the sole reason that she is a methodist than she and her family turn into orthodox church people people will say you converted here my dear i dare say they will as it isn't true now i wonder who did convert them if you care to know i think i can tell you that the real reason why maxfield left the wesleyans was a quarrel he had with their preacher my maid jane has a brother who belongs to the society and he gave her an account of the matter dear dear you don't say so of course the preacher is furious those kind of ranters are very violent sometimes i remember when i was quite a girl a man on a tub who used to scream and use the most dreadful language so much so that poor papa forbade our going within earshot of him no david powell is not furious i am told that he astonished some of the more bigoted of his flock by reminding them that they ought to have charity enough to believe that a man may worship acceptedly in any christian community did he really now that positively was very proper of the man and very right quite right indeed so that i think we may assume he is on the road to heaven methodist though he may be oh minnie does that shock you miss chubb well my dear yes it does rather my family has been connected with the church for generations and one doesn't like to hear dr bodkin's daughter talk of being sure that a dissenter is on the road to heaven minnie lay back on her sofa and looked at Miss Chubb complacently bending over her knitting. Gradually the look of amused scorn on Minnie's face softened into melancholy thoughtfulness. She wondered how David Powell would have met such an observation as Miss Chubb's. He had to deal with even narrower and more ignorant minds than hers. What methods did he take to touch them? To Minnie it all seemed very hopeless, so long as men and women continued to be such as those she saw around her, and yet this preacher did move them very powerfully, if she could but meet him face to face and have speech with him there was one person to whom she was strongly impelled to detail her perplexities and to express her fluctuating feelings and opinions on more momentous subjects than she had ever yet spoken with him upon but there were a hundred little counter impulses pulling against this strong one and holding it in check miss chubb's voice broke in upon her meditations by uttering loudly the name that was in minnie's mind my dear i think it's quite a case with mr diamond minnie's heart gave a great bound and the deep burning blush which was so rare and meant so much with her covered her from brow to chin miss chubb's eyes were fixed on her knitting when after a short pause she raised them to seek some response minnie was quite pale again she met miss chubb's gaze with bright steady eyes although more wide open than usual how do you mean a case she asked carelessly i mean my dear a case of falling or having fallen in love the white lids drooped a little over the beautiful eyes and a look partly of pleasure partly of fluttered surprise swept over minnie's face as the breeze sweeps over a cornfield touching it with shifting lights and shadows what nonsense she said in a little uncertain voice unlike her usual clear tones now my dear minnie i must beg to differ i might give up my judgments to you on a point of of miss chubb hesitated a long time here for she found it extremely difficult to think of any subject on which she didn't know best on a point of the dead languages for instance but on this point i maintain that i have a certain penetration and coup d'oeil and i say that it is a case with mr diamond and little rhoda 
at least on his side and of course she would be ready to jump out of her skin for joy only i don't think the idea has entered into her head as yet how should it in her station of course but as to him if i ever read a human countenance in my life he admires her oh over head and ears to see him staring at her from behind your sofa when she sits by mrs errington no no my dear depend upon it i am correct and i don't know but what it might do very well because although educated mr diamond is a man of no birth and the girl is pretty and will have all old max's savings so that really thus and more in the same disjointed fashion miss chubb minnie felt like one who was conscious of having swallowed a deadly but slow poison for the present there is no pain only a horrible watchful apprehension of the moment when the pain shall begin some faculties of her mind seemed curiously numb but the active part of it accepted the truth of what had been said unhesitatingly miss chubb paused at last breathless you look fagged minnie she said have i tired you mrs bodkin will scold me if i have no you have not tired me but i think i will go and be quiet in my own room tell mamma i don't want any lunch please ring for jane mrs bodkin came into the room in her quick noiseless way she had heard the bell minnie reiterated her wish to be wheeled into her own room and left quiet she spoke briefly and peremptorily and her desire was promptly complied with i never cross her or talk to her much when she is not feeling well whispered mrs bodkin to miss chubb thereby checking a lively stream of suggestions regrets and inquiries which the spinster was beginning to pour forth in her most girlish manner there my darling said her mother preparing to close the door of minnie's room softly if any of the saturday people come i shall say you are not well enough to see them to-day no cried minnie with sharp decisiveness i wish to come into the drawing-room by and by don't send them away it will be algy's last saturday i mean to come into the drawing-room chapter eleven volume one chapter twelve of a charming fellow this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope. Volume 1, Chapter 12. Minnie, during the hour's quiet solitude which was hers before the Saturday guests began to arrive, got her thoughts into some clear order, and began to look things in the face. She did not look far ahead, merely kept her attention fixed on that which the next few hours might hold for her. She pictured to herself what she would say, and even how she would look. Cost what it might, no trace of her real feeling should appear her heart might bleed but none should see the wound she could not yet tell herself how deep the hurt was she would not look at it would not probe it not yet that should be afterwards perhaps in the long dim hours of her sleepless night not yet she put on her panoply of pride and braced up her nerves to a pitch of strained excitement and then after all the effort seemed to have been wasted there was no fight to be fought no struggle to be made the social atmosphere among her visitors that sunday afternoon was as mildly relaxing as the breath of a misty woodland landscape in autumn and minnie felt her spartan mood melting beneath it whether it were due to the influence of dr bodkin's presence the doctor usually spent the saturday half-holiday in his study preparing the morrow's sermon or it may be occasionally reading the newspaper or even taking a nap or whether it were the shadow of algernon's approaching departure the fact was that the little company appeared depressed and attuned to melancholy Rhoda Maxfield was not there. She had privately told Algy that she could not bear to be present among his friends on that last Saturday. "'They will be saying good-bye to you, and—and and all that,' said the girl, with quivering lips. "'And I know I should burst out crying before them all.' Whereupon Algy had eagerly commended her prudent resolution to stay at home. No other of the accustomed frequenters of the Bodkins' drawing-room was absent. The doctor's was the only unusual presence in the little assembly— he stood in his favourite attitude on the hearth and surveyed the company as if they had been a class called up for examination mr diamond sat beside miss bodkin's sofa and was perhaps a thought more grave and silent than usual minnie lay with half-closed eyes on her sofa and felt almost ashamed of the proud resolutions she had been making it seemed very natural to be silently miserable no one appeared to expect her to be anything else if she had even begun to cry as miss chubb did when algernon went to the piano and sang auld lang syne it would have excited no wondering remark pathos was not algy's forte in general but circumstances gave a resistless effect to his song the tears ran down miss chubb's cheeks so copiously as to imperil the little gummed curls that adorned her face even the rev peter warlock who was a little jealous of algy's high place in miss bodkin's good graces 
exhibited considerable feeling on this occasion and joined in the chorus for old ang syne my friends with his deep bass voice which had a hollow tone like the sound of the wind in the belfry of st chad's here mrs errington's massive placidity became useful she broke the painful pause which ensued upon the last note of the song by asking dr bodkin in a sonorous voice if he happened to be acquainted with lord seeley's remarkably brilliant pamphlet on the dog tax no replied the doctor shaking his head slowly and emphatically as who should say that he challenged society to convict him of any such acquaintance it did not at all matter to mrs errington whether he had or had not read the pamphlet in question the existence of which indeed had only come to her own knowledge that morning by the chance inspection of an old newspaper that had been hunted out to wrap some of algy's belongings in what the good lady had at heart was the introduction of lord seeley's name in whose praise she forthwith began a flowing discourse this brought miss chubb figuratively speaking to her legs she always a little resented mrs errington's aristocratic pretensions and was accustomed to oppose to them the fashionable reminiscences of her sole london season which had been passed in an outwardly smoke-blackened and inwardly time-tarnished house in manchester square whereof the upper floors had been hired furnished for a term by the right reverend the bishop of plumbum and the bishop's lady had chaperoned miss chubb to such gaieties as seemed not objectionable to the episcopal mind as the rose scent of youth still clung to the dry and faded memories of that time miss chubb always recurred to them with pleasure having first carefully wiped away her tears by the method of pressing her handkerchief to her eyes and cheeks as one presses blotting-paper to wet ink so as not to disturb the curls miss chubb plunged with happy flexibility of mood into the midst of a rue at lady tubville's nor paused until she had minutely described five of the dresses worn on that occasion including her own and the bishopesses from shoe to head-dress mrs errington came in ponderously topville i don't know the name it isn't in debrett and the supper pursued miss chubb ignoring debrett such refinement together with such luxury it was a banquet for lucretius what what exclaimed the doctor with his sharp scholastic key he had been conversing in a low voice with mr warlock but the latin name caught his ear i am speaking of a supper dr bodkin at the house of a leader of tong i never shall forget it although i didn't eat much of it to be sure just a sip of champagne and a taste of of what do you call that delightful thing with the french name that they give at ball suppers vol vol what is it volavant suggested algy at a venture ah volavu yes you will excuse my correcting you algernon but that is the french pronunciation just one taste of volavu was all that i partook of but the elegance the plate the exotic bouquets and the absolute paraphernalia of wax lights it was a scene for a young romance to gloat on but what had lucretius to do with it persisted the doctor miss chubb looked up and shook her forefinger archly now dr bodkin i will not be catechized you can't give me an imposition you know and as to lucretius beyond the fact that he was a roman emperor who ate and drank a great deal i honestly own that i know very little about him this time the doctor was effectually silenced he stood with his eyes rolling from mr diamond to the curate and from the curate to algy as though mutely protesting against the utterance of such things under the very roof of the grammar school but he said not a syllable mr diamond had looked at minnie with an amused smile expecting to meet an answering glance of amusement at miss chubb's speech but the fringed eyelids hung heavily over the beautiful dark eyes which were wont to meet his own with such quick sympathy mr diamond felt a little shock of disappointment without giving himself much account of the matter he had come to consider miss bodkin and himself as the only two persons in the little coterie who had an intellectual point of view in common on many topics the circumstance that miss bodkin was a very beautiful and interesting woman certainly added a flattering charm to this communion of minds he had almost grown to look upon her attention and sympathy as peculiarly his own things to which he had a right and the unsmiling listless face which now met his gaze gave him the same blank feeling that we experience on finding a well-known window accustomed to present gay flowers to the passers-by all at once grown death-like with a down-drawn ghastly blind mr diamond looked at minnie again and was struck with the expression of suffering on her face he knew she disliked being condoled with about her health so he said gently i think errington's departure is depressing us all even miss bodkin looks dull minnie lifted her eyelids now and her wan look of suffering was rather enhanced by the view of those bright wistful eyes 
i think errington is an enviable fellow continued mr diamond so do i he's going away that's a hard saying for us who are to remain behind miss bodkin but i meant and i think you know that i meant he is enviable because he will be so much regretted i don't know that he will be so much regretted surely why one fair lady has even been shedding tears oh miss chubb yes but that proves very little the good soul is always overstocked with sentiment and will use any friend as a waste-pipe to get rid of her superfluous emotion well i should have made no doubt that you would be sorry miss bodkin sorry yes i am sorry that is to say i shall miss algernon he is so clever and bright and gay and different from all our whitford mortals but for himself i think one ought to be glad papa says and you say and i say myself that his journey to london on such slender encouragement is a wild goose chase but after all why not wild geese must be better to chase than tame ones not so easy to catch nor so well worth the catching though said mr diamond smiling i said nothing about catching the hunting is the sport if a good fat goose had been all that was wanted mr philthorpe of bristol offered him that and even i believe ready roasted but if i were a man i think i would rather hunt down my wild goose for myself you had better not let errington hear your theory about the pleasures of wild goose hunting because he is apt enough for the sport already not precisely but he would take advantage of your phrase to characterize any hunting which it suited him to undertake and thus give an air of impulse and romance to perhaps a very prosaic ambition very deliberately pursued i wonder why said minnie and then stopped suddenly yes you wonder why no i wonder no longer i think i understand miss bodkin is pleased to be oracular said mr diamond with a careless smile and then he moved away towards the piano where mrs bodkin was playing a quaint sonata of clementi and stood listening with a composed attentive face nevertheless he felt some curiosity about the scope of minnie's unfinished sentence the sentence if finished would have run thus i wonder why you are so hard on algernon but with the utterance of the first words an explanation of diamond's severe judgment darted into her mind might he not have some feeling of jealousy towards algernon miss chubb's words were lighting up many things probably the good little woman had never in her life before said anything of such illuminating power yes diamond must be jealous algernon had unrivalled opportunities of attracting pretty rhoda's attention nay had he not attracted it already minnie recalled little words little looks little blushes which seemed to point to the real nature of rhoda's feelings for algernon rhoda did not no she surely did not care for matthew diamond minnie had a momentary elation of heart as she thus assured herself and at the same time she felt an impulse of scorn for the girl who could disregard the love of such a man as though it were a valueless trifle but then did rhoda know did rhoda guess and then minnie suddenly checking her eager mental questioning in mid-career turned her fiery scorn against herself for her pitiful weakness as she lay there so graceful and outwardly tranquil whilst the studied passionless turns and phrases of old clementi trickled from the keys she had hot fits of raging wounded pride and cold shudders of deadly depression the numb listlessness which had shielded her at the beginning of the afternoon had disappeared during her short conversation with diamond she was sensitive now to a thousand stinging thoughts what a fool she had been what a poor blind fool she tried to remember all the details of the past days did others see what miss chubb had seen in diamond's face and had she minnie bodkin who prided herself on her keen observation her cleverness and her power of reading motives had she been the only one to miss this obvious fact she had been deluding herself with the thought that matthew diamond came and sat beside her couch and talked and smiled for her sake poor fool why did not his frequent visits date from the time when rhoda's visits had begun too it was all clear enough now so clear that the self-delusion which had blinded her seemed to have been little short of madness as if it were possible that a man should waste his love on me she thought bitterly at that moment she caught mr warlock's eyes mournfully fixed upon her his gaze irritated her unendurably am i so pitiable a spectacle she asked herself is my folly written on my face that that idiot stares at me in wonder and compassion minnie gave him one of her haughtiest and coldest glances and then turned away her head poor mr warlock it must be owned that there are strange cruel pangs unjustly inflicted and suffered in this world by the most civilized persons the little party broke up sooner than usual the dispirited tone with which it had begun continued to the end 
Algernon made his farewells to Miss Chubb, Mr. Warlock, Mr. Diamond, and Dr. Bodkin, but to Minnie he whispered, "'I will run in once more on Monday to say good-bye to your mother and to you, if I may.' The rest departed almost simultaneously. Matthew Diamond lingered an instant at the door of the drawing-room, to say to Mrs. Bodkin, "'I hope this is not to be the last of our pleasant Saturdays, although we are losing Addington.' It was an unusual sort of speech from the reserved, shy tutor, who carried his proud dread of being thought officious or intrusive, to such a point that Minnie was wont to say, laughingly, that Mr. Diamond's diffidence was haughtier than anyone else's disdain. Mrs. Bodkin smiled, well pleased. "'Oh, I hope not, indeed,' she said in her quick, low accents. "'Minnie, do you hear what Mr. Diamond is saying?' Minnie did not answer. She thought how happy this wish of his to keep up our pleasant Saturdays would have made her yesterday. End of chapter 12「Volume One, Chapter Thirteen of A Charming Fellow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope. Volume One, Chapter Thirteen. The manifestations of maternal vanity are apt to appear monotonous to the indifferent spectator, but in Mrs. Errington such manifestations were at least not open to that reproach. Beethoven himself never surpassed her in the power of producing variations on one simple theme and this surprising fertility of hers prevented her from being a mere commonplace bore. She never told a story twice alike. There was always an element of unexpectedness in her conversation, albeit the groundwork and foundation of it varied but little. In the overflowing gratification of her heart at Algernon's prospects, and under the excitement of his imminent departure, she would fain have bestowed some of her eloquence even on old Max, with whom her relations had been decidedly cool since the outbreak of rude temper on his part which has been recorded but old max continued to be surly and taciturn for a while he had been bitterly mortified by mrs errington's talk about the marriage her son would be able to make whenever it should please him to select a wife but then after that had come miss bodkin's frequent invitations to rhoda which had greatly mollified the old man and presently it appeared as if mrs errington had forgotten all about general indigo's daughters and the heiress of the eminent drysalter at all events she said no more on the subject of those ladies and old max gradually and not slowly recurred to his former persuasion that the erringtons would be very glad to secure rhoda's hand for algernon being well aware that her money would balance her birth and connections true the young man had as yet said nothing explicit but of course he would feel it necessary to have some settled prospect before asking permission to engage himself formally to rhoda he is connected with the great ones of the earth to be sure reflected mr maxfield with some exultation and he is a comely young chap to look upon and full of all kinds of book-learning and accomplishments talks foreign tongues and sings and plays upon instruments and draws pictures an uneasy thought crossed his mind at this point that david powell would consider these things as leading to reprehensible frivolity and worldliness and that moreover most of his maxfield's old friends would agree with the preacher in so deeming it was not to be expected that the thoughts and habits of a lifetime could be so eradicated from old max's mind by the mere fact of going to worship at st chad's as to leave his conscience absolutely free on these and similar points but the ultimate effect of such inward feelings was always to embitter the old man against powell and to make him clutch eagerly at any circumstance which should tend to prove that powell had been wrong and himself right in their differing views of the errington's intentions he was inexpressibly loath to consider himself mistaken indeed for him to be mistaken seemed to argue a general dislocation and turning topsy-turvy of things and a terrible unchaining of the powers of darkness if after walking all his life in the paths of wisdom and prosperity he were to find himself suddenly astray and blundering on a point which nearly concerned the only tender feelings of his nature such a phenomenon must clearly be due to the direct interposition of satan however as he stood one evening in his storehouse tying up a great parcel of sugar in blue paper jonathan maxfield was feeling neither discontented nor self-distrustful mrs errington had just been speaking to rhoda in his presence and had said well little one you have quite made a conquest of mrs bodkin as well as miss minnie she was praising you up to me the other day she particularly remarked your nice manners and attributed them to my influence 
"'I am sure, ma'am, if there's anything nice in my manners, it was you who taught it to me,' Rhoda had said simply, upon which Mrs. Errington had been very gracious, and without at all disclaiming the credit of Rhoda's nice manners, had mellifluously assured Mr. Maxfield that his little girl was wonderfully teachable, and had become a general favourite amongst her, Mrs. Errington's, friends. Now all this had seemed to Maxfield to be of good augury, and an additional testimony, if any such were needed, to his own sagacity and prudent behaviour. "'It'll come right, as I foresaw,' thought he triumphantly. "'Another man might have been over-hasty and spoiled matters like a fool, but not me.' Someone pushed the half-door between the shop and the storehouse, and set the bell jingling. Maxfield looked up and saw Algernon Errington, bright, smiling, and debonair, as usual. The ordinary expression of old Max's face was not winning, and now, as he looked up with his grey eyebrows drawn into a shaggy frown, and his jaws clenched so as to hold the end of a string which he had just drawn into a knot round the parcel of sugar, he presented a countenance ill-calculated to reassure a stranger or invite his confidence. But Algy was not a stranger, and did not intend to bestow any confidence, so he came forward with the graceful self-possession which sat so well on him, and said, "'How are you, Mr. Maxfield? I have not seen you for ever so long.' "'It doesn't seem very long ago to me since we spoke together,' returned old Max, tugging at the string of his parcel. "'You know I'm off to-morrow, Mr. Maxfield.' The old man shot a hard, keen glance at him from beneath the shaggy eyebrows, and nodded. "'I go by the early coach in the morning, so I must say all my farewells today. Maxfield gave a sound like a grunt and nodded again. "'It's a wonderful piece of luck. Lord Seely's taking me up so, isn't it?' "'Ah, if he means to do anything for you in earnest, so far as I can learn, his taking you up hasn't cost him much yet.' Algernon laughed frankly. "'Not a bit of it, Mr. Maxfield,' he cried. "'And, after all, why should he do anything that would cost him much for a poor devil like me? No, the beauty of it is that he can do great things for me which shall cost him nothing. He is hand and glove with the present ministry, and a regular bigwig at court, and all that sort of thing. The fact of my having good blood in my veins and being called Ancrum Errington is no merit of mine, of course. Just an accident. But it's a deuced lucky accident.' i dare say lord seely is a stupid old hunks but then he is lord seely you see i don't mind saying all this to you mr maxfield because you know the world and you and i are old friends it was certainly rather hard on lord seely to be spoken of as a stupid old hunks by this lively young gentleman who knew little more of him than of his great-grandfather deceased a century ago but his lordship did not hear the artless little speech so it did not annoy him whereas old maxfield did hear it and it gratified him considerably for several reasons it gratified him to be addressed confidentially as one who knew the world. It gratified him to be called an old friend by this relation of the great Lord Seely. And oddly enough, whilst he was mentally bowing down before the aristocratic magnificence of that nobleman, it gratified him to be told that the bowing down was being performed to a stupid old hunks, altogether devoid of that wisdom which had been so largely bestowed on himself, the Whitford grocer. Pleasant and unaffected as was the young fellow's manner to his landlord, there was a nonchalance about it which conveyed that he was quite aware of the social distance between them, and this assumption of superiority, never coarse or ponderous like his mother's, but worn with the airiest lightness, was far from displeasing to old Max. The more of a gentleman born and bred Algernon Errington showed himself to be, the higher would Rhoda's position be if, but old Max had almost discarded that form of presenting the future to his own mind, and was apt to say to himself, when rhoda marries young errington and then the solid advantages of the position were so far at least on old max's side wealth and wisdom made a powerful combination he reflected and he was not at all afraid of being borne down or overwhelmed by any amount of gentility nevertheless his spirit was in some subjection to this patrician youth who sat opposite to him on a tea-chest swinging his legs so affably there was a pause at length maxfield said and how long do you think of being away or are you going to say good-bye to Whitford for evermore? Indeed, I hope not. Oh, then there is some folks here as you would care to see again, said Max slowly, beginning to tie up another parcel with sedulous care and not raising his eyes from it. Of course there are. I should think you must know that, Mr. Maxfield. But I want to put myself in a better position with the world before I can, before I can, before I come back to the people I most care for. Very good, but it's like to be some time first, I'm afraid. "'As to seeing dear old Whitford again, you know I mean to run down here in the summer, or at least early in the autumn, when Parliament rises.' "'Oh, do you?' "'To be sure, and then I hope to settle several things.' "'Ah!' 
"'To a man of your experience, Mr. Maxfield, I needn't say how important it is for me to go to Lord Seely, ready and willing to undertake any employment he may offer me.' "'Ah! I mean, of course, that I should be absolutely free and unfettered, and ready to—to—to to, to avail myself of opportunities. You see that, of course?' Maxfield looked sage and nodded, but he also looked a little glum. The conversation had not taken the turn he expected." once let me get something definite a government post you know such as my cousin could get for me as easily as you could take an apprentice and then i may please myself i may consider myself on the first round of the ladder and then there won't be the same necessity for deferring to this person and that person but i don't know why i am saying all this to you mr maxfield you understand the whole matter better than i do by jove i wish i had some of your ballast in my noddle i'm such a feather-headed fellow you are young algernon you are young returned old Max, from whose brow the frown had cleared away entirely. "'I have had a special gift of wisdom vouchsafed to me for many years past. It has been, I believe, a peculiar grace, and it is the Lord's doing, thanks be. I am not easy deceived.' "'I shouldn't like to try it on, that's all I know,' exclaimed Algernon, pleasantly smiling and nodding his head. "'Albeit, there is some as mistrust my judgment, young and raw men without much gift of clear-headedness, and puffed up with spiritual pride.' oh there really said algernon feeling somewhat at a loss what to say yes there are i should like such to be convinced of error it will be a wholesome lesson not a doubt of it i should like to know such for their own soul's sake and to teach em christian humility as you and i quite understand each other my young friend and as is all clear between us Algernon had a constitutional dislike to clear understandings, except such as were limited to his clear understanding of other people. So he broke in at this point with one of his impulsive speeches about his prospects, and his conviction of Mr. Maxfield's wisdom, and his regrets at leaving Whitford, and his settled purpose to come back at the end of the summer, and have a look at the dear old place, and the one or two persons in it who were still dearer to him. And he contrived, contrived indeed is too cold-blooded and Machiavellian a word to express Algy's rapid mental process, to convey to old Max the idea that he was on the high road to fortune, that he had a warm and constant attachment to a certain person whom it was needless to name, seeing that the certain person could be no other than his playmate, pretty Rhoda, and that Mr. Jonathan Maxfield was so sagacious and keen-sighted a personage as to require no wordy explanations, such as might have been needful for feebler intelligences and then algy said with a rueful sort of candour and arching those fair childlike eyebrows of his i say mr maxfield i shall be awfully short of cash just at first the two hands of jonathan maxfield which had been laid open and palm downwards on the counter before him as he listened instinctively doubled themselves into fists he put them one on top of the other and rested his chin on them i don't bother my mother about it poor dear soul because i know she has done all she can already of course if i were to hint anything to my cousin to lord seely you know i might get help directly but i don't want to begin with that exactly hm it'd be a test of how much he really does mean though yes but you know what you said about lord seely's doing great things for me which shall cost him nothing and i felt how true your view was directly by george if i want any advice between now and next august i should be tempted to write and ask you for it maxfield gave a little rasping cough of course i know the manners and customs of high-bred people well enough a fellow who comes of an old family like mine seems to suck all that in with his mother's milk somehow but that's a mere surface knowledge after all and some circumstances might turn up in which i should want a more solid judgment to help my own maxfield coughed again a little less raspingly one of his doubled-up hands unclasped itself and he began to pass it across his stubbly chin by the by what an ass i was not to think of that before would you mind lending me twenty pounds till august mr maxfield i am not giving to lending algernon nor to borrowing either i thank the lord borrowing no but you are one of the lucky fellows of this world who can grant favours instead of asking them but it really is of small consequence after all i'll manage somehow if you have any objection i believe i have a nabob of a godfather general indigo as yellow as a guinea and as rich as a jew my mother was talking of him the other day and perhaps it would be better to ask such a little favour of one's own people i'll look up the nabob mr maxfield it must not be supposed that algy in bringing out the name of general indigo had any thought of the three lovely miss indigos in his mind he was quite unconscious of the existence of those young ladies if indeed they were not entirely the figments of mrs errington's fertile fancy Algy had laid no deep plans. He was simply quick at seizing opportunity. The opportunity had presented itself of dazzling old Max with his nabob godfather, and of perhaps inducing the stingy old fellow to lend him what he wanted. 
by dint of conveying that he did not want it particularly. Algy had availed himself of the opportunity, and the shot had told very effectually. Old Max never swore. Had he been one of the common and profane crowd of worldlings, it may be that some imprecation on General Indigo would have issued from his lips, for the mention of that name made him very angry. But old Max had a settled conviction of the probable consignment to perdition of the rich nabob, who was doubtless a purse-proud, tyrannous, godless old fellow, which far surpassed in its comforting power the ephemeral satisfaction of an oath. He struck his clenched hand on the counter, and said testily, "'You have not heard what I had it in my mind to say. You are too rash, young man, and broke in my discourse before it was finished. I beg pardon, did I?' i say that i am not given to lending nor to borrowing and it is most true but i have not said that i will refuse to assist you this is a special case and must be judged of specially as between you and me why of course i would rather be obliged to you than to the general who is a stranger to me in fact though he is my godfather there's nearer ties than godfathers algernon algernon burst into a peal of genuine laughter why yes he said wiping his eyes i hope so old max did not move a muscle of his face what was the sum you named he asked solemnly oh i don't know twenty or thirty pounds would do something just to keep me going until my mother's next quarter's money comes in i will lend you twenty pounds algernon for which you will write me an acknowledgment certainly being under age your receipt is valueless in law but i wish to have it as between you and me of course as between you and me maxfield unlocked a strong box let into the wall algernon who had often gazed at the outside of it rather wistfully peeped into it with some eagerness when it was opened but its contents were chiefly papers and a huge ledger there was however in one corner a well-stuffed black leather pocket-book from which old max slowly extracted a crisp fresh bank of england note for twenty pounds i am sure i am ever so much obliged to you mr maxfield said algernon taking the note he spoke without any over-eagerness but the gleam of boyish delight in his eyes would not be suppressed and now come into the parlour with me and write the acknowledgment i say mr maxfield said algernon when the receipt had been duly written and signed you won't say anything to my mother about this do you mean to keep it a secret asked the old man sharply oh of course i don't mind all the world knowing as far as i am concerned but the dear old lady might worry herself at not being able to do more for me let it be just simply as between you and me said algernon repeating maxfield's words but truth to say without attaching any very definite meaning to them the old man pursed up his mouth and nodded ay ay he said as between you and me algernon as between you and me upon my word that formula of old max's seems to be a kind of open sesame to purses and strong-boxes and cheque-books as between you and me i wonder if it would answer with lord seely who'd have thought of old max doing the handsome thing well it's all right enough i do mean to stick to little rhoda especially since her father seems to hint his approbation so very plainly but it wouldn't do to bind myself just now for her sake poor little pet as between you and me what a character the old fellow is i wish he'd made it fifty while he was about it such was algernon's mental soliloquy as he walked jauntily down the street with his hand in his pocket and the crisp banknote between his finger and thumb end of chapter thirteen volume one chapter fourteen of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume one chapter fourteen david powell sat in his garret chamber the fast waning light of a february afternoon fell on him as he sat close to the lattice in the sloping roof he had placed himself there to be able to read the small print of his pocket bible but the light was already too dim for that it was dusk in the garret the strip of grey cloud visible from the window was beginning to turn red at its lower edge as the sun sank it was the angry flaring red which is often seen at the close of a cold and cloudy day and had no suggestion of genial warmth in its deep flush such a snow-laden crimson-bordered rack of fleecy cloud as powell's eyes rested on might have hung over a lapland waste there was no fire in the room nor any means of making one it was bitterly cold the preacher's face looked white and bloodless as if it were frozen but he sat still staring out at the red sunset light on the strip of sky within his view from his seat on an old chest which he had drawn close under the window he could see nothing but the sky not one of the roofs or chimneys of whitford was visible to him a black wavering line moved slowly across his field of vision it was a flight of rooks on their way home to the tall leafless elm trees in pudcombe park 
nothing else moved except the red flare creeping upward by slow and imperceptible degrees suddenly the little bible fell from powell's numbed right hand on to the carpetless floor and with a start he turned his head and looked around him by contrast with the wintry light without the garret appeared quite dark to him and it was not until after a few seconds that his eye became sufficiently accustomed to its gloom to perceive the book lying almost at his feet he picked it up and began to chafe his numbed fingers rising at the same time and walking up and down the room his thoughts had been straying idly as he sat at the window with his eyes fixed on the sky they had gone back to the days of his boyhood and in memory he had seen the wild welsh valley where he was born and heard the bleat of sheep from the hills as he had listened to it many a summer morning sitting ragged and barefoot on the turf and with these recollections the image of rhoda maxfield was strangely mingled appearing and disappearing like a face in a dream indeed he had been dreaming open-eyed in his solitude unconscious of the cold and the gathering dusk now such aimless vagrant wanderings of the fancy were considered reprehensible by earnest methodists and by none were they more strongly disapproved of than by david powell himself his life was guided as nearly as might be in conformity with the rules laid down by john wesley himself for the helpers as his first lay preachers were called and among these rules diligence unflagging unfaltering diligence and the strenuous employment of every minute so that no fragment of time should be wasted were emphatically insisted upon powell had ceased to read when the daylight waned and remained in his place by the window intending to devote a few minutes of the twilight to the rigid self-examination which was his daily habit and instead behold his mind had strayed and wandered in idle recollections and unsanctified imaginings presently he began to mutter to himself as he paced up and down the chill bare room what have i to do with these things he said aloud when i should be about my master's business where is the comfortable assurance of old days the bright light which used to shine within my soul turning its darkness into noonday i have lost my first love i have fallen from grace and the enemy finds a ready entrance for any idle thoughts he wills to put into my mind and yet have i not striven have i not searched my own heart with sincerity all at once stopping short in his walk across the garret floor he threw himself on his knees beside the bed and burying his face in his hands began to pray aloud the sound of his own voice rising ever higher as his supplications grew more fervent hid from his ears the noise of a tap at the door which was repeated twice or thrice at length the person who had knocked pushed the door gently open a little way and called him by his name mr powell mr powell who calls me asked the preacher lifting his head but not rising at once from his knees it's me sir mrs thimbleby i have made you a cup of herb tea according to the directions in the primitive physic and there is a handful of fire in the kitchen grate whilst here it is downright freezing dear dear mr powell i can't think it right for you to set for hours up here by yourself in the cold the good widow a gentle loquacious woman with mild eyes and a humble manner had advanced into the room by this time and stood holding up a lighted candle in one hand whilst with the other she drew her scanty black shawl closer round her shoulders i will come mrs thimbleby answered powell do you go downstairs and i will follow you forthwith well it is a miracle of the lord if he don't catch his death of cold muttered the widow as she redescended the steep narrow staircase but there he is a select vessel if ever there was one and a burning and a shining light and i suppose the lord will take care of his own in his own way mrs thimbleby sat down by her own clean-swept hearth in which a small fire was burning brightly the little kitchen was wonderfully clean not a speck of rust marked the bright pewter and tin vessels that hung over the dresser not an atom of dust lay on any visible object in the place there was no sound to be heard save the ticking of the old eight-day clock and now and then the dropping of a coal on to the hearth as soon as she heard her lodger's step on the stairs mrs thimbleby bestirred herself to pour out the herb tea of which she had spoken i wish it was china tea mr powell she said when he entered the kitchen but you won't take that so i know it's no good to offer it to you else i have a cup here as is really good and came out of my new lodger's pot you do not surely take of what is not your own cried powell looking quickly round at her lord forbid sir no but the gentleman drinks a sight of tea and last evening he would have some fresh made and i say to him 
mrs thimbleby's narrative style was chiefly remarkable for its simplification of the english syntax by means of omitting all past tenses and thus getting rid of any difficulty attendant on the conjugation of irregular verbs i say won't you have none of that last as was made for breakfast as is beautiful tea and only wants warming up again but he refuse and then i ask him if i may use it myself seeing i look on it as a sin to waste anything and he only just look up from his book and nod his head and say do what you like with it ma'am and wave his hand as much as to say i may go he is not much of a one to talk but he paid the first week punctual and is as quiet as quiet and there he is i hear his key in the door a quick firm step came along the passage and matthew diamond appeared at the door of the kitchen will you be good enough to give me a light he said addressing the landlady then he saw david powell standing near the fire and looked at him curiously powell did not turn nor seem to observe the newcomer his head was bent down and the firelight partially illumined his profile which was presented to any one standing at the door mr diamond silently formed the word preacher with his lips at the same time nodding towards powell and raising his eyebrows interrogatively mrs thimbleby answered aloud with alacrity well pleased to begin a conversation with her taciturn lodger yes sir it is our preacher mr powell as is one of our shiningest lights and an awakening caller of sinners to repentance you've maybe heard him preach sir a many of the unconverted <coughs> a many as does not belong to the connection has come to hear him in whitford wesleyan chapel and on whit meadow and we have had seasons of abundant blessing and refreshment powell had turned round at the beginning of mrs thimbleby's speech and was looking earnestly at mr diamond the latter who had seen the preacher only in the full tide of his eloquence and the excitement of addressing a crowded audience was struck by the change in the face now before him it was much thinner haggard and deadly pale there were lines round the mouth which expressed anxiety and suffering and the eyes were sunk in their orbits and startlingly bright diamond was in fact startled out of his usual silent reserve by the glance which met his own and exclaimed impulsively i am afraid you are ill mr powell no returned the other at once and without hesitation i have no bodily ailment i have seen you at the house of jonathan maxfield have i not yes i have been in the habit of going there to read with a young gentleman my name is diamond matthew diamond i know it answered powell i should like if you are willing to say a few words to you privately diamond was a good deal surprised and a little displeased at this proposition he had been interested in the methodist preacher and the thought had more than once crossed his mind that he should like to see more of the man whose whole personality was so striking and uncommon but mr diamond had felt his wish just as he might have wished to have paganini with his violin all to himself for an evening or to learn viva voce from edmund keen how he produced his great effects to be the object and subject of a private sermon from this methodist enthusiast for diamond could conceive no other reason for the preacher's desiring an interview with him than zeal for converting was however a different matter and diamond had half a mind to decline the private communication he was a man peculiarly averse to outspokenness about his own feelings nor was he given to be frank and diffusive on topics of mere intellectual speculation although occasionally he could exchange thoughts on such matters with a congenial mind but he knew well enough that with the methodists in general an excited state of feeling which might do duty for conviction was the aim and end of their teaching and preaching this man is ignorant and enthusiastic and will make himself absurd and me uncomfortable and i shall have to offend him which i don't wish to do thought mr diamond standing stiff and grave with a candle in his hand but once more the sight of powell's haggard suffering face and bright wistful eyes touched him and once more the resolute matthew diamond suffered himself to be swayed by an impulse of sympathy with this man oh said he well you can come to my sitting-room the invitation was not very graciously given but powell did not seem to heed that at all mrs thimbleby stood in admiring astonishment as her two lodgers left the kitchen together the two young men so strangely contrasted in all outward circumstances entered the small parlour which served as dining-room sitting-room and study to matthew diamond and seated themselves at a table almost covered with books one corner of which had been cleared to admit of a little tea-tray being placed upon it will you share my tea mr powell asked diamond as he filled a cup with the strong brown liquid no i thank you for proffering it to me but i do not drink tea i am sorry for that for i am afraid i have no other refreshment to offer you i don't indulge in wine or spirits diamond threw into his manner a certain determined commonplaceness as though to quench any tendency to excitement or exaltation which might show itself in the preacher 
although he would have expressed it in different terms matthew diamond had at the bottom of his mind a feeling akin to that in miss chubb's when she had declared her dread of the maxfield family going into convulsions in the parish church of st chad i will take a cup of tea myself if you have no objection said diamond suiting the action to the word and stretching out his legs so as to bring them within reach of the warmth from the fire won't you draw nearer to the hearth mr powell powell sat looking fixedly into the fire with an abstracted air his hands were joined loosely and rested on his knees the firelight shone on his wan clearly cut face but seemed to be absorbed and quenched in the blackness of his hair which hung down in two straight thick locks behind his ears he did not accept mr diamond's invitation to draw nearer to the warm hearth but after a pause turned his face to his companion and said it is on behalf of the young maiden rhoda maxfield that i would speak with you sir he could scarcely have said anything more thoroughly unexpected and disconcerting to matthew diamond the latter did not start or stare or make any strong demonstration of surprise but he could not help a sudden flush mount into his face much to his annoyance about miss rhoda maxfield he returned coldly i do not understand what concern either you or i can have with any private conversation about that young lady my concern with rhoda is that of one who has had it laid upon him to lead a tender soul out of the darkness into the light and who suddenly finds himself divided from that precious charge even at the moment when he hoped the goal was reached her father has left our society and has thus carried rhoda away from the reach of my exhortations by jove thought diamond to himself as he turned his keen grey eyes on the preacher this is a specimen of spiritual conceit on a colossal scale then he said aloud you must console yourself with the hope that the exhortations she will hear in the parish church will differ from your own rather in manner than matter mr powell there really are some very decent people among the congregation of st chad's nay answered powell with simple gentleness do you think i doubt it it has been the boast of methodism that it receives into its bosom all denominations of christians without distinction the churchman and the dissenter the presbyterian and the independent are alike welcome to us and are free alike to follow their own method of worship in the words of john wesley himself one condition and one only is required a real desire to save their souls where this is it is enough they desire no more they lay stress upon nothing else they ask only is thy heart herein as my heart if it be give me thy hand methodism has changed somewhat since the days of john wesley said diamond dryly not methodism but perhaps methodists but it was not of methodism that i had it in my mind to speak to you now diamond controlled his face and his attitude to express civil indifference but his pulse was quickened and he hid his mouth with his hand powell went on i have turned the matter in my mind many ways and i have sought for guidance on it with much wrestling of the spirit but i had not received a clear leading until this evening when i saw you standing in the doorway it was borne in upon me that you could be an instrument of help in this matter and the leading was the more assured to me because that to-day having opened my bible after due supplication mine eyes fell at once on the words i have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear but now mine eyes seeth thee now these words were dark to me until just now when you seemed to appear as the explanation and interpretation thereof diamond could not but acknowledge to himself that all the scriptural phraseology and the technicalities of sectarianism which he found merely grotesque or disgusting in men of common vulgar natures came from this man's lips with as much ease and propriety as if he had been a hebrew of old time uttering his native idiom indeed the impression of there being something oriental about david powell which diamond had received on first seeing him was deepened on further acquaintance this black-haired welshman was picturesque and poetic despite his threadbare cloth suit made in the ungraceful mode of the day and impressive despite his equally threadbare phrases it is possible to make a wonderful difference in the effect both of clothes and words by putting something earnest and unaffected inside them what is the help you seek and how can i help you asked diamond with grave directness you are acquainted with the daughter of the principal of the grammar school here miss bodkin yes do you think that if you carried to her a request that i might be permitted to see and speak with her she would admit me i-i don't know answered diamond greatly taken aback there was a pause each man was busy with his own thoughts rhoda is beyond my reach now said powell at length i can neither see nor speak with her nor do i know of any of those who see her familiarly 
who would be likely to influence her for good except miss bodkin i am told that she is a lady of much ability and power of mind and i hear moreover of her doing many acts of charity and kindness you know her well do you not i know her yes would you consent to carry such a request from me diamond hesitated why not prefer the request yourself he said if you have any good reason for desiring an interview with miss bodkin i believe she would grant it i had thought of doing so i had thought even of writing all that i have to say but for many reasons i believe it would be more profitable for me to see her face to face i am no penman i am indeed as you perceive a man very ignorant in the world's learnings and the world's ways diamond suspected a covert boast under this humble speech and answered in his coolest tones the first is a disadvantage or an advantage as you choose to consider it which you share with a good many of your brethren mr powell as to the latter kind of ignorance methodists are generally thought to have worldly wisdom enough for their needs powell bent his head i would fain have more learning he said in a low voice but only as a means not as an end not as an end but said diamond in a constrained voice it seems to me hardly worth while to trouble miss bodkin by asking for an interview on any such grounds since you are charitable enough to believe that miss maxfield's spiritual welfare is not imperilled by going to st chad's i don't see what need there is for you to be uneasy about her i am uneasy but not for the reasons you suppose rhoda is very guileless and i would shield her from peril diamond looked at the preacher sternly i don't understand you he said and to say the truth mr powell i disapprove of meddling in other people's affairs miss maxfield is a young lady for whom i have the very highest respect for the first time a flame of quick anger flashed from powell's dark eyes as he answered your high respect would teach you to stand aside and let the innocent maiden pine under a delusion which might spoil her life and peril her soul mine prompts me to step forward and awaken her to the truth never heeding what figure i make in the matter the sudden passion in the man's face and figure was like a material illumination diamond had grown pale and looked at him attentively and in silence do you think proceeded powell his thin hands working nervously and his eyes blazing that i do not understand how pure a creature she is how innocent confiding and devoid of all suspicion of guile yea and even therefore the more in need of warning but because i am a man still young in years and neither the maiden's brother nor any kin to her i must stand silent and withhold my help lest the world should say i am transgressing its rules and bid me mind my own affairs or deride me for a fanatical fool do you think i do not foresee all this or do you think that foreseeing it i heed it i have broken harder bonds than that i have fought with strong impulses to which such motives are as cobwebs then with a sudden check and change of tone which a grain of affectation would have sufficed to render ludicrous but which in its simplicity was almost touching he added in a low voice i ask pardon for my vehemence i speak too much of myself i have had some suffering in this matter and i am not always able to control my words i have had strange visitings of the old adam of late it is only by much striving after grace and by strong wrestling in prayer that i have not wandered utterly from the right way he had risen from his chair at the beginning of his speech and now sank down again on it wearily with drooping head matthew diamond sat and looked at him still with the same earnest attention but blended now with a look of compassion he was thinking to himself what must be the force of enthusiastic faith which could so subdue the fiery nature of this man and how he must suffer in the conflict presently he said aloud i am ready to admit mr powell that you are actuated by conscientious motives i am sure that you are but your conscience cannot be a rule for all the rest of the world mine may counsel me differently you know oh sir we are neither of us left to our own guidance thanks be to god there is a sure counsellor that can never fail us i have searched diligently and i have received a clear leading which i cannot mistrust i do not feel free to tell you more particularly the grounds of my anxiety respecting rhoda maxfield but i do assure you with all sincerity and solemnity that i have her welfare wholly at heart and that i would not injure her by the least shadow of blame in the opinion of any human being there was silence for some minutes diamond leant his head on his hand and reflected then at length he said look here mr powell i believe if you had pitched on any one else in all whitford to speak to about miss rhoda maxfield i should have declined to assist you but miss bodkin is so superior in sense and goodness to most other folks here that i am sure whatever you may say to her confidentially will be sacred 
and then she may be able to set you right if you are wrong. She has the woman's tact and insight which we lack, and besides she is fond of Rhoda. He coloured a little as he said the name, and dropped his voice. "'You confirm all that I have heard of this lady. She is abundantly blessed with good gifts.' "'Well, then, Mr. Powell, I will write to Miss Bodkin to-morrow, telling her merely that you desire to speak with her, and entreat her good offices on behalf of one who needs them.' Powell sprang up from his seat eagerly. "'I thank you, sir, from a full heart,' he said. "'You are doing a good action. Farewell.' Diamond held out his hand, which the preacher grasped in his own. The two hands were as strongly contrasted as the owners of them. Diamond's was broad, muscular, and yet smooth, a strong young hand, full of latent power. Powell's was slender, nervous, showing the corded veins, and with long emaciated fingers. It, too, indicated force, but force of a different kind. The one hand might have driven a plough, or written out a mathematical problem. The other might have wielded a scimitar in the service of the prophet, or held up a crucifix in the midst of persecuting savages. As they stood for a second thus hand in hand, Powell's mouth broke into a wonderfully sweet and radiant smile, and he said, "'You see, sir, I was right to have faith in my counsellor. You have helped me.' Diamond sat musing late that night, and was roused by the cold to find his fire gone out and his watch, marking half-past twelve o'clock. "'I wonder,' he thought to himself, "'if Powell has any foundation for his hints, and if any scoundrel is playing false with her. If there be, I should like to shoot him like a dog.' End of chapter 14volume one chapter fifteen of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume one chapter fifteen minnie and her father had been having a discussion about david powell and the discussion had heated dr bodkin and spoiled his half-hour after dinner which was wont to be the pleasantest half-hour of his day for dr bodkin did not sit over his wine alone when there were no guests his wife and minnie remained at the black shining board in those days the tablecloth was removed for the dessert, and the polish of the mahogany beneath it was a matter of pride with notable housekeepers like Mrs. Bodkin, and his wife poured out his allowance of port, and peeled his walnuts for him, and his daughter chatted with him, and coaxed him, and sometimes contradicted him a little, and there would be no more school until to-morrow morning, and altogether the doctor was accustomed to enjoy himself. But on this occasion the poor gentleman was vexed and disturbed." it's a parcel of stuff and nonsense said the doctor jerking his legs under the table that remains to be proved papa if the man has anything of consequence to say i shall soon discover it anything of consequence to say fudge he is coming begging perhaps i don't believe that papa nor i think do you in your heart returned minnie with a little smile at one side of her mouth but the doctor was too much disturbed to smile why shouldn't he come begging it won't be his modesty that will stand in his way, I dare say. Or perhaps he wants to convert you, as these fellows are pleased to call it. Nobody seems to be afraid of our wanting to convert him, said Minnie. I don't like the sort of thing. I don't like that people should have it to say that my daughter is honoured with the confidences of a parcel of ranting, canting cobblers. But, papa, would it not, I am speaking in sober sincerity, and because I really do want your serious answer, don't you think it would be wrong to be deterred from helping any one with a kind word or a kind deed by the fear of people saying this or that helping a fiddlestick cried dr bodkin magisterially but incoherently minnie's face fell it had been paler than usual of late and she had been suffering and feeble she never lamented aloud nor was importunate nor even showed weakness of temper but her father who loved her very tenderly understood the chill look of disappointment well enough and it was more than he had strength to bear of course the man can come and say his say he added jerking his legs again impatiently under the sheltering mahogany especially as you say he is going away from whitford directly yes but there is no guarantee that he will not come back again i cannot promise you that on his behalf this unflinching straightforwardness of minnie's was a fertile source of trouble between her father and herself it was certainly rather hard on the doctor to be forced to surrender absolutely without any of those pleasant pretences which are equivalent to the honours of war Fortunately, we are limiting ourselves to the doctor's point of view. Fortunately, at this moment, his eye fell on Mrs. Bodkin, who, made exquisitely nervous by any collision between the two great forces that ruled her life, was pushing the decanter of port backwards and forwards on the slippery table, quite unconscious of that mechanical movement. "'Laura, what's the mischief are you about? Do you think I want my wine shaken up like a dose of physic?' 
this kind of diversion of the vials of the doctor's wrath on to his wife's devoted head was no uncommon finale to any altercation in which the reverend gentleman happened not to be getting altogether the best of it i think said mrs bodkin speaking very quickly and in a low tone as was her wont that very likely mr powell wants to interest minnie on behalf of richard gibbs and who pray if i may venture to inquire is richard gibbs asked the doctor in his most awful grammar school manner and with a sarcastic severity in his eye as he uttered the name gibbs and looked at mrs bodkin as though he expected her to be very much ashamed of herself brother of jane our maid he is a groom at pudcombe hall and a wesleyan mr powell may want to recommend him or get him a place what is the fellow going to leave pudcombe hall then not that i know of exactly but it struck me it, it might be about richard gibbs that he wanted to speak because gibbs is a wesleyan you know i suppose he wants to meddle and make himself of consequence in some way egotism and conceit rampant conceit are the mainsprings that move such fellows as this powell the doctor rose majestically from the table and walked towards the door there he paused and turning round said to his wife may i request laura that some one shall take care that i get a cup of hot tea sent to me in the study i don't think it is too much to request that my tea shall not be brought to me in a tepid state mrs bodkin had a great gift of holding her tongue on occasions she held it now and the doctor left the room with dignity that evening minnie wrote the following note my dear mr diamond i shall be able to see mr powell at one o'clock to-morrow should that hour not suit his convenience perhaps he will do me the favour to let me know yours very truly m bodkin it was the first time she had ever written to mr diamond the temptation to make her letter longer than was absolutely needful had been resisted but the consciousness that the temptation had existed and been overcome was present to minnie's mind and she curled her lip in self-scorn as she thought if i wrote him whole pages it would only bore him he would prefer one line written in rhoda's schoolgirl hand out of rhoda's schoolgirl head to the best wit i could give him i are to the best wit of a wittier woman than i then suddenly she tore the note she had just written across threw it into the fire and watched it blaze and smoulder into blackness i will ask you to write a line for me mamma she said when mrs bodkin re-entered the drawing-room after having sent in the doctor's cup of tea to the study to whom minnie to mr diamond please say that i will receive mr powell at one o'clock to-morrow if that suits him i dare say it is really about richard gibbs said mrs bodkin as she sealed her note it was not without a slight feeling of nervousness that minnie bodkin the next day heard jane's announcement mr powell is below miss mistress wishes to know if you would see him in your own room minnie gave orders that the preacher should be shown upstairs and jane ushered him in very respectfully dr bodkin's old man-servant took no pains to hide his disgust at the reception of such a guest and declared in the servants hall that the sight of one of them long-haired canting methodies fairly turned his stomach but jane remembering her brother richard's reformation was less militant in her orthodoxy and expressed the opinion that mr powell was a very good man for all his long hair a revolutionary sentiment which was naturally received with incredulity and contempt minnie looked up eagerly when the preacher entered the room and scanned him with a rapid glance as she asked him to be seated i am a poor feeble creature mr powell she said who cannot move about at my own will so you will forgive my bringing you up here will you not powell on his part looked at the young lady with a steady searching gaze minnie was accustomed to be looked at admiringly affectionately deferentially curiously pityingly which she liked least of all sometimes spitefully but she had never been looked at as david powell was looking at her now that is as if his spirit were scrutinizing her spirit altogether regardless of the form which housed it i thank you gratefully for letting me have speech of you he said and his voice as he said it charmed minnie's sensitive and fastidious ear do you know mr powell that for some time past i have had the wish to make your acquaintance but circumstances seem to make it unlikely that i ever should do so yes it was very unlikely humanly speaking but i have no doubt that our meeting has been brought about in direct answer to prayer minnie was at a loss what to say it was almost as startling to hear a man profess such a belief on a week-day and in a quiet matter-of-fact tone as it would have been to find madame malibran conducting all her conversation in recitative or to hear mr dockett begin his sentences with a whereas you wish to speak to me on behalf of some one mr diamond tells me said minnie after a slight hesitation yes you have been kind and gracious to a young girl beneath you in worldly station named rhoda maxfield rhoda is it of her you wish to speak cried minnie in great surprise she felt a strange sick pang of jealousy it was for rhoda's sake then that mr diamond had begged her to receive powell 
"'You are kindly disposed towards the maiden,' said Powell anxiously, for Minnie's change of countenance had not escaped him. For her life, Minnie could not cordially have said yes at that moment. "'I—Rhoda is a very good girl, I believe. What would you have me do for her?' I would have you dissuade her from resting her hopes, I speak now merely of earthly hopes and earthly prudence, in the attachment of one who is unstable, vain, and worldly-minded. What do you mean? I, I do not understand, stammered Minnie, with fast-beating heart. May I speak to you in full confidence? If you tell me I may do so, I shall trust you utterly. What is this matter to me? Why do you come to me about it? because i have been told by those whose words i believe that you are gifted with a clear and strong judgment as well as with all qualities that win love you are mistaken i am not gifted with the qualities that win love said minnie bitterly then she asked abruptly did mr diamond advise you to speak to me about rhoda nay it was i who had recourse to his intercession to get speech of you but he knows your errand in part he knows it but i was not free to say to him all that i would fain say to you Minnie's face had a hard-set look. "'Well,' she said, after a short silence, "'I cannot refuse to hear you, but I warn you that I do not believe I can do any good in the matter. "'That will be overruled as the Lord wills.' Then David Powell proceeded to set forth his fears and anxieties about Rhoda, more fully and clearly than he had done to Diamond. He declared his conviction that the girl was deceived by false hopes, and was fretting and pining because every now and then misgivings assailed her which she could not confess to any one and because that her conscience was uneasy the maiden is very guileless and tender-natured said powell softly don't you think you a little exaggerate her tenderness mr powell persons capable of strong feelings themselves are apt to attribute all sorts of sentiments to very wooden-hearted creatures he looked at her earnestly and shook his head rhoda always seems to me to be rather phlegmatic very gentle and pretty of course but do you know i should not be afraid of breaking her heart there was a hard tone in minnie's voice and a hard expression about her mouth which hurt and disappointed the preacher he had expected some warmth of sympathy some word of affection for rhoda you do not know her he said sadly and then mr powell algernon and errington you know i suppose that mr errington is a great friend of mine i will not willingly say aught to offend you nor to offend against christian courtesy but there are higher duties more solemn promptings that must not be resisted oh i am not offended but let me ask you what right have we to assume that mr errington has ever deceived rhoda or has ever thought of her otherwise than as a friend and playmate of his childhood i am convinced that he has led her to believe he means some day to marry her i cannot resist that conviction marry her why mr powell the thing is absurd on the face of it a boy of nineteen and in algernon's position why any person of common sense would understand that such an idea could not be looked at seriously powell made himself some silent reproaches for his want of faith this lady might not be soft and sweet but she had evidently the clear judgment which he sought for to help rhoda and yet he had been discouraged and had almost distrusted his leading because of a little coldness of manner he answered minnie eagerly it is true i well know that what you say is true but will you tell rhoda this will you plentifully declare to her the thing as it is rhoda has her father to advise her if she needs advice nay her father is no adviser for her in this matter he is an ignorant man he does not understand the ways of the world at least not of that world in which the errington's hold a place and he is prejudiced and stiff-necked there was a short silence then minnie said i do not see how i can interfere i should in fact be taking an unjustifiable liberty and mr errington is going away they will both forget all about this boy and girl nonsense if people have the wisdom to let it alone rhoda will not forget she will brood silently over her secret feelings and her thoughts will be diverted from higher things she will fall away into outer darkness oh think a word in season how good it is consider that you may save a perishing soul by speaking that word i have prayed that i might leave behind me in this place the assurance that this lamb should not be utterly lost out of the fold powell had risen to his feet in his excitement and walked away from minnie towards the window with his head bent and his hands clasping his forehead minnie felt something like repulsion and the sort of shame which an honest and proud nature feels at any suspicion of histrionism in one whom it has hitherto respected surely the man was exaggerating consciously exaggerating his feelings on this matter but then powell turned and came back towards her and she saw his face clearly in the full sunlight and instantly her suspicion vanished 
that face was wan and haggard with suffering and there was a strange brilliancy in the eyes almost like the brightness of latent tears the tears sprang sympathetically to her own eyes as she looked at him it was impossible to resist the pathos of that face there was a strange appealing expression in it as of a suffering of which the sufferer was only half conscious that went straight to minnie's heart mr powell i am so truly sorry to see you distressed i wish i really do wish that i could do anything for you for me oh not for me but stretch out your hands to this poor maiden and say words of counsel to her and of kindness as one woman may say them to another i have borne the burden of that young soul i have laid it upon me to wrestle strongly for her in prayer i have have been assailed with manifold troubles and temptations concerning her but i am clear now i speak with a single mind and as desiring for her higher welfare from the depths of my heart good heavens thought minnie what a tragic thing it is to see men pouring out all the treasures of their love on a thing like this girl for something in powell's face and voice had pierced her mind with a lightning swift conviction that he loved rhoda maxfield minnie would have died rather than utter such a speech aloud the ridicule which among sophisticated persons slinks on the heels of all strongly expressed emotion was too present to her mind and too disgusting to her pride for her to have risked the utterance of such a speech even to her mother but there in her mind the words were good heavens how tragic it is and she acknowledged to herself at the same time that powell's lack of sophistication and intensity of fervour raised him into a sphere wherein ridicule had no place i will do what i can mr powell said minnie after a pause looking with unspeakable pity at his thin pallid face but do not trust too much to my influence i do trust to it because it will be strengthened and supported by my prayers then when he had said farewell and was about to go away she was suddenly moved by a mixture of feelings and as it were almost against her will to say to him how good it would be for you to see rhoda as she is a shallow sweet poor little nature as incapable of appreciating your love as a wren or a ladybird i like rhoda and i am a poor shallow creature in many ways myself but i do recognize things higher than myself when i see them david powell's face grew crimson with a hot dark flush and for an instant he grasped the back of a chair near him like a man who reels in drunkenness then he said you are very keen to see the truth you have seen it rhoda is dear to me as no woman ever has been dear or will be again once i thought this love was a snare to me now unless in moments of temptation by the enemy i know that it is an instrument in god's hands it has given me strength to pray courage to ask you for your help but you suffer cried minnie looking at him with knit earnest brows why should you suffer for one who does not care for you it is not just who dare ask for justice i have received mercy abundant overflowing mercy and shall i not render mercy in my poor degree but in truth he added in a low voice and with a smile which minnie thought the most strangely sweet she had ever seen in truth i cannot claim that merit i can no more help desiring to do good to rhoda than i can help drawing my breath of others i may say it is my duty to assist this man to counsel that one to endure some hard treatment for the sake of this other in order that i may lead them to christ but with rhoda there is no sense of sacrifice i believe that the lord has appointed me to bring her to him if my feet be cut and bleeding by the way i cannot heed it would you be glad to see rhoda married to algernon errington if he were to become a religious earnest man such a man as your conscientious judgment must approve asked minnie and the minute the words had passed her lips she repented having said them they seemed so needlessly cruel such a ruthless probing of a tender quivering soul it was as if the devil had put the words into my mouth she said afterwards to herself but powell answered very quietly i have thought of that often but i ask myself such questions no longer i hold my father's hand even as a little child and whither that hand leads me i shall go safely it is not for me to tempt the wrath of the lord by vain surmises and putting a case yea though he slay me yet i will trust him you will come back to whitford will you not asked minnie if i may but i know not when that is not given to me to decide at present i feel my conscience in bonds of obedience to the society perhaps we may never meet again in this world minnie as she said the words was conscious of a strong fellow-feeling for this man so far removed from her in external circumstances 
"'May God bless you,' he said, almost in a whisper. Minnie held out her hand. As he took it lightly in his own for an instant, he pointed upward with the other hand, and then turned and went away in silence. When Dr. Bodkin said a word or two to Minnie that evening, as to her interview with the ranting, canting cobbler, she was very reticent and brief in her answers. But on her father shrugging his shoulders disparagingly, and observing, "'It is a good thing that this firebrand is taking his departure from Whitford. I have been hearing all sorts of things about him to-day. It seems the fellow even set the Methodists by the ears among themselves.' She exclaimed hotly, "'I do declare most solemnly that this man gives me a more vivid idea of a saint upon earth, a stumbling, striving, suffering saint, than anything I ever saw or read.'" End of chapter 15volume one chapter sixteen of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume one chapter sixteen arrived in london with an influential patron ready to receive him and twenty pounds in his pocket over and above the sum his mother had contrived to spare out of her quarter's income algernon errington considered himself to be a very lucky fellow he had good health good spirits good looks and a disposition to make the most of them, untrammelled by shyness or scruples. He did feel a little nervous as he drove, the day after his arrival in town, to Lord Seely's house, but by no means painfully so. He was undeniably anxious to make a good impression, but his experience so far led him to assume, almost with certainty, that he should succeed in doing so. The hackney coach stopped at the door of a grimy-looking mansion in Mayfair, but it was a stately mansion withal. In reply to Algernon's inquiry, whether Lord Seely was at home, a solemn servant said that his lordship was at home, but was usually engaged at that hour. "'Will you carry my card in to him?' said Algernon. "'Mr. Ancrum Errington.' Algy felt that he had made a false move in coming without any previous announcement, and in dismissing his cab, when he was shown into a little closet off the hall, lined with dingy books, and containing only two hard horsehair chairs, to await the servant's return." There was something a little flat and ignominious in this his first appearance in the Seely house, waiting like a dun or an errand boy, with the possibility of having to walk out again, without having been admitted to the light of my lord's countenance. However, within a reasonable time, the solemn footman returned and asked him to walk upstairs, as my lady would receive him, although my lord was for the present engaged. Algernon followed the man up a softly carpeted staircase, and through one or two handsome drawing-rooms a little dim from the narrowness of the street and the heaviness of the curtains, into a small cosy boudoir. There was a good fire on the hearth, and in an easy chair on one side of it sat a fat lady, with a fat lapdog on her knees. The lady, as soon as she saw Algernon, waved a jewelled hand to keep him off, and said in a mellow, pleasant voice, which reminded him of his mother's, "'How do you do? Don't shake hands, nor come too near, because Fido don't like it, and he bites strangers if he sees them touch me. Sit down.' Algernon had made a very agile backward movement on the announcement of Fido's infirmity of temper, but he bowed, smiled, and seated himself at a respectful distance opposite to my lady. Lady Seely's appearance certainly justified Mrs. Errington's frequent assertion that there was a strong family likeness throughout all branches of the Ancrum stock, for she bore a considerable resemblance to Mrs. Errington herself, and a still stronger resemblance to a miniature of Mrs. Errington's grandfather, which Algy had often seen. My lady was some ten years older than Mrs. Errington. She wore a blonde wig and was rouged, but her wig and her rouge belonged to the candid and ingenuous species of embellishment. Each proclaimed aloud, as it were, I am a wig, I am paint, with scarcely an attempt at deception. So you've come to town, said my lady, fumbling for her eyeglass with one hand, while with the other she patted and soothed the growling Fido. Having found the eyeglass, she looked steadily through it at Algernon, who bore the scrutiny with a good-humoured smile and a little blush which became him very well you're very nice-looking indeed said my lady algy could not find a suitable reply to this speech so he only smiled still more and made a half-jesting little bow let me see pursued lady seely still holding her glass to her eyes what is our exact relationship you are a relation of mine you know i am glad to say i have that honour 
i don't suppose you know much of the family genealogy said my lady who prided herself on her own accurate knowledge of such matters my grandfather and your mother's grandfather were brothers your mother's grandfather was the elder brother he had a very pretty estate in warwickshire and squandered it all in less than twelve years i don't suppose your mother's father had a penny to bless himself with when he came of age i dare say not ma'am my grandfather did better he went to india when he was seventeen and came back when he was seventy with a pot of money Oh, my father hadn't been the youngest of five brothers i should have been a rich woman your ladyship's grandfather was colonel cloudsley ancrum who distinguished himself at the siege of calaca said algernon lady seely nodded approvingly ah your mother has taught you that has she she said and what was your father wasn't he an apothecary algernon's face showed no trace of annoyance except a little increase of colour in his blooming young cheeks as he answered the fact is lady seely that my poor father was an enthusiast about science he would study medicine instead of going into the church and availing himself of the family interest the consequence was that he died a poor m d instead of a rich d d or even who knows a bishop la said my lady shortly then after a minute's pause she added then i suppose you are not very rich hey i am as poor ma'am as my grandfather montague ancrum of whom your ladyship was saying just now that he had not a penny to bless himself with when he came of age returned algernon laughing well you seem to take it very easy said my lady and once more she looked at him through her eyeglass and what made you come to town all the way from what do you call it have you got anything to do nothing definite exactly said algernon hm quiet fido i ventured to hope that lord seely perhaps that my lord might oh dear you mustn't run away with that idea exclaimed her ladyship there ain't the least chance of my lord being able to do anything for you he's torn to pieces by people wanting places and all sorts of things i was about to say that i ventured to hope that my lord would kindly give me some advice said algernon as he said it his heart was like lead he had not of course expected to be at once made secretary of state or even to pop immediately into a clerkship at the foreign office he had put the matter very soberly and moderately before his own mind as he thought he had told himself that a word of encouragement from his high and mighty cousin should be thankfully received and that he would neither be pushing nor impatient excepting a very small beginning cheerfully but it had never occurred to him to prepare himself for an absolute flat refusal of all assistance my lady's tone was one of complete decision and it was in vain he reflected that my lady might be speaking more harshly and decisively than she had any warrant for doing being led to that course by the necessity of protecting herself and her husband against importunity none the less was his heart very heavy within him and he really deserved some credit for gallantry in bearing up against the blow advice said my lady echoing his word oh well that ain't so difficult what are you fit for perhaps i am scarcely the best judge of that am i returned algernon with that childlike raising of the eyebrows which gave so winning an expression to his face perhaps not but what do you think well i-i believe i could fill the post of secretary or what i should like he went on in a sudden burst of candour and looking deprecatingly at lady seely like a child asking for sugar-plums would be to get attached to one of our foreign legations i dare say but that's easier said than done and as to being a secretary it's precious hard work i can tell you if you're paid for it and of course no post would suit you that didn't pay i shouldn't mind hard work you wouldn't be much of an ancrum if you liked it i can tell you i know that much well and how long do you mean to stay in town that is quite uncertain you must come and see me again before you go and be introduced to lord seely oh indeed i hope so come and see her again before he went what would his mother say what would his whitford friends say if they could hear that speech nevertheless he answered very cheerfully oh indeed i hope so and interpreting my lady's words as a dismissal rose to go you're really uncommonly nice-looking said lady seely observing his straight slight figure and his neatly shod foot as he stood before her oh you needn't look shamefaced about it it's no merit of yours but it's a great thing let me tell you for a young fellow without a penny to have an agreeable appearance how old are you Twenty, said algernon anticipating his birthday by two months do you know i think fido will like you said my lady who observed the fact that her favourite had neither barked nor growled when algernon rose from his chair i am sure i hope he will he is so unpleasant when he takes a dislike to people algernon thought so too but he merely said oh we shall be great friends i dare say i always get on with dogs ah but fido is peculiar you can't coax him and he gets so much to eat that you can't bribe him if he likes you he likes you voilà tout by the way do you understand french 
yes pretty fairly i like it do you but as to your accent i am afraid that cannot be too much to boast of english provincial french is always so very dreadful well i don't know said algernon with perfect good humour for he believed himself to be on safe ground here but the old duc de vigagnon an emigre who was my master used to say that i did not pronounce the words of my little french songs so badly bless the boy can you sing french songs do sit down then at the piano and let me hear one never mind fido her ladyship had set her favourite on the floor and he was sniffing at algernon's legs he don't dislike music except a brass band sit down now algernon obeyed seated himself at the pianoforte and began to run his fingers over the keys he found the instrument a good deal out of tune but began after a minute's pause or forgotten chansonnette from le petit chaperon rouge he sang with taste and spirit though little voice and his french accent proved to be so surprisingly good as to elicit unqualified approbation from lady seeley why i declare that's charming she cried clapping her hands how on earth did you pick up all that in what's its name do look here my lord here's young ancram come up from that place in the west of england and he can play the piano and sing french songs delightfully algernon jumped up in a little flurry and turning round found himself face to face with his magnificent relative lord seeley now it must be owned that magnificent was not quite the epithet that could justly be applied to lord seeley's personal appearance he was a small delicately made man with a small delicately featured face and sharp restless dark eyes his grey hair stood up in two tufts one above each ear and the top of his head was bald shining and yellowish like old ivory eh said he oh mr uh, how do you do then he shook hands with algernon and courteously motioning him to resume his seat threw himself into a chair by the hearth opposite to his wife he stretched out his short legs to their utmost possible length before him and leant his head back wearily tired my lord asked his wife why yes a little dictating letters is a fatiguing business mr ah uh, ah uh, errington my lord ancram errington oh to be sure i'm very glad to see you very glad indeed yes yes mr errington you are a cousin of my lady's of course very glad and lord seely got up and shook hands once more with algernon whose identity he had evidently only just recognized but although tardy the peer's greeting was more than civil it was kind and algernon's gratitude was in direct proportion to the chill disappointment he had felt at lady seely's discouraging words thank you sir he said pressing the small thin white hand that was proffered to him and algy's way of saying thank you sir was admirable and would have made the fortune of a young actor on the stage for in saying it he had sufficient real emotion to make the simulated emotion quite touching as an actor should have my lord sat down again wearily bush has been with me again about that emigration scheme of his he said to his wife upon my honour i don't know a more trying person than bush when he had thus spoken he cast his eyes once more upon algernon who said in the most artless impulsive way in the world it's a poor spirited kind of thing no doubt but really when one sees what a hard time of its statesmen have one can't help feeling sometimes that it is pleasant to be nobody now the word statesman applied to lord seeley was scarcely more correct than the word magnificent applied to his outer man the fact was that Lord Seeley had been, from his youth upward, ambitious of political distinction, and had indeed filled a subordinate post in the cabinet some twenty years previous to the day on which Algernon first made his acquaintance. But he had been a mere cipher there, and the worst of it was that he had been conscious of being a cipher. He had not strength of character or ability to dominate other men, and he had too much intelligence to flatter himself that he succeeded, where success had eluded his pursuit stupider men had done better for themselves in the world than valentine sackville strong lord seeley and had gained more solid slices of success than he perhaps there is nothing more detrimental to the achievement of ascendancy over others than that intermittent kind of intellect which is easily blown into a flame by vanity but is as easily cooled down again by the chilly suggestions of common sense the vanity which should be able to maintain itself always at white heat would be a triumphant thing the common sense which never flared up to an enthusiastic temperature would be a safe thing but the alternation of the two was felt to be uncomfortable and disconcerting by all who had much to do with lord seeley he continued however to keep up a semblance of political life he had many personal friends in the present ministry and there were one or two men who were rather specially hostile to him among the opposition of which latter he was very proud liking to speak of his enemies in the house he spoke pretty frequently from his place among the peers but nobody paid him any particular attention and he wrote and printed at his own expense a considerable number of political pamphlets but nobody read them that however may have been due to the combination against his lordship which existed among the writers for the public press 
who never, he complained, reported his speeches in extenso, and with few exceptions, ignored his pamphlets altogether. Howbeit, the word statesman struck pleasantly upon the little nobleman's ear, and he bestowed a more attentive glance on Algernon than he had hitherto honoured him with, and asked, in his abrupt tones, like a series of muffled barks, "'Going to be long in town, Mr. Ancrum?' "'I've just been asking him,' interposed my lady. "'He don't know for certain, but—' "'And here she whispered in her husband's ear. "'Oh, I hope so,' said the latter aloud. "'My lady and I hope that you will do us the favour to dine with us to-morrow, eh? "'Oh, I beg your pardon, Belinda. I thought you said to-morrow. "'On Thursday next. We shall probably be alone, but I hope you will not mind that.' "'I shall take it as a great favour, my lord,' said Algernon, "'whose spirits had been steadily rising ever since the successful performance of his French song.' "'You know Mr. Ancrum, I mean Mr. Errington, is a cousin of mine, my lord, so he won't expect to be treated with ceremony.' Algernon felt as if he could have flown downstairs when, after this most gracious speech, he took leave of his august relatives. But he walked very soberly instead down the staircase and past the solemn servants in the hall, with as much nonchalance as if he had been accustomed to the service of the powdered lackeys from his babyhood. "'He seems an intelligent, gentlemanlike young fellow,' said my lord to my lady." oh he's sharp as a weasel and uncommonly nice-looking and he sings french songs ever so much better than that theatre man that the duchess made such a fuss about he has the trick of drawing the long bow which all the warwickshire ancrums were famous for oh there's no doubt about his belonging to the real breed he told me a cock-and-bull story about his father's devotion to science i believe his father was a little apothecary in birmingham but i don't know that that much matters said my lady to my lord End of chapter sixteen Volume One, Chapter Seventeen of A Charming Fellow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope. Volume One, Chapter Seventeen. Algernon was elated by the success of his song and by Lady Seely's full acknowledgment of his cousinship, and he left the mansion in Mayfair in very good spirits, as has been said. But when he got back to his inn, a private hotel in a dingy street behind Oxford Street, he began to feel a recurrence of the disappointment which had oppressed him, when Lady Seely had declared so emphatically that my lord could do nothing for him in the way of getting him a place. What was to be done? It was all very well for his mother to say that, with his talents and appearance, he must and would make his way to a high position. But just and reasonable as it would be that his talents and appearance should give him success, he began to fear that they might not altogether avail to do so. He thought of Mr. Philthorpe, that substance which Mr. Diamond had said they were deserting for the shadow of Seely, and of the thousands of pounds which the Bristol merchant possessed. Truly a stool in a counting-house was not the post which Algernon coveted, and he candidly told himself that he should not be able to fill it effectively, but still there would have been at least as good a chance of fascinating Mr. Philthorpe as of fascinating Lord Seely, and the looked-for result of the fascination in either case was to be absolution from the necessity of doing any disagreeable work whatever and moreover mr philthorpe at all events would have supplied board and lodging and a small salary whilst he was undergoing the progress of being fascinated algernon looked thoughtful and anxious for a full quarter of an hour as he pondered these things but then he fell into a fit of laughter at the recollection of lady seely and fido there is something very absurd about that old woman said he to himself she is so impudent and why wear a wig at all if a wig is to be such a one as hers a turban or a skull-cap would do just as well to cover her head with but then they wouldn't be half so funny fido is something like his mistress nearly as fat with the same style of profile then he set himself to draw a caricature representing fido attired after the fashion of lady seely and became quite cheerful and buoyant over it in the interval between the day of his visit to the Seelys and the Thursday on which he was to dine with them, Algernon made one or two calls, and delivered a couple of letters of introduction, with which his Whitford friends had furnished him. One was from Dr. Bodkin, to an old-fashioned solicitor, who was reputed to be rich, but who lived in a very quiet way, in a very quiet square, and gave very quiet little dinners to a select few who could appreciate a really fine glass of port. The other letter was to a sister of young Mr. Pawkins, of Pudcombe Hall, married to the chief clerk of the Admiralty, who lived in a fashionable neighbourhood, and gave parties as fashionable as her visiting list permitted, and by no means desired any special connoisseurship in wine on the part of her guests. On the occasion of his first calls, Algernon found neither Mr. Ledbetter, the solicitor, nor Mrs. Matchin Stubbs, that was the name of young Pawkins' sister, at home, so he left his letters and cards, and wandered about the streets in a rather forlorn way 
for although it was his first visit to london it was not possible for him to get much enjoyment out of the metropolis all alone to him every place even london appeared in the light of a stage or background whereon that supremely interesting personage himself might figure to more or less advantage now london is a big theatre and although a big theatre full of spectators may be very exhilarating to the object of public attention who performs in it a big theatre practically barren of spectators for of course the only real spectators are the spectators who look at us is apt to oppress the mind with a sense of desertion so he was very glad when thursday evening came and he found himself once more within the hall door of lord seely's house my lord was in the drawing-room alone standing on the hearth-rug he shook hands very kindly with algernon and bade him come near to the fire and warm himself for the evening was cold and what have you been doing with yourself mr errington asked lord seely i have been chiefly employed to-day in losing myself and asking my way answered algernon laughing and then he began an account of his adventures and absolutely surprised himself by the amount of fun and sparkle he contrived to elicit from the narration of circumstances which had been in fact dull and commonplace enough my lord was greatly amused and once even laughed out loud at algernon's imitation of an irish apple-woman who had misdirected him with the best intentions and much calling down of blessings on his handsome face in return for a silver sixpence capital said my lord nodding his head up and down the sixpence was badly invested though observed algernon for she sent me about three miles out of my way ah but the blarney you forgot the blessing and the blarney surely they were worth the money eh no my lord not to me i can't afford expensive luxuries lady seely when she entered the room gorgeous in pea-green satin which singularly set off the somewhat pronounced tone of her rouge found algy and my lord laughing together very merrily and as she gave her hand to her young relative demanded to be informed what the joke was now it has been said that algernon was possessed of wonderfully rapid powers of perception and by sundry signs so slight that they would have entirely escaped most observers this clever young gentleman perceived that my lady was not altogether delighted at finding her husband and himself on such easy and pleasant terms together in fact my lady with all her blunt careless jollity of manner and pleasant mellow voice was apt to be both jealous and suspicious she was jealous of her ascendancy over lord seely who was said by the ill-natured to be completely under his wife's thumb and she was suspicious of most strangers especially of strangers who might be expected to want anything of his lordship and she usually assumed that such persons would endeavour to come over that nobleman when he was apart from his wife's protecting influence she had a general theory that men might be humbugged into anything and a particular experience that lord seely despite his stiff carriage and abrupt manner was in truth far softer natured than she was herself that young scamp has been coming over valentine with his jokes and his flummery said my lady to herself he's an ancrum every inch of him at that very moment algernon was mentally declaring that the conquest of my lady would after all be a more difficult matter than that of my lord but that by some means or other the conquest must be made if any good was to come to him from the seely connection and a stream of easy chat flowed over these underlying intentions and hid them except that here and there perhaps a bubble or an eddy told of rough places out of sight after some ten minutes of desultory talk my lady was obliged to own to herself that the young scamp had wonderfully good manner without a trace of servility he was respectful conveying with perfect tact exactly the sort of homage that was graceful and becoming from a youth like himself to persons of the seely's age and position neither did he commit the error of becoming familiar in response to lady seely's tone of familiarity a pitfall which had before now entrapped the unwary for my lady whom nature had created vulgar having possibly in the hurry of business mistaken one kind of clay for another and put some low person's mind into the fine porcelain of an undoubted ancrum was fond of asserting her position in the world by a rough unceremoniousness in the first place and a very wide-eyed arrogance in the second place if such unceremoniousness chanced to be reciprocated by unauthorized persons do we wait for any one belinda asked lord seely the dormers are coming they are such great musicians you know and i want lady harriet to hear this voice sing and then there may be jack price very likely very likely said my lord raising his eyebrows and stiffening his back doesn't mr price do us the honour of saying positively whether he will come or not oh you know what jack price is he says he'll come and nine times out of ten he don't come and then the tenth time he comes and people have to put up with him my lord cleared his throat significantly as who should say that he at all events did not feel inclined to put up with this system of tithes in the fulfilment of mr jack price's promises 
if he comes said lady seely addressing algernon you'll have to walk into dinner by yourself i've only got one young lady and if jack comes he must have her where is castalia asked my lord oh i suppose she's dressing castalia is always the slowest creature at her toilet i ever knew algernon had read up the family genealogy in the peerage under his mother's instructions sufficiently to be aware that lady and lord seely were childless having lost their only son in a boating accident years ago castalia then could not be a daughter of the house who was she a young lady who was evidently at present living with the seelys whom they called by her christian name and who was habitually a long time at her toilet algernon felt a little agreeable excitement and curiosity on the subject of the tardy castalia the door was thrown open here she comes thought algernon settling his cravat as he threw a quick side glance at a mirror general and lady harriet dormer announced the servant there entered a tall elegant woman leaning on the arm of a short stout benevolent-looking man in spectacles to these personages algernon was duly presented being introduced much to his gratification by lady seely as a young cousin of mine mr ancram errington who has just come to town then having made his bow to general dormer who smiled and shook hands with him algernon stood opposite to the graceful lady harriet and was talked to very kindly and pleasantly and felt extremely content with himself and his surroundings nevertheless he watched with some impatience for the appearance of castalia and forgot his usual self-possession so far as to turn his head and break off in the middle of a sentence he was uttering to lady harriet when he heard the door open again but once more he was disappointed for this time dinner was announced and lord seely offered his arm to lady harriet and led the way out of the room no jack said lady seely as she passed out before algernon and no castalia said my lord over his shoulder in a tone of vexation algernon followed his seniors alone but just as he got on to the staircase there appeared a lady leisurely descending from an upper floor at whom lord seely looked up reproachfully late late castalia said he and shook his head solemnly no no uncle valentine just in time replied the lady castalia take ancram's arm and do let us get to dinner before the soup is cold said lady seely give your arm to miss kilfinane and come along and her ladyship's pea-green satin swept downstairs after lady harriet's sober purple draperies algernon bowed and offered his arm to the lady beside him she placed her hand on it almost without looking at him and they entered the dining-room without having exchanged a word the dining-room was better lighted than the staircase and algernon took an early opportunity of looking at his companion she was not very young being in fact nearly thirty but looking older neither was she handsome she was very thin sallow and sickly-looking with a small round face not wrinkled but crumpled as it were into queer fretful lines her eyes were bright and well-shaped but deeply sunken and she had a great deal of thick pale brown hair worn in huge bows and festoons upon the top of her head according to the extreme of the mode of that day her dress displayed more than it was judicious to display in an aesthetic point of view of very lean shoulders and was of a bright soft pink hue that would have been trying to the most blooming complexion altogether the hon castalia kilfinane's appearance was disappointing and her manner was not so attractive as to make up for lack of beauty her face expressed a mixture of querulousness and hauteur and she spoke in a languid drawl with strange peevish inflections you and i ought to be some sort of relations to each other oughtn't we said algernon having taken in all the above particulars in a series of rapid observations why returned the lady without raising her eyes from her soup-plate because you are lady seely's niece and i am her cousin who says that i am lady seely's niece i thought stammered algernon i fancied you called lord seely uncle valentine even his equanimity and a certain glow of complacency he felt at finding himself where he was were a little disturbed by miss castalia's freezing manner i am lord seely's niece returned she then after a little pause having finished her soup she leaned back in her chair and stared at algernon who pretended not quite successfully to be unconscious of her scrutiny apparently the result of it was favourable to algernon for the lady's manner thawed perceptibly and she began to talk to him she had evidently heard of him from lady seely and understood the exact degree of his relationship to that great lady did you ever meet the dormers before asked miss kilfinane never how should i you know i am the merest country mouse i never was in london in my life until last friday oh but the dormers don't live in town indeed they are here very seldom you may have met them they are places in the west of england algernon after a rapid balancing of pros and cons resolved to be absolutely candid with his brightest smile and most arched eyebrows he began to give miss kilfinane an almost unvarnished description of his life at whitford 
almost unvarnished but it is no more easy to tell the simple truth only occasionally than it is to stand quite upright only occasionally mind and muscles will fall back to their habitual posture so that it may be doubted whether miss kilfinane received an accurate notion of the precise degree of poverty and obscurity in which the young man who was speaking to her had hitherto lived and so said she you have come to london to to seek my fortune said algernon merrily it is the proper and correct beginning to a story and i think i have had a piece of good luck at the very outset by way of a good omen miss kilfinane opened her eyes interrogatively but said nothing i think it was a piece of luck for me continued algernon emboldened by having secured the scornful lady's attention and perhaps a little also by the wine he had drunk a great piece of good luck that mr jack price whoever he may be did not turn up this evening why because if he had i should not have been allowed the honour of bringing you in to dinner oh yes i should have had to go in with jack i suppose answered the lady with a little smile please miss kilfinane who is jack price i do so want to know jack price is lord mullingar's son but what is he and why do people want to have him so much that they put up with his disappointing them nine times out of ten as to what he is well he was in the guards and he gave that up then they got him a place somewhere in africa or south america or somewhere and he gave that up then he got the notion that he would be a farmer in canada and went out with an axe to cut down the trees and a plough to plough the ground afterwards and he gave that up now he does nothing particular and has he found his vocation at last i don't know i'm sure said miss kilfinane languidly her power of perceiving a joke was very limited thanks now i know all about mr price except except why everybody wants to invite him that i really cannot tell you then you don't share the general enthusiasm about him i don't know that there is any general enthusiasm only of course don't you know how it is people have got in the way of putting up with him and letting him do as he likes he's a very fortunate young man i should say young man miss kilfinane laughed a hard little laugh why jack price is ever so old ever so old is he echoed algernon genuinely surprised he must be turned forty said the fair castalia rising in obedience to a look from lady seely and if she had been but fifteen herself she could not have said it with a more infantine air after the ladies had withdrawn algernon had to sit for about twenty minutes in the shade as it were silent and listening with modesty and discretion to the conversation of his seniors had they talked politics algernon would have been able to throw in a word or two but lord seely and his guests talked not of principles or party but of persons the persons talked of were such as lord seely conceived to be useful or hostile to his party and he discussed their conduct and criticised the tactics of ministers in regard to them with much warmth but unfortunately algernon neither knew nor could pretend to know anything about these individuals so he sipped his wine and looked at the family portraits which hung round the room in silence my lord made a kind of apology to him as they were going upstairs to the drawing-room i am afraid you were bored mr errington i am sorry for your sake that mr price did not honour us with his company you would have found him much more amusing than us old fogies algernon knew when lord seely talked of mr price not having honoured them with his company that my lord was indignant against that gentleman i have no doubt mr price is a very agreeable person said he but i did not regret him my lord i thought it a great privilege to be allowed to listen to you later in the evening algy overheard lord seely say to general dormer he's a remarkably intelligent young fellow i assure you he has a capital manner returned the general there is something very taking about him indeed ah yes manner yes a very good manner but there's more judgment more solidity about him than appears on the surface meanwhile algernon went on flourishingly and ingratiated himself with every one he steered his way with admirable tact past various perils such as must inevitably threaten one who aims at universal popularity lady harriet was delighted with his singing and lady harriet's expressed approbation pleased lady seely for the dormers were considered to be great musical connoisseurs and their judgment had considerable weight among their own set their own set further supposed that the verdict of the dormers was important to professional artists a delusion which the givers of second-rate concerts who depended on lady harriet to get rid of many seven and sixpenny tickets during the season were at no pains to disturb then algernon took the precaution to keep away from lord seely and to devote himself to my lady during the remainder of the evening this behaviour had so good an effect that she called him ancrum and bade him to go and talk to castalia who was sitting alone in a distant ottoman with a distinctly sour expression of countenance how did you get on with castalia at dinner asked my lady miss kilfinane was very kind to me ma'am 
was she well she don't make herself agreeable to everybody so consider yourself honoured castalia's a very clever girl she can draw make wax flowers and play the piano beautifully can she really will she play to-night i am sure i don't know go and ask her may i yes be off miss kilfinane did not move or raise her eyes when algernon went and stood before her i have come with a petition said he after a little pause have you yes will you play to-night no oh that's very cruel i wish you would i don't like playing before the dormers they set up for being such connoisseurs and i hate that kind of thing i am sure you can have no reason to fear their criticism i don't want to have my performance picked to pieces in that knowing sort of way i play for my own amusement and i don't want to be criticised and applauded and patronised but how can people help applauding when you play lady seely says you play exquisitely did she tell you to ask me to play not exactly but she said i might ask you at this moment general dormer came up and said with his most benevolent smile won't you give us a little music miss kilfinane some beethoven now i see a volume of his sonatas on the piano i hate beethoven returned miss kilfinane hate beethoven no no you don't it's quite impossible a pianist like you oh no miss kilfinane it is out of the question yes i do i hate all classical music and the sort of stuff that people talk about it the general smiled shook his head shrugged his shoulders and walked away miss kilfinane you are ferociously cruel said algernon under his breath as general dormer turned his back on them the little fear he had had of castalia's chilly manner and ungracious tongue had quite vanished algernon was not apt to be in awe of any one and he certainly was not in awe of castalia kilfinane why did you tell the general that you hated beethoven he went on saucily i'm quite sure you don't hate beethoven i hate all the kind of professional jog in which the dormers affect about music music is all very well but it isn't our business any more than tailoring or millinery is our business to hear the dormers talk you would think it the most important matter in the world to decide whether this fiddler is better than that fiddler or what is the right time to play a fugue of box in i am such an ignoramus that i am afraid i don't even know with any precision what a fugue of box is said algernon ingenuously he thought he had learned to understand miss castalia nevertheless when later in the evening lady harriet asked him in her pretty silver tones and do you too hate classical music mr errington he professed the most unbounded love and reverence for the great masters i have had few opportunities of hearing fine music lady harriet said he but it is the thing i have longed for all my life whereupon lady harriet much pleased at the prospect of such a disciple invited him to go to her house every saturday morning when he would hear some of the best performers in london execute some of the best music i only ask real listeners said lady harriet we are just a few music lovers who take the thing very much au sérieux on the whole when algernon thought over his evening sitting over the fire in his bedroom at the inn he acknowledged to himself that he had been successful lady seely is the toughest customer though what a fishwife she looks beside that elegant lady harriet but she can put on airs of a great lady too when she likes it's a very fine line that divides dignity from impudence take her wig off wash her face and clothe her in a short cotton gown with a white apron and how many people would know that belinda lady seely had ever been anything but a cook or the landlady of a public-house well i think i am cleverer than any of em and after all that's a great point with which comfortable reflection algernon ancrum errington went to bed and to sleep end of chapter seventeen volume one chapter eighteen of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume one chapter eighteen on the day following the dinner at lord seely's algernon received a card importing that mrs matchin stubbs would be at home that evening of the lady he knew nothing except that she was an elder sister of young pawkins of pudcombe hall and that her family who were people of consideration in whitford and its neighbourhood thought jemima to have made a good match in marrying mr matchin stubbs in giving him the letter of introduction orlando pawkins had let fall a word or two as to the position his sister held in london society i can't send anybody and everybody to the match in stubbses said young pawkins in their position it wouldn't be fair to inflict our bucolic magnates on them but i am sure jemima will be very glad to make your acquaintance old fellow algernon was quite free from arrogance he would have been well enough contented to dine with mr match in stubbs had that gentleman been a grocer or a cheesemonger 
and in that case he would probably have derived a good deal of amusement from any little vulgarities which might have marked the manners of his host and would have entertained his genteeler friends by a humorous imitation of the same but he was not in the least overawed by the prospect of meeting mrs Natchin stubbs and was quite aware that he probably owed his introduction to her to young pawkins's knowledge of the fact that he was lady seely's relation algernon betook himself to the house of mrs Matchin stubbs in the fashionable neighbourhood before mentioned about half-past ten o'clock and found the small reception-rooms already fuller than was agreeable mrs Matchin stubbs received him very graciously she was a pretty woman with a smooth fair face and light hair and she was dressed with as much good taste as was compatible with the extreme of the prevailing fashion she smiled a good deal and was quite destitute of any sense of humour so glad to see you mr Addington," she said when algernon had made his bow you and orlando are great friends are you not you must let me make you acquainted with my husband then she handed algernon over to a stout red-faced white-haired gentleman much older than herself who shook hands with him and said how do you do and how long have you been in town and then appeared to consider that he had done all that could be expected of him in the way of conversation i don't suppose you know many people here mr Addington," said mrs Matchin stubbs seeing that algernon was standing silent in the shadow of her husband not any you know i have never been in london before haven't you really but perhaps we may have some mutual acquaintance notwithstanding let me see who is here said the lady looking round her rooms are you acquainted with the dormers mrs Matchin stubbs the dormers let me see general and lady harriet dormer oh no i don't think i am of course i must have met them in the course of the season sooner or later one meets everybody do you know miss kilfinane miss kilfinane i i can't recall at this moment she is a sort of connection of mine not a relation for she is lord seely's niece not my lady's oh to be sure you are a cousin of lady seely yes yes i had forgotten but orlando did mention it in truth the fact of algernon's relationship to lady seely was the only one concerning him which had dwelt in mrs Matchin stubbs memory presently she resumed i should like to introduce you to a great friend of ours the most delightful creature i hope he will come to-night but he is very difficult to catch he is a son of lord mullingar what jack price oh you know him do you only by reputation he was to have dined at lord seely's last night when i was there but he didn't show oh i know he's dreadfully uncertain but i must say however that he is generally very good about coming to me it's quite wonderful i'm sure i don't know why i am so favoured then algernon was presented to a rather awful dowager with two stiff daughters to whom he talked as well as he could and the nicest looking of whom he took into the tea-room where there was a great crush and where people trod on each other's toes and poked their elbows into each other's ribs to procure a cup of hay-coloured tea and a biscuit that had seen better days upon my word thought algernon if this is london society i think whitford society better fun but then he reflected that mrs Matchin stubbs was not a real leader of fashionable society she was not quite a rose herself although she lived near enough to the roses for their scent to cling more or less faintly about her garments he was not bored for his quick powers of perception and lively appreciation of the ludicrous enabled him to gather considerable amusement from the scene especially did he feel amused and in his element when on an allusion to his cousinship to lady seely thrown out in the airiest most haphazard way the awful dowager and the stiff daughters unbent and became as gracious as temperament in the one case and painfully tight stays in the other permitted he's a very agreeable person your young friend mr ancram errington said the dowager later on in the evening to mrs Matchin stubbs oh yes he's very nice indeed he is a great favourite with my people he half lives at our place i believe when orlando is at home indeed he is a uh, connected with the seelys i believe in some way second cousin lady seely was an ancram warwickshire ancrams you know returned mrs Matchin stubbs who knew her peerage nearly by heart whereupon the dowager went back to her daughter by whose side having nothing else to do algernon was still sitting and told him that she should be happy to see him at her house in portland place any friday afternoon between four and six o'clock during the season presently when the company was giving forth a greater amount and louder degree of talk than had hitherto been the case for herr doppeldown had just sat down to the grand piano algernon's quick eyes perceived a movement near the door of the principal drawing-room and saw mrs Matchin stubbs advance with extended hand and more eagerness than she had thrown into her reception of most of the company to greet a gentleman who entered with a kind of plunge tripping over a bearskin rug that lay before the door and dropping his hat he was a short broad-chested man with a bald forehead and a fringe of curly chestnut hair round his head 
he was evidently extremely near-sighted and wore a glass in one eye the effort of keeping which in its place occasioned an odd contortion of his facial muscles he was rubicund and looked like a man who might grow to be very stout later in life at present he was only rather stout and was braced and strapped and tightened so as to make the best of his figure his dress was the dress of a dandy of that day and he wore a fragrant hothouse flower in his buttonhole that must be jack price thought algernon he scarcely knew why and the next moment he got away from the dowager and her daughters and sauntered towards the door oh here is mr addington said mrs matchin stubbs looking round at him as he made his way through the crowd do let me introduce you to mr price this is mr ancram errington a great friend of my brother orlando you have met orlando i think oh indeed i have said mr jack price in a rich sweet voice and with a very decidedly marked brogue orlando was one of my dearest friends delightful fellow what orlando's friend must be my friend if you will what the little interrogation at the end of the sentence meant nothing but was a mere trick the use of it with a soft rising inflection of mr jack price's very musical voice had once upon a time been pronounced to be captivating by an enthusiastic irish lady but he had not fallen into the habit of using it from any idea that it was captivating nor had he desisted from it since all projects of captivation had departed from his mind i was to have met you at dinner last night mr price said algernon shaking his proffered hand last night i was where is it i was last night oh at the blazonvilles yes of course what why didn't you come then mr errington the duke would have been delighted perfectly charmed to see you well that may be doubtful seeing that i cannot flatter myself that his grace is even aware of my existence said algernon looking at mr price with twinkling eyes and his mouth twitching with the effort to avoid a broad grin jack price looked back at him puzzled and smiling eh how was it then what was it wasn't me was it algernon laughed outright ah now mr mr my dear fellow where was it that you were to have met me my cousin lady seely was hoping for the pleasure of your company mr price she was under the impression that you had promised to dine with her jack price fell back a step and gave himself a sounding slap on the forehead good gracious goodness he exclaimed you don't mean to say that i do indeed ah now upon my honour i am the most unfortunate fellow under the sun i don't know how the deuce it is that these kind of misfortunes are always happening to me what will i say to lady seely she'll never speak to me any more i suppose what you should keep a little book and note down your engagements mr price said mrs matchin stubbs as she walked away to some other guests mr price gave algernon a comical look half rueful half amused i don't quite see myself with a little book entering on my engagements said he i dare say you've already heard from lady seely of my sins and shortcomings at all events i have heard this that whatever may be your sins and shortcomings they are always forgiven i am afraid i bear an awfully bad character my dear mr errington ancram errington to be sure ah i know your name well enough but names are among the things that slip my memory it is a serious misfortune what then the two began to chat together and when the crowd began to diminish and the rattle of carriages grew more frequent down in the street beneath the drawing-room windows jack price proposed to algernon to go and sup with him at his club they walked away together arm in arm and as they left mrs matchin stubbs doorstep mr price assured his new acquaintance that that lady was the nicest creature in the world and one of his dearest friends and that he could take upon himself to assert that mrs matchin stubbs would be only too delighted to receive him algernon at any time and as often as he liked it will give her real pleasure now what said jack price with quite a glow of hospitality on behalf of mrs matchin stubbs then they went to mr price's club it was neither a political club nor a fashionable club nor a grand club but a club that was widely miscellaneous and decidedly jolly algernon before he returned to his lodgings that night had come to the opinion that london was after all a great deal better fun than whitford and jack price when he called upon lady seely the next day to make his peace with her declared that young errington was really now the most delightful and dearest boy in the world and that he was quite certain that the young fellow was most warmly attached to lord and lady seely all this was agreeable enough and algernon would have been content to go on in the same way to the end of the london season had it been possible but careless as he was about money he was not careless about the luxuries which money supplies certainly if tradesmen and landlords could only be induced to give unlimited credit algernon would have had none the less pleasure in availing himself of their wares because he had not paid for them in coin of the realm but as to doing without or even limiting himself to an inferior quality and restricted quantity that was a matter about which he was not at all indifferent he was received on a familiar footing in the seelys house and his reception there opened to him many other houses in which it was more or less agreeable and flattering to be received 
among the match and stubbses of london society he was looked upon as quite a desirable guest and received a good deal of petting which he took with the best grace in the world and all this was as has been said pleasant enough but as weeks went on algernon's money began to run short and he soon beheld the dismal prospect ahead and not very far ahead of his last sovereign and he was in debt as to being in debt that had nothing in it appalling to our young man's imagination what frightened him was the conviction that he should not be permitted to go on being in debt other people owed money and seemed to enjoy life none the less mr jack price for instance had an allowance from his father on which no one pretended to expect him to live and he appeared very comfortable and contented in the midst of a rolling sea of debt which sometimes ebbed a little and sometimes flowed alarmingly high but which during the last ten years or so had managed to keep pretty fairly at the same level but then mr price was the honourable john patrick price the earl of mullingar's son a younger son it was true and neither lord mullingar nor lord mullingar's heir was likely to have the means or the inclination to fish him out of the rolling sea aforesaid at the most they would throw him a plank now and then just to keep him afloat still there was something to be got out of jack price by a west end tradesman who knew his business something was to be got in the way of money and perhaps something more in the way of connection upon the whole it may be supposed that the west end tradesmen understood what they were about when they went on supplying the honourable john patrick price with all sorts of comforts and luxuries season after season but with algernon the case was widely different and he knew it he had ventured to speak to lord seely about his prospects and to ask that nobleman's advice but lord seely had not seemed able to offer any advice which it was practicable to follow indeed how should he have done so seeing that he was ignorant of most of the material facts of the case he knew in a general way that young ancram algernon had come to be called so in the seely household was poor but between lord seely's conception of the sort of poverty which might pinch a well-born young gentleman who always appeared in the neatest fitting shoes and freshest of gloves and the reality of algernon's finances there was a wide discrepancy algernon had indeed talked freely and with much appearance of frankness about his life in whitford but it may be doubted whether lord seely or his wife either although she doubtless came nearer to the truth in her imaginings on the subject at all realized such facts as that mrs errington had no maid to attend on her that her lodgings cost her eighteen shillings a week and that the smell of cheese from the shop below was occasionally a source of discomfort in her only sitting-room with lord seely algernon had made himself a great favourite and the proof of it was that my lord actually thought about him when he was absent and one day said to his wife i wish belinda that we could do something for ancram do something for him i think we do a great deal for him he has the run of the house and i introduce him right and left and he is always asked to sing when we have people that latter looks rather like his doing something for us i think not at all it's a great advantage for a young fellow in his position to be brought forward and allowed to show off his little gifts in that way he is wasting his time i wish we could get him something to do i am sure you have plenty of claims on you that come before him i did speak to the duke of blazonville about him the other day said my lord with the slightest hesitation in the world the duke of blazonville was in the cabinet and had been a colleague of lord seely's years ago what on earth made you do that valentine you know very well that the next thing the duke has to give i particularly want for reginald oh but what i should ask for young ancram would be something at which your nephew reginald would probably turn up his nose something which reginald would not care about taking reginald wouldn't go abroad except to italy nor indeed anywhere in italy but to naples exactly whether the duke would consider that he was particularly serving the interests of diplomacy by sending reginald to naples i don't know but at all events ancram could not interfere with that project serving nonsense the duke would do it to oblige me as to ancram i have latterly had a kind of plan in my head about ancram about a place for him well yes a place if you like to call it so what do you say to his coming abroad with us in the autumn eh coming abroad with us of course we should have to pay all his expenses but i think he would be amusing and perhaps useful he talks french very well and is lively and good-tempered i have no doubt he would be a most charming travelling companion i don't know about that but i should take him out of kindness and to do him a service but i don't see of what use such a plan would be to him belinda well i've had an idea in my head i tell you i have kept my eyes open and i fancy i see a chance for ancram you are very mysterious my dear said lord seely with a little shrug well least said soonest mended i shall be mysterious a little longer and meanwhile i think we might make him the offer to take him to switzerland with us since you have no objection 
I have no objection, certainly. I think I shall mention it to him, then, and if I were you, I wouldn't bother the Duke about him just yet. But what is this notion of yours, Belinda? The exclamation rose to my lady's lips. How inquisitive men are! But she suppressed it. It was the kind of speech which particularly angered Lord Seely, who much disliked being lumped in with his fellow-creatures on the ground of common qualities. Even a compliment, so framed that my lord was supposed to share it with a number of other persons, would have displeased him. So my lady said, "'Well, now, Valentine, you'll begin to laugh at me very likely, but I believe I'm right. I think Castalia is very well inclined to like this young fellow, and she might do worse.' castalia like him why you don't mean yes i do returned my lady nodding her head that's just what i do mean i'm sure the other evening she became quite sentimental about him good heavens belinda but the idea is preposterous yes i knew you'd say so at first that's why i didn't want to say anything about it just yet a while but allow me to say that if you had any such idea in your head it was only proper that it should be mentioned to me well i have mentioned it Lord Seely clasped his hands behind his back, and walked up and down the room in a stiff, abrupt kind of march. At length he stopped opposite to her ladyship, who was assiduously soothing Fido, Fido having, for some occult reason, become violently exasperated by his master's walking about the room. "'Why, in the first place, do send that brute away,' said his lordship sharply. "'There, he's quiet now. Good Fido. Good boy. Mustn't bark and growl at master. Yes, you were saying?' I was saying that in the first place Castalia must be ten years older than this boy. About that, I should say, but if they don't mind that, I don't see what it matters to us. And he has not any means nor any prospect of earning any that I can see. Why, for that matter, Castalia hasn't a shilling in the world, you know. We have to find her in everything. And so has your sister Julia when Castalia goes to stay with her. And if these two could set their horses together, could, in a word, make a match of it, why, you might do something to provide for the two together, don't you see? Killing two birds with one stone. Very much like killing two birds, indeed. What are they to live on? If Ankara makes up to Castalia, you must get him a place. Something modest, of course. I don't see that they can either of them expect a grand thing. Putting all other considerations aside, said my lord, drawing himself up, it would be a very odd sort of match for Castalia Kilfinane come his birth is as good as hers anyway if his father was an apothecary her mother was a pure curate's daughter rector's daughter belinda dr vice was a learned man and the rector of his parish oh well it all comes to the same thing and as to an odd sort of match why perhaps an odd match is better than none at all you know castalia's no beauty she don't grow younger and she'll be unbearable in her temper if once she thinks she's booked for an old maid poor lord seely was much disquieted he had a kindly feeling for his orphan niece which would have ripened into affection if miss castalia's character had been a little less repellent and he really liked algernon errington so much that the notion of his marrying castalia appeared to him in the light of a sacrifice even although he held his own opinion as to the comparative goodness of the ancrum and kilfinane blood but nevertheless such was lady seely's force of character that many days had not elapsed before his lordship was silenced if not convinced on the subject and the invitation to go to switzerland was given to algernon and accepted End of chapter eighteen volume one chapter nineteen of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope Volume One, Chapter Nineteen. As the spring advanced, letters from Algernon Errington arrived rather frequently at Whitford. His mother had ample scope for the exercise of her peculiar talent in boasting about the reception Algy had met with from her great relations in town, the fine society he frequented, and the prospect of still greater distinctions in store for him. One or two troublesome persons, to be sure, would ask for details and inquire whether Lord Seely meant to get Algy a place and what tangible benefits he had it in contemplation to bestow on him. But to all such prosy, plodding individuals, Mrs. Errington presented a perspective of vague magnificence, which sometimes awed and generally silenced them. The big square letters on Bath post-paper, directed in Algernon's clear, graceful handwriting, and bearing my Lord Seely's frank, in the form of a blotchy, sprawling autograph in one corner, were, however, palpable facts, and Mrs. Errington made the most of them. It was seldom that she had not one of them in her pocket. She would pull them out, sometimes as though in mere absence of mind, sometimes avowedly of set purpose. But in either case she failed not to make them the occasion for an almost endless variety of prospective and retrospective boasting. It must be owned that Algernon's letters were delightful. 
they were written with such a freshness of observation such a sense of enjoyment such a keen appreciation of fun tempered always by a wonderful knack of keeping his own figure in a favourable light that passages from them were read aloud and quoted at whitford tea-parties with the most enlivening effect those letters are written pro bono publico minnie bodkin observed confidentially to her mother no human being would address such communications to mrs errington for her sole perusal well i don't know minnie surely it is natural enough that he should write long letters to his mother even without expecting her to read them aloud to people very natural but not just such letters as he does write i think minnie suppressed any further expression of her own shrewdness her confidence in herself had been rudely shaken and she made keen motive probing speeches much seldomer than formerly and she could not but agree in the general verdict that algernon's letters were very amusing miss chubb was delighted with them although they were the occasion of one or two tough struggles for supremacy in the knowledge of fashionable life between herself and mrs errington but miss chubb was really good-natured and mrs errington was unshakably self-satisfied so that no serious breach resulted from these combats dormer lady harriet dormer miss chubb would say musingly i think i must have met her when i was staying with miss figgins and the bishop of plumbun and the dormer's place is not so very far from whitford you know i believe i have heard papa speak of his acquaintance with some of the family oh no mrs errington would reply not likely you should ever have met lady harriet at mrs figgins she is the earl of grandcourt's daughter and lord grandcourt had the reputation of being the proudest nobleman in england well my dear mrs errington the spinster would retort bridling and tossing her head sideways that could be no reason why his daughter should not have visited the bishop a dignitary of the church you know and as to family i can assure you the figginses were the most aristocratically connected besides miss chubb lady harriet must have been in the nursery in those days she is only six-and-thirty you can see her age in the peerage this was a kind of blow that usually silenced poor miss chubb who was sensitive on the score of her age but on the whole she was not displeased at the opportunity of airing her reminiscences of london and she did not always get the worst of it in her encounters with mrs errington mrs errington had one listener who at all events was never tired of hearing algy's letters read and re-read and whose interest in all they contained was vivid and inexhaustible rhoda bestowed an amount of eager attention on the brilliant epistles bearing lord seely's frank which even mrs errington considered adequate to their merits often not quite always there would be a little message how are all the good maxfields say i asked or sometimes give my love to rhoda mrs errington took algernon sending his love to rhoda much as she would have taken his bidding her stroke the kitten for him she did not guess how it set the poor girl's heart beating it was only natural that rhoda's face should flush with pleasure at being so kindly and condescendingly remembered still less could the worthy lady understand the effect of her careless words on mr maxfield once she said in his presence have you any message for mr algernon rhoda she had recently taken to speaking of her son as mr algernon a circumstance which had not escaped rhoda's sensitive observation you know he always sends you his love oh my young gentleman has not forgotten rhoda then said old maxfield without raising his eyes from the ledger he was examining algernon never forgets indeed none of the ancrums ever forget an almost royal memory has always been a characteristic of our race with which magnificent speech mrs errington made an impressive exit from the back shop old max knew enough to be aware that the tenacity even of a royal memory had not always been found equal to retaining such trifles as a debt of twenty pounds but so long as algy remembered his rhoda he was welcome to let the money slip indeed if algy behaved properly to rhoda there should be no question of repayment twenty pounds or two hundred would be well bestowed in securing rhoda's happiness and making a lady of her nevertheless old max kept the acknowledgment of the debt safely locked up and looked at it now and then with some inward satisfaction algernon was coming back to revisit whitford in the summer and then something definite should be settled meanwhile maxfield took some pains to have rhoda treated with more consideration than had hitherto been bestowed on her he astonished betty grimshaw by sharply reproving her for sending rhoda into the shop on some errand rice he exclaimed testily in answer to his sister-in-law's explanation if you want rice you must fetch it for yourself the shop is no place for rhoda and i will not have her come there then he began to display a quite unprecedented liberality in providing rhoda's clothes the girl whose ideas about her own dress were of the humblest and who had thought a dove-coloured merino gown as good a garment as she was ever likely to possess was told to buy herself a silk gown a good un nothing flimsy and poor said old max a good solid silk gown that will wear and last and you had better ask mrs errington to go with you to buy it she will understand what is fitting better than your aunt betty 
I wish you to have a proper and becoming raiment, Rhoda. You are not a child now, and you go amongst gentlefolks at Dr. Bodkin's house, and I would not have you seem out of place there by reason of unsuitable attire. Rhoda was delighted to be allowed to gratify her natural taste for colour and adornment, and she shortly afterwards appeared in so elegant a dress that Betty Grimshaw was moved to say to her brother-in-law, "'Why, Jonathan, I'll declare if our Rhoda don't look as genteel as e'er a one of the young ladies I see. Why, you're making quite a lady of her, Jonathan.' "'Me make a lady of her?' growled old Max. "'It isn't me, nor you, nor yet a smart gown as can do that. "'But the Lord has done it. "'The Lord has given Rhoda the nature of a lady, "'if ever I see a lady in my life, "'and I mean her to be treated like one. "'Rhoda's none of your sort of clay, Betty Grimshaw. "'She's fine porcelain is Rhoda. "'I suppose you've nothing to say against the child's silk gown?' "'Nay, not I, Jonathan. "'She's welcome to wear silk or satin either, "'if you like to pay for it.' and indeed i'm uncommon pleased to see a bit of bright colour and be let to put a flower in my bonnet i'm sure we've had enough of them methodist ways dismal and dull enough they were jonathan but you can't say as i ever grumbled or went again you anything for peace and quietness sake is my way but i do like church best having been bred to it and i always did in my heart even when you and david powell would be preaching up the wesleyans i never said anything as you know jonathan but i kept my own way of thinking all the same and I'm only glad you've come round to it yourself at last. This was bitter to Jonathan Maxfield, but he had once or twice to endure similar speeches from his sister-in-law since his defection from Methodism. His autocratic power in his own family was wielded as strictly as ever, but his assumption of infallibility had been fatally damaged. To get his own way was still within his power, but it would be vain henceforward to expect those around him to acknowledge, even with their lips, that his way must of necessity be the best way. At the beginning of April there came to Whitford the announcement that Algernon had received and accepted an invitation to accompany the Seelys abroad in the late summer, and that therefore his visit to dear old Whitford was indefinitely postponed. This announcement would have angered and disquieted old Max beyond measure, had it not been that Algernon took the precaution to write him a letter which arrived in Whitford by the same post as that which brought to Mrs. Errington the news of his projected journey to the Continent. It was a very neat letter. Some persons might have called it a cunning letter. At any rate, it soothed old Max's anxious suspicions, if it did not absolutely destroy them. "'I believe, my good friend,' wrote Algernon, "'that you will quite approve the step I am taking in accompanying Lady and Lord Seeley to Switzerland. They have no son, and I think I may say that they have come to look upon me almost as a child of the house. I remember all the good advice you gave me before I left Whitford, and when I was hesitating about accepting my lord's invitation, I thought of what you would have said, and made up my mind to resist the strong temptation of coming back to dear old Whitford this summer.' Then, in a postscript, he added, "'As to that little private transaction between us, I must ask you kindly to have patience with me yet a while. I try to be careful, but living here is expensive, and I am put to it to pay my way. You will not mention the matter to my mother, I know, and perhaps it would be well to say nothing to her about this letter. May I send my love to Rhoda?' In justification of this last sentence, it must be said that Algernon was quite innocent of Lady Seely's project regarding himself and Castalia and that there were times when he thought with some warmth of feeling of the summer days in Lanryden, and told himself that there was not one of the girls whom he met in society who surpassed Rhoda Maxfield in the delicate freshness of her beauty, or equalled her in natural grace and sweetness. Algernon had really excellent taste. End of chapter 19 End of volume 1《Of a Charming Fellow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope. Volume 2, Chapter 1. "'So you are to come to Switzerland with us next month, Ancrum,' said Miss Kilfinane. She was seated at the piano in Lady Seely's drawing-room, and Algernon was leaning on the instrument and idly turning over a portfolio of music. "'Yes, I hope your Serene Highness has no objection to that arrangement.' "'It would be of no use my objecting, I suppose.' of none whatever but it would be unpleasant oh you would still go then whether i liked it or not i am afraid the temptation to travel about europe in your company would be too strong for me how silly you are ancrum said miss kilfinane looking up half shyly half tenderly but she met no answering look from algernon he had just come upon a song that he wanted to try and was drawing it out from under a heap of others in the portfolio look here castalia he said i wish you would play through this accompaniment for me i can't manage it it will be seen that Algernon had become familiar enough with Miss Kilfinane to call her by her Christian name. 
and moreover he addressed her in a little tone of authority as being quite sure she would do what he asked her this she said taking the song from his hand why do you want to sing this dull thing i think gluck is so dreary and besides it isn't your style at all isn't it what is my style i wonder oh light lively things are your style at the bottom of his mind perhaps algernon thought so too but it is often very unpleasant to hear our own secret convictions uttered by other people and he did not like to be told that he could not sing anything more solid than a french chansonnette lady harriet particularly wishes me to try this thing of gluck's at her house next saturday he said miss kilfinane threw down the song pettishly oh lady harriet she exclaimed i might have known it was her suggestion she is so full of nonsense about her classical composers i think she makes a fool of you ancram i know it will be a failure if you attempt that song thank you very much miss kilfinane and now having spoken your mind on the subject will you kindly play the accompaniment algernon picked up the piece of music smoothed it with his hand placed it on the desk of the piano and made a little mocking bow to castalia his serenity and good humour seemed to irritate her i'm sick of lady harriet she said querulously and with a shrug of the shoulders the action and the words were so plainly indicative of ill-temper that lady seely who waddled into the drawing-room at that moment asked loudly what are you two quarrelling about eh oh what a shocking idea my lady we're not quarrelling at all answered algernon raising his eyebrows and smiling with closed lips he rarely showed his teeth when he smiled which circumstance gave his mouth an expression of finesse and delicate irony that was peculiar and coupled with the candidly arched brows attractive well it takes two to make a quarrel certainly returned my lady but castalia was scolding you at all events weren't you now castalia castalia deigned not to reply but tossed her head and began to run her fingers over the keys of the piano the fact is lady seely said algernon that castalia is so convinced that i shall make a mess of this aria which lady harriet dormer has asked me to sing for her next saturday that she declines to play the accompaniment of it for me well you ought to be immensely flattered young jackanapes she wouldn't care a straw about some people's failures would you castalia would you mind now if jack price were to sing a song and make an awful mess of it eh as to that it seems to me that jack price makes an awful mess of most things he does replied castalia oh exactly so one mess more or less don't matter but in the case of our admirable crichton here it is different i think he's getting awfully spoiled said castalia a little less crossly and there was absolutely a blush upon her sallow cheek and that's the reason you snub him is it you see ancram it's all for your good if castalia is a little hard on you miss kilfinane rose and left the room saying that she must dress for her drive i think castalia is harder on lady harriet than on me said algernon when castalia was gone ah uh, hm castalia has a lot of good points but i dare say you have noticed it she is given to being a little bit jealous when she cares about people now you showed a decided liking for lady harriet's society and you crack up her grace and her elegance and her taste and all that and sometimes i think poor cassie don't quite like it don't you know what on earth can it matter to her cried algernon he knew that castalia was no favourite with my lady and he flattered himself that he was becoming a favourite with her so he spoke with a little half-contemptuous smile and a shrug of impatience when he asked what on earth can it matter to her but my lady did not smile she threw her head back and looked at algernon from under her half-closed eyelids it is my opinion young man that it matters a good deal to castalia she said more than it would have mattered to me when i was a young lady i can tell you but there's no accounting for tastes then lady seely also left the room having first bidden algernon to come and dine with her the next day algernon was dumbfounded not that he had not perceived the scornful castalia's partiality for his charming self not that her submission to his wishes or even his whims and her jealous anxiety to keep him by her side whenever there appeared to be danger of his leaving it for the company of a younger or more attractive woman had escaped his observation but algernon was not fatuous enough to consider himself a lady-killer his native good taste would alone have prevented him from having any such pretension it was ridiculous and it involved almost of necessity some affectation and algernon never was affected he accepted castalia's marked preference as the most natural thing in the world he had been used to be pet and preferred all his life but it truly had not entered into his head that the preference meant anything more than that castalia found him amusing and clever and good-looking and that she liked to keep so attractive a personage to herself as much as possible for algernon had noted the honourable castalia's little grudging jealousies and he knew as well as anybody that she did not like to hear him praise lady harriet for whom indeed she had long entertained a smouldering sort of dislike 
but that she should have anything like a tender sentiment for himself and still more that lady seely should see and approve it for my lady's words and manner implied no less was a very astonishing idea indeed so astonishing was it that after a while he came to the conclusion that the idea was erroneous he turned lady seely's words in his mind this way and that and tried to look at them from all points of view and as words will do when too curiously scrutinized they gradually seemed to take another and a different meaning from the first obvious one which had struck him the old woman was only giving me a hint not to annoy miss kilfinane not to excite her peevish temper or exasperate her envy but this solution would not quite do either lady seely is not too fond of castalia he said to himself besides i never knew her particularly anxious to spare any one's feelings what the deuce did she mean i wonder algernon continued to wonder at intervals all the rest of the afternoon his mind was still busy with the same subject when he came upon jack price seated in the reading-room of the club to which he had introduced algernon at the beginning of his london career and of which algernon had since become a member it was now full summer-time the window was wide open and the hon john patrick was lounging in a chair near it with a newspaper spread out on his knees and his eyes fixed on a water-cart that was besprinkling the dusty street outside he looked very idle and a little melancholy as he sat there by himself and he welcomed algernon with even more than his usual effusion asking him what he was going to do with himself and offering to walk part of the way towards his lodging with him when he was told that algernon must betake himself homeward the offer was a measure of mr price's previous weariness of spirit for in general he professed to dislike walking and how long is it since you saw our friend miss matchin stubbs asked jack price of algernon as they strolled along arm in arm on the shady side of the way oh i'm afraid it's rather a long time said algernon carelessly oh now that's bad my dear boy you shouldn't neglect people you know and our dear mrs matchin stubbs is exceedingly pleasant as to neglecting her i don't know that i've neglected her particularly what more could i do than call and leave my card call again you wouldn't leave off going to lady seely's because you happen not to find her at home once in a way lady seely is my relation hmm well would you cut lady harriet dormer for the same reason cut her but my dear mr price you mustn't suppose that i have cut mrs matchin stubbs come now my dear fellow i'm a great deal older than you are and i'll take the liberty of giving you a bit of advice never offend people who mean to be civil merely because they don't happen to amuse you what the deuce we can't live for amusement in this life the moralizing might be good but the moralist was algernon thought badly fitted with his part he was tempted to retort on his new mentor but he did not retort he merely said quietly has mrs matchin stubbs been complaining of me then well the truth is she has in an indirect kind of way you know what i'll go and see her this evening to-day's thursday isn't it she has one of her at-homes this evening jack price looked at the young man admiringly you're an uncommonly sensible fellow said he i give you my honour i never knew a fellow of your years to take advice so well by jove i wish i'd had your common sense when i was your age it's too late for me now to do any good you know and in fact with a solemn lowering of his musical irish voice i split myself on the very rock i'm now warning you off i never was polite and if any one told me to go to the right sure it was a thousand to one that i'd instantly bolt to the left and shaking his head with a sad regretful gesture jack price parted from algernon at the corner of the street mrs matchin stubbs received the truant very graciously that evening she knew that during his absence from her parties he had been admitted into society to which even her fashionable self could not hope to penetrate but though this might be a reason for a little genteel sneering at him behind his back it was none whatever mrs matchin stubbs considered for giving him a cool reception when he did grace her house with his presence she said to several of her guests one after the other we have young ancrum errington here to-night he's so glad to come to us poor fellow for my people's place is his second home down in the west of england and then the seelys think it is nice of us to take notice of him don't you know he is a relation of lady seelys and is quite in that set the dormers and all those people ah oh, you don't know them they say he is to marry castalia kilfinane but we haven't spoken about it yet out of our own little circle her father was viscount caldkale and married lord seelys younger sister and so on and so on with a set smile and no expression whatever on her smooth fair face to algernon himself she showed herself politely inquisitive on the subject of his engagement to castalia and startled him considerably by saying when she found herself close to him for a few minutes near a doorway and are we really to congratulate you mr errington if you please madam answered algernon with a bright amused smile and an easy bow 
but i should like to know if it be not indiscreet on what special subject i am indeed to be congratulated on finding myself here but then you are hardly likely to be the person to do it at that moment algernon was wedged into a corner behind a fat old gentleman who was vainly struggling to extricate himself from the crowd in front by making a series of short plunges forward the rebound of which sent him back on to algernon's toes with some violence it was very hot and a young lady was singing out of tune in the adjoining room her voice floating over the murmur of conversation occasionally in a wailing long-drawn note altogether it might have been suspected by some persons that mr ancrum errington was laughing at his hostess when he spoke of his position at that time as being one which called for congratulation but mrs matchin stubbs was the sort of woman who completely baffled irony by a serene incapability of perceiving it and she would sooner suspect you of maligning her hating her or insulting her than of laughing at her to this immunity from all sense of the ridiculous she owed her chief social successes for there are occasions when some obtuseness of the faculties is useful mrs matchin stubbs tapped algernon's arm lightly with her fan as she answered now mr errington that's all very well with the outside world but you shouldn't make mysteries with us i look upon you almost as a brother of orlando's i do indeed you're very kind indeed and i'm immensely obliged to you but upon my word i don't know what you mean by making mysteries oh well if you choose to keep your own counsel of course you can do so i will say no more upon which mrs matchin stubbs proceeded to say a great deal more and ended by plainly giving algernon to understand that the rumour of his engagement to miss castalia kilfinane had been pretty widely circulated during the last four or five weeks oh mrs matchin stubbs said algernon laughing you surely never believe more than a hundredth part of what you hear there's mr price looking for me i promised to walk home with him it is such a lovely night thank you no not any tea are you ever at home about four o'clock i shall take my chance of finding you good night algernon was greatly puzzled how and whence had the report of his engagement to castalia originated he would have been less puzzled if not less surprised had he known that the report had come in the first place from lady seely herself who had let fall little words and hints well understanding how they would grow and spread he had not committed himself in his answer to mrs matchin stubbs he had replied to her in such a manner as to leave the truth or falsehood of the report she had mentioned an open question he felt the consciousness of this to be a satisfaction some persons might say well but since the report was false why not say so but algernon always and as it were instinctively took refuge in the vague a clear statement to which he should appear to be bound would have irked him like a tight shoe and naturally so since he was conscious that he should flexibly conform himself to circumstances as they might arise and not stick with stubborn stupidity to any predetermined course of conduct which might prove to be inconvenient after saying good-night to his hostess he elbowed his way out of the crowded rooms and went downstairs side by side with jack price the latter knew everybody present or thought he did and as when he did happen to make a mistake and to greet enthusiastically some total stranger whom he had never seen in his life before he never acknowledged it but persisted in declaring that he remembered the individual in question perfectly the name the name my dear sir or madam has quite escaped my wretched memory his progress towards mrs matchin stubbs hall door was considerably impeded by the nods smiles and shakes of the hand which he scattered broadcast there's deepville he said to algernon as they passed a tall dark thin-faced man with a stern jaw and a haughty carriage of the head don't you know deepville ah then you should you should really the most delightful loving charming fellow he'd be enchanted to make your acquaintance errington quite enchanted i can answer for him there's nothing in the world would give him greater pleasure what algernon was by this time pretty well accustomed to jack price's habit of answering for the ready ecstasies of all his acquaintances with regard to each other and merely replied that he dared to say sir lancelot deepville was a very agreeable person and how's the fair castalia asked jack when they were out in the street i believe she's quite well i saw her this morning oh i suppose you did exclaimed jack price with a little smile which algernon thought was to be interpreted by mrs matchin stubbs recent revelations but the next minute jack added very unexpectedly i had some idea at one time that deepville was making up to her but it came to nothing she's a nice creature is castalia kilfinane a very nice creature algernon could not help smiling at this disinterested praise i am afraid she does not always behave quite nicely to you mr price he said and he said it with a little air of apology and proprietorship which he would not have assumed yesterday oh you are quite mistaken my dear boy she's as nice as possible with me i like castalia kilfinane there's a great deal of good about her and she's well educated and clever in her way not showy you know what but oh a nice creature 
there's a sort of bitter twang about her you know that i like immensely oh well cried algernon laughing outright if you have a liking for bitters indeed ah but she doesn't mean it it's just a little flavour a little soupçon oh upon my word i think miss kilfinane a thoroughly nice creature it was a pity about deepville now eh what i wonder that you never thought of trying your fortune in that quarter yourself mr price said algernon looking at him curiously as they passed within the glare of a street lamp is it me ah oh, now i thought everybody knew that i wasn't a marrying man besides there never was the least probability that miss kilfinane would have had me none in the world sure she'd never think of looking at a bald old bachelor like myself what algernon did not feel called upon to pursue the subject but he had a conviction that jack price would not under any circumstances have given miss kilfinane the chance of accepting him the allusion however seemed to have touched some long silent chord of feeling in jack and set it vibrating as they sat at supper together jack reverted to the sage mentor-like tone he had assumed that morning giving algernon much sound advice of a worldly nature and holding up his own case as a warning to all young men who liked to bolt to the left when they were told to go to the right and presenting himself in the unusual light of a gloomy and disappointed person and when a couple of tumblers of hot punch smoked on the table jack grew tender and sentimental ah my dear errington he said i wish you may never know what it is to be a lonely old bachelor lonely why you're the most popular man in london out and out popular and what good does that do me if i were dead to-morrow who'd care do you think although that doesn't seem to me to be such a hard case as people say sure i don't want any one to cry when i'm dead but i'd like em to care for me a little while i'm living if i'd been my own elder brother now or if i'd taken advantage of me opportunities and made a good fortune as i might have done but twas one scrape after another i put my foot into i did and said whatever came uppermost and you'll find my dear boy that it's the foolish things that mostly do come uppermost it's lucky that amongst other foolish things an imprudent marriage never rose to the surface said algernon oh but it did oh devil a doubt about it the combined influence of memory and hot punch brought out jack's musical brogue with unusual emphasis only there i couldn't carry out my foolish intentions it wasn't the will that was wanting my dear boy providence looked after you on that occasion providence or the other thing oh i could tell you a love story only you'd be laughing at me indeed i would not laugh upon my honour i don't know why you shouldn't i often enough have laughed at myself she was the sweetest gentlest most delicate little creature snowdrop i used to call her and as for goodness she was steeped in it you felt goodness in the air wherever she was just as you smell perfume all about when the hawthorns blossom in may ah oh, now to think of me talking in that way and my head as smooth as a billiard ball and and how was it did your people interfere to prevent the match my people faith they'd have screeched to be heard from here to there if i'd made her the honourable mrs jack price and contaminated the blood of the prices of mullingar did ye ever hear that my great-grandfather was a whisky distiller bedad he was then and i believe he manufactured good liquor rest his soul but i shouldn't have cared for that as ye may believe but they got hold of her and told her that i was a roving unsteady sort of fellow and that was true enough and she married somebody else the man she took wasn't as good-looking as i was in those days however there's no accounting for these things you know it's fate what destiny and she told me in the pretty silver voice of hers like a robin on a bough that i'd better forget her and marry a lady in me own station and live happy ever after marry said i if i don't marry you i'll marry no woman gentle or simple she didn't believe me and i don't know that i quite believed myself but so it turned out you see what and so i was saved from a mesalliance and from having maybe to bring up a numerous family on nothing a year and the blood of the princes of mullingar is in a fine state of preservation and mary never became the honourable mrs jack price honourable bedad it's the honourable jack price she'd have made of me if she'd taken me an honourable or jack than i've been without her i'm afraid do you know errington i believe on my soul that if i had married mary and gone off with her to canada and built a log-house and looked after my pigs and my ploughs i'd have been a happy man but there it is a man never knows what is really best for him until it's too late we'll hope there are compensations to come what of all the dreary cut-throat blue devilish syllables in the english language i believe those words too late are the ugliest they make a fellow feel as if he was being strangled so mind your p's and q's my boy and don't throw away your chances while you've got em and thus ended jack price's sermon on worldly wisdom end of chapter one volume two chapter two of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume two chapter two 
Minnie Bodkin had loyally tried to keep the promise she had given to the Methodist preacher respecting Rhoda Maxfield, but in so trying she had encountered many obstacles. In the first place, Rhoda, with all her gentleness, was not frank, and she opposed a passive resistance to all Minnie's efforts to win her confidence on the subject of Algernon. "'It is like poking a little frightened animal out of its hole trying to get anything from her,' said Minnie impatiently. Not that Rhoda's reticence was wholly due to timidity. She knew instinctively that she was to be warned against giving her heart to Algernon Errington, that she should hear him blamed, or at least that the unreasonableness of trusting in his promises, or taking his boyish love-making in serious earnest, would be safely set forth by Miss Bodkin. Rhoda had not perceived any of the wise things which might be said against her attachment to Algernon in the beginning, but now she thought she perceived them all, and she was resolved, with a sort of timid obstinacy, not to listen to them. "'I'm sure Algy's fond of me, and even if he has changed,' the supposition brought tears into her eyes as the words framed themselves in her mind. "'I don't want to have him spoken unkindly of.' But in truth, latterly, her hopes had been outweighing her fears. In most of his letters to his mother, Algernon had spoken of her, and had sent her his love. He was making friends, and looking forward, hopefully, to getting some definite position. Even her father spoke well of Algernon now, said how clever he was, and what grand acquaintance he was making, and how sure he would be to succeed, and once or twice her father had dropped a word which had set Rhoda's heart beating, and made the colour rush into her face, for it seemed as if the old man had some idea of her love for Algy, and approved it. All these circumstances together made Minnie's task of mentor a rather hopeless one. And then Minnie herself, although, as has been said, loyally anxious to fulfil her promise to David Powell, began to think that he had overrated the importance of interfering with Rhoda's love story, if love story it were. Powell lived in a state of exalted, and perhaps overstrained, feeling, and attributed his own earnestness to slighter natures. Of course, on the side of worldly wisdom, there was much to be said against Rhoda's fancying herself engaged to Algernon Errington. There was much to be said, and yet Minnie did not feel quite sure that the idea was so preposterous as Powell had appeared to think it. True, Mrs. Errington was vain and worldly, and ambitious for her son. True, Algernon was volatile, selfish, and little more than twenty years of age, but still there was one solid fact to be taken into account, which many thought might be made to outweigh all the obstacles to a marriage between the two young people. The solid fact, namely, of old Maxfield's money. If Algernon married a wife with a good dower, and if the wife were as pretty, as graceful, and as well-mannered as Rhoda, I do not suppose that anybody would concern himself particularly with her pedigree, thought Minnie and even if any one did that difficulty would not be insuperable for i have no knowledge of mrs errington if within three months of the wedding she had not invented a genealogy only second to her own for her son's wife and persuaded herself of its genuineness into the bargain as to those other convictions which would have made such a marriage horrible to david powell even had it been made with the hearty approval of all the godless world minnie did not share them she did not believe that rhoda's character had any spiritual depth and she thought it likely enough that she would be able to make Algernon happy, and to be happy as his wife. "'Algy is not base or cruel or vicious,' she said to herself. "'He has merely the faults of a spoiled child. A woman with more earnestness than Rhoda has would weary him, and a wiser woman might in the long run be wearied by him. She is pretty and sufficiently intelligent to make a good audience, and so humble-minded that she would never be exacting, but would gratefully accept any scraps of kindness and affection which Algy might feel inclined to bestow on her, and that would react upon him, and make him bestow bigger scraps for the pleasure of being adored for his generosity. There were times when she felt very angry with Rhoda, Rhoda, who turned away from the better to choose the worse, and who was coldly insensible to the fact that Matthew Diamond was in love with her. Nay, had she been cognizant of the fact, she would, Minnie felt sure, have shrank away from the grave, clever gentleman, who, as it was, could win nothing warmer from her than a sort of submissive endurance of his presence, and a humble acknowledgment that he was very kind to take notice of an ignorant little thing like her. It was with strangely mingled feelings that Minnie, watching day by day from her sofa or easy-chair, perceived the girl's utter indifference to Diamond. How much would Minnie have given for one of those rare sweet smiles to beam upon her, which were wasted on Rhoda's pretty shy downcast face? How happy it would have made her to hear those clear incisive tones, lowered into soft indistinctiveness for her ears, as they so often were for Rhoda's, who would look timid and tired and answer, "'Yes, sir,' and "'No, sir,' until Minnie's nervous sympathy with Diamond's disappointment, and irritation against him for being disappointed, grew almost beyond her own control. 
one may evening when the cuckoo was sending his voice across the purling wit from distant pudcombe woods and the hyacinths in minnie's special flower stand were pouring out their silent even song in waves of perfume five persons were sitting in mrs bodkin's drawing-room the windows of which looked towards the west they were listening to the cuckoo and smelling the sweet breath of the hyacinths and gazing at the rosy sky and dropping now and then a soft word which seemed to enhance the sweetness and silence of the room the five persons were minnie bodkin rhoda maxfield matthew diamond mr warlock the curate of st chad's and miss chubb the latter was embroidering something in berlin wools as usual but the peace of the place and of the hour seemed to have fallen on her as on the rest and she sat with her work in her lap looking across the stand of hyacinths very still and quiet the rev peter also sat looking silently across the hyacinths but it was at the owner minnie's cheek rested on her thin white hand and her lustrous eyes had a far-away look in them as they gazed out towards pudcombe woods where the cuckoo was calling his poet-loved syllables with a sweet clear tone that seemed to have gathered all the spirit of the spring into one woodland voice rhoda sat beside the window and was sewing very gently and noiselessly but seemingly intent upon her work and unconscious that the eyes of mr diamond who was seated close to minnie's chair were fixed upon her and that in some vague way he was attributing to her the perfume of the flowers and the melancholy sweet note of the bird and the melted rubies of the western sky what a sunset said miss chubb breaking the silence but she spoke almost in a whisper and her voice did not startle any ear mr warlock habituated to suppress his feelings and adapt his words to those of his company answered after a little pause lovely indeed it is an evening to awaken the sensibilities of a feeling heart it makes me think of manchester square we had some hyacinths in pots too i remember when i was staying with the bishop of plumbun miss chubb's odd association of ideas was merely due to the fact that her thoughts were flying back to the rose garden of youth do you not like to hear the cuckoo miss bodkin said diamond softly speaking almost in her ear she started and turned her head towards him yes no i like it although it makes me sad i like it because it makes me sad perhaps all sights and sounds and scents seem to me to be combined this evening into something sweeter than words can say it is a fine evening and the cuckoo is calling from pudcombe woods and my hyacinths are of a very good sort it seems to me that words can manage to say that much with distinctness what a pity thought diamond that head overshadows heart in this attractive woman she is too keen too cool too critical a woman without softness and sentiment is an unpleasant phenomenon and i think she has grown harder in her manner than she used to be then the reflection crossed his mind that her health had been more frail and uncertain than usual of late and that she bore much physical suffering with high courage and the little prick of resentment he had begun to feel was at once mollified he answered aloud with a slow smile why yes words may manage to say all that i wonder if i may ask you a question it is one i have long wished to ask you may certainly there are questions that should not be asked i trust you not to ask any such now when she looks and speaks like that she is adorable thought diamond meeting the soft light of minnie's lovely pathetic eyes which fell immediately before his own i wish i might have you for a friend miss bodkin he said i think you have your wish i thought you knew you had it oh yes you are always good and kind and-and but you-i will make a clean breast of it and pay you the compliment of telling you the truth i have thought latterly that you are hardly so cordial so frank in your kindness to me as you once were it would matter nothing to me in another person but in you a little shade of manner matters a great deal i don't believe there is another human being to whom i would say so much for i am as perhaps you know a man little given to thrust myself where i am not welcome you are about the proudest and most distant person i ever knew and require to be very obviously implored before you condescend to easy friendship with any one minnie laughed as she spoke a little low rippling laugh which she ended with a forced cough to hide the sob in her throat no not proud you misjudge me but it is true that i dread almost more than anything else being deemed intrusive if that fear has prevented you from putting the question to which you have so long desired an answer pray ask it forthwith i think it has almost answered itself said diamond bending over her and turning his chair so as to cut her and himself off still more from the others i was going to ask you if i had unwittingly offended you in any way or if my frequent presence here were for any reason irksome to you it might well be so and if you would say so candidly believe me i should feel not the smallest resentment sorrow i should feel i can't deny it but i should not cease to regard you as i have always regarded you from the beginning of our acquaintance 
how highly that is i have not the gift to tell nor do you love the direct broadly spoken praise that sounds like flattery be it ever so sincere no please don't praise me said minnie huskily she was shadowed by his figure as he sat beside her and so he did not see the tears that quivered in her eyes after a second or two during which she had passed her handkerchief quickly almost stealthily across her face she said but your question you say has answered itself i hope so i hope i may believe that there is nothing wrong between us nothing i have not offended you in any way no nor unwittingly hurt you i dare say i am awkward and abrupt sometimes pray believe that i have nothing in the world to blame you for thank you i know you speak sincerely your friendship is very precious to me she answered nothing but hesitatingly put out her hand which he grasped for an instant and would have raised to his lips but that she drew it suddenly away murmuring something about her cushions being awry and trying tremblingly to rearrange them he moved the cushions that supported her shoulders with a tender careful touch and placed them so that her posture in the lounging chair might be easier she clasped her hands together and laid her head back wearily you don't know how precious your friendship is to me he went on lowering his voice still more i never had a sister but i have often thought how sweet the companionship of a sister must be i am very much alone in the world and if i dared i would speak to you with fraternal confidence pray speak so answered minnie almost in a whisper i should like to be of some comfort to you there was a silence it was scarcely broken by miss chubb's murmured remark to mr warlock that the moon was beginning to make a ring of light behind the poplar trees on the other side of the wit like a halo round the head of a saint the twilight deepened rhoda's fingers ceased to ply the needle but she remained at the window looking over at the moonlit poplars while miss chubb's voice softly droned out some rambling speech which jarred no more on the quietude of the hour than did the ripple of the river you have been so good to her said diamond suddenly under the cover of this murmur and then paused for a moment as if awaiting a reply minnie did not speak presently he went on you know her and understand her better than any of the people here i think every one likes rhoda said minnie at length yes diamond answered eagerly yes do they not but it requires the delicate tact of a refined woman to overcome her shyness i never saw so timid a creature has it not struck you as strange that she should have come out from that vulgar home so entirely free from vulgarity rhoda has great natural refinement you appreciate her thoroughly and then the repulsive and ludicrous side of methodism has not touched her at all it is marvellous to me to see her so perfect in grace and sweetness i do not think the methodism has ever taken a deep hold on rhoda and yet it is strange that it should be so she was exposed to the influence of david powell and although he has fine qualities he is ignorant and fanatical his ignorance and fanaticism are mere spots on the sun cried minnie and now as she spoke her voice was stronger and she raised her head from the cushion in his presence the scripture phrase a burning and a shining light kept recurring to me how poor and dark one's little selfish self seems beside him diamond slightly raised his eyebrows as he answered powell has undoubtedly very genuine enthusiasm and fervour but he might be a dangerous guide to undisciplined minds he would sacrifice himself he does sacrifice himself for undisciplined and ungrateful minds with whom i own my egotism could not bear so patiently but it was not of powell that matthew diamond wished to speak now under the softening influences of the twilight and the unaccustomed charm of pouring out the fullness of his heart to such a confidant as minnie he could talk of nothing but rhoda perhaps i am a fool to keep singeing my wings he said it may be all in vain but don't you believe that a strong and genuine love is almost sure to win a woman's heart provided the woman's heart is free to be won perhaps provided and you do not think hers is free how can i answer you i know that powell thought there was some one trifling with her affections it was on that subject that he begged for the interview with you i have never asked any questions about that interview but i have guessed since from many little signs and tokens that the person he had in his mind was young errington yes then the matter cannot be serious he was little more than a boy when he left whitford but rhoda was turned nineteen when algernon went away diamond started eagerly forward with his hand on the arm of the chair and fixing his eyes anxiously on her face said minnie tell me the truth do you think she cares for him it was the first time he had ever addressed minnie by her christian name and she marked the fact with a chilly feeling at the heart you ask for the truth she said sadly yes i do think so diamond leant his head on his hand for a minute in silence then he raised his face again and answered thank you for answering with sincerity 
but i knew you would do no otherwise this feeling for algernon must be half made up of childish memories i cannot believe it is an earnest sentiment that will endure nothing endures if i know myself at all my love will endure i am a resolute man and do not much regard external obstacles the only essential point is can she ever be brought to care for me there was a pause do you think she might some day is that the only essential point yes to me it is so i do believe that it would be for her happiness to care for me rather than for that selfish young fellow and for your happiness oh of that i am not doubtful at all there's the moon above the poplar trees cried miss chubb and as she spoke a silver beam stole into the room and lighted one or two faces leaving the others in shadow amongst the faces so illumined was minnie bodkins did you ever see anything so beautiful as minnie's countenance in the moonlight whispered miss chubb to the curate she looks like a spirit poor mr warlock sighed he had been envying diamond his long confidential conversation with the doctor's daughter she is always beautiful he replied but i do think she looks unusually sad to-night that's the moon my dear sir bless you it always gives a pensive expression to the eyes always and miss chubb cast her own eyes upwards towards the sky as she spoke dear me you have no lamp here said a voice which though mellow and musical in quality was too loud and out of harmony with the twilight mood of the occupants of the drawing-room to be pleasant is not that silver lamp aloft there sufficient mrs errington asked diamond oh good evening mr diamond returned mrs errington with perhaps an extra tone of condescension for she thought in her heart that the tutor was a little spoiled in whitford society i can hardly make out who's who oh there's miss chubb and mr warlock and oh is that you rhoda well minnie i left your mamma giving the doctor his tea in the study and she sent me upstairs and if you have no objection i should like the lamp lit for i am going to read you a letter from algy end of chapter two volume two chapter three of a charming fellow this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope Volume 2, Chapter 3 "'Now, isn't that charming?' said Mrs. Errington, finishing a paragraph descriptive of some brilliant evening party at which Algernon had been present, and looking round triumphantly at her audience. "'Very indeed,' said Minnie, who had been specially appealed to. "'Quite a graphic picture of the beau monde,' said Miss Chubb i know all about that sort of society so i can answer for the correctness of algy's description miss chubb had the discretion to lower her voice as she made the latter remark so that no one heard it save mr warlock and thus mrs errington was not challenged to contradiction how well algernon writes observed mr diamond he has the trick of the thing so neatly and puts out what he has to say so effectively i wonder he has never thought of turning his pen to profit my son sir has other views returned mrs errington loftily but as to what you are pleased to call the trick of the thing i can assure you that literary talent is hereditary in our family i don't know my dear minnie whether you have happened to hear me mention it but my great-uncle by the mother's side was a most distinguished author really what did he write asked miss chubb with much distinctness but mrs errington took no heed of the question and my own father's letters were considered models of style she continued a large number of them are i believe still preserved in the family archives at angram park how did they come there asked miss chubb unless he wrote letters to himself they must have been scattered about here and there they were collected after his death miss chubb you may not be aware perhaps that it is not an unfrequent custom to collect the correspondence of eminent men it was done in the case of walpole and mr diamond will correct me if i am wrong in that of the celebrated persian gentleman whose letters are so well known mirza was the name i think miss chubb felt herself on unsafe ground here and did not venture farther well at all events algernon appears to be getting on admirably in london said the rev peter pacifically minnie threw him an approving glance for his good-natured words dispelled a little cloud on miss chubb's brow and brought down mrs errington from her high horse to the level of friendly sympathies oh he is getting on wonderfully dear fellow said she i am sure we are all glad to hear of algy's doing well and being happy he is such a nice genial unaffected creature and never gave himself any airs said miss chubb with a sidelong toss of her head and a little unnecessary emphasis oh no my dear that sort of vulgar pretension is not found among folks who come of a real good ancient stock replied mrs errington with superb complacency 
and we are not to have the pleasure of seeing algernon back among us this summer said mr warlock in general he shrank from much conversation with mrs errington whom he found somewhat overwhelming but he would have nerved himself to greater efforts than talking to that thick-skinned lady for the sake of a kind look from minnie bodkin oh impossible quite out of the question he is sorry of course and i am sorry but it would be cruel in him to desert poor dear seely when he is so anxious to have him with him all the summer is there anything the matter with lord seely asked minnie no my dear nothing but a little overwork the mental strain of a man in his position is very severe and he depends so on algy and so does dear lady seely i ought almost to feel jealous they say openly that they look on him quite as a son it's a pity they haven't a daughter isn't it said miss chubb mrs errington did not catch the force of the hint she answered placidly they have an adopted daughter a niece of my lord's who is almost always with them oh indeed said diamond quickly i had not heard that mrs errington bestowed a stolid china-blue stare on him before replying i dare say not sir the fact was that mrs errington had not known it herself until quite recently for algernon either mistrusting his mother's prudence or for some other reason had passed lightly over castalia's name in his letters and for some time had not even mentioned that she was an inmate of lord seely's house in his latter letters he had spoken of miss kilfinane but in terms purposely chosen to check as far as possible any match-making flights of fancy which his mother might indulge in with reference to that lady i am not sure my dear proceeded mrs errington turning to minnie whether i have happened to mention it to you but castalia the honourable castalia kilfinane only daughter of lord caldkale is staying with the dear seelys but as she is rather sickly and not very young she cannot of course be to them what algy is oh not very young said miss chubb in a tone of disappointment well not very young comparatively speaking miss chubb she might be considered young compared with you and me i dare say fortunately perhaps for the preservation of peace much imperilled by this last speech of mrs errington's dr bodkin and his wife here entered the drawing-room although it was may and the temperature was mild for the season a good fire blazed in the grate and on the rug in front of it dr bodkin after saluting the assembled company took up his accustomed station diamond rose and stood leaning on the mantel-shelf near his chief an action which mrs errington viewed with disfavour as indicating on the part of the second master at the grammar school a too great ease and absence of due subjection in the presence of his superiors and the reverend peter and miss chubb drew their chairs nearer to the fireplace thus bringing the scattered members of the party into a more sociable circle the doctor was understood to object to his society being broken up into groups of two or three and to prefer general conversation which indeed afforded better opportunities for haranguing and for looking at the company as a class brought up for examination and if needful correction according to the doctor's habit of mind only rhoda remained at her window apart from the others and dr bodkin seeing her there called to her to come nearer what little primrose said the doctor kindly don't stay there looking at the moon she is chillier and not so cosy as the coal-fire draw the curtain and shut her out and come nearer to us all rhoda obeyed blushing deeply as she advanced within range of the lamplight and looking so pretty and timid that the doctor began smilingly to murmur into diamond's ear something about punelio similis non sine vano burarum et sulie metu the doctor's prejudice against rhoda had long been overcome and she had grown to be a pet of his in so far as so awful a personage as the doctor was capable of petting any one to this result the conversion to orthodoxy of the maxfield family may have contributed but possibly rhoda's regular attendance at st chad's might have been inefficacious to win the doctor's favour good churchman though he was without some assistance from her blooming complexion soft hazel eyes and graceful winning manners the girl came forward bashfully into the circle around the fire and nestled herself down on a low seat between mrs errington and mrs bodkin a month ago her place in that drawing-room would have been beside minnie's chair but lately by some subtle instinct rhoda had a little shrunk from her former intimacy with the young lady she was sensitive enough to feel the existence of some unexpressed disapproval of herself in minnie's mind we have been hearing a letter of algernon's papa said minnie have you have you mrs errington has been kind enough to read it to us the doctor left his post of vantage on the hearth-rug for an instant went to his daughter and bending down kissed her on the forehead pretty well this evening my darling said he minnie caught her father's hand as he was moving away again and pressed it to her lips thank god for you and mother she whispered minnie was not given to demonstrations of tenderness having been rather accustomed like most idolized children 
to accept her parents' anxious affection as she accepted her daily bread, that is to say, as a matter of course, but there was something in her heart now which made her keenly alive to the preciousness of that abounding and unselfish devotion. "'I think it is quite touching to see that father and daughter together,' said Miss Chubb confidentially to her neighbour, the curate. "'So severe a man as the doctor is in general, quite the churchman, combined with the scholastic dignitary, you know, and yet with Minnie as gentle as a woman.' As to Mr. Warlock, the tears were in his eyes, and he unaffectedly wiped them away, answering Miss Chubb only by a nod. "'And what?' said the doctor, when he had resumed his usual place and his usual manner. "'What is the news from our young friend Algernon?' Mrs. Errington began to recapitulate some of the items in her son's last letter. The lords and ladies gay, whose society he frequented, the brilliant compliments that were paid him by word and deed, and the immense success which his talents and attractions met with everywhere yes and algernon is kindly received by other sorts and conditions of men besides the aristocracy of this realm said minnie with a little ironical smile he has shown in evening receptions at mrs matchin's stubbs and sipped lawyer ledbetter's port wine with appreciative gusto he has to be civil to people you know my dear said mrs errington smoothly it wouldn't do to neglect ah uh, ah uh, persons who mean to be attentive merely because they are not quite in our own set i trust not indeed madam exclaimed the doctor with protruding lips and frowning brows it would be exceedingly impolitic in algernon to turn away from proffered kindness but i will not put the matter on that ground i should be sorry to think that a youth who has been i may say formed and brought up under my tuition could be capable of ignoble and ungentlemanlike behaviour mrs bodkin glanced a little apprehensively at mrs errington after this explosion of the doctor's but that descendant of all the ancrams had not the slightest idea of being offended she was smiling with much complacency, and answered mellifluously to the doctor's thunder, "'Thank you, Dr. Bodkin. Now that is so nice in you to appreciate Algy as you do. He is, and ever was, like his ancestors before him, the soul of gentlemanliness.' "'Algernon was always most popular, I'm sure,' said Miss Chubb. "'He was a favourite with everybody, such lively manners, and at home with all classes.' "'Yes,' said Diamond, in a low voice, "'superus deorum gratis et imis.' now what may that mean asked miss chubb who had quick ears the words were applied to a mythological personage of very flexible talents madam replied diamond oh mythological well i never went very far into mythology now it's a singular circumstance which has often struck me and perhaps some of you learned gentlemen may be able to explain it that none of the studies in ology ever seemed to have much attraction for me whereas the ographies always interested me very much there was geography now i used to know the names of all the european rivers when i was quite a child and orthography and biography we had a translation of pluto's lives at the rectory and i was uncommonly fond of them but as to the ologies i frankly own that i know nothing about them the effect of this speech of miss chubb's was much heightened by the mute commentary of dr bodkin's face during its utterance when she came to pluto's lives the scholastic eyes rolled round on mr diamond and the curate with an expression of such helpless indignation that the former was driven to blow his nose with violence in order to smother an explosion of laughter and even mr warlock's sombre brow relaxed and he ventured to steal a smiling glance at minnie but minnie did not return the glance she had shaded her eyes with her hand and was leaning back in her chair unheeding the conversation that was going on around her but now really you know there must be some reason for these things if philosophers could only find it out pursued miss chubb cheerfully wasn't there minnie ah uh, i beg your pardon oh you naughty absent girl you have not heard a word i have been saying i was merely remarking that but at this point dr bodkin's patience suddenly snapped he found himself unable silently to endure a recapitulation of miss chubb's views as to the comparative attractions of the ologies and the ographies and he abruptly demanded of his wife in the magisterial tones which had often struck awe into the hearts of the lowest form laura are we not to have our rubber before midnight pray make up the table in the next room there are let me see mrs errington miss chubb you will take a hand laura we are just a quartet and the doctor giving his arm to mrs errington marched off to the whist table on this occasion mr warlock escaped being obliged to play indeed the curate's assistance at whist was only called into requisition when a second table besides the doctor's had to be made up for although dr bodkin co-operated very comfortably with his curate in all church matters he found himself not altogether able to do so at the green table the rev peter's notions of whist being confused and elementary to be sure mrs bodkin was not a much better player than the curate but then she offered the compensating advantage of enduring an unlimited amount of scolding 
whether as a partner or adversary, without resenting it. So Diamond and Warlock and Minnie and Rhoda remained in the big drawing-room when their elders had left it. Minnie had the lamp shaded and the curtains opened, so that the full clear light of the climbing moon poured freely into the room. Warlock timidly drew near to Miss Bodkin's chair, and ventured to say a word or two now and then, to which he received answers so kind and gracious, that the poor fellow's heart swelled with gratitude, and perhaps with hope, for hope is very cunning and stealthy, and hides herself under all sorts of unlikely feelings. Minnie had grown much more gentle and patient with the awkward, plain, rather dull curate of late. She listened to his talk and replied to it, and all the while she was taking eager cognizance, with eye and ear, of the two who sat side by side near the window, Diamond bending down to speak softly to Rhoda, and the girl's delicate face, white and sprite-like in the moonlight, turning now and then towards her companion with a pretty, languid gesture. Once or twice Rhoda laughed at something Diamond said to her. Her laugh was perhaps a little suggestive of silliness, but it was low and musical and rippling, and it was not too frequent. Minnie sat with her hands clasped in her lap, and when she was carried to her own room that night, Jane exclaimed, as she removed her young mistress's ornaments, "'Goodness, Miss Minnie, what have you done to yourself? Why, that diamond ring you wear has made a desperate mark in your finger. It looks as if it had been driven right into the flesh as hard as could be.' Minnie held up her thin white hand to the light, and looked at it strangely. Ah, said she, I must have pressed and twisted the ring about unconsciously. I was thinking of something else. End of chapter 3volume two chapter four of a charming fellow this librivox recording is in the public domain a charming fellow by francis eleanor trollope volume two chapter four time passed or seemed to pass with unusual gentleness over whitford if some of our acquaintances there had suddenly been called upon to mention the changes that had taken place within two years they would perhaps have said at first that there had been none but changes there had been, nevertheless, and by a few dwellers in the little town, they had been keenly felt. The second summer vacation, after that happy holiday time, which Rhoda had passed with the Arringtons at Lon Ryden, arrived. A hot July, winged with thunder-clouds, brooded over the meadows by the wit. The shadow of Pudcombe Woods was pleasant in the sultry afternoons, and the cattle stood for hours knee-deep in dark pools, overhung by drooping boughs. The great schoolroom, at the grammar school, resounded no more with the tread of young feet or the murmur of young voices. It was empty and silent and dusty, and an overgrown spider had thrown his grey tapestry right across the oriel window, so that it was painted warp and woof, with brave purple and ruby blazonries from the old stained glass. Dr. Bodkin and his family were away at a seaside place in the south of England. Mr. Diamond had gone on a solitary excursion afoot. Even Pudcombe Hall was deserted although young Pawkins was expected to return thither later in the season for the shooting. Rhoda Maxfield had been sent to her half-brother Seth at Duckwell Farm to get strong and sunburned, and as she was allowed to be by herself almost as much as she wished, Mrs. Seth Maxfield being a bustling active woman, who would not have thought of suspending or modifying her daily avocations for the sake of entertaining any visitor whatever, Rhoda spent her time not unhappily in a sort of continuous daydream, sitting with a book of poetry under a hedge in the hayfield, or wandering with her little nephew, Seth Maxfield the Younger, in Pudcombe Woods, which were near her brother's farm. She liked looking back better than looking forward, perhaps, and enacted in her imagination many a scene that had occurred at dear Lonryden over and over again. But still there were many times when she indulged in hopeful anticipations as to Algy's return. He had come back to London after his foreign travel, and had spent another brilliant season under the patronage of his great relations and then a rumour had reached Whitford that Lord Seely had at length obtained the promise of a good post for him, and that he might be expected to revisit Whitford in the autumn at latest. Mrs. Errington had been invited to a country house of Lord Seely's in Westmoreland to meet her son, and had set out on her visit in high spirits. Rhoda was thus cut off from hearing frequently of Algernon through his mother, but she looked forward to seeing them together in September. Rhoda missed her friend and patroness, but she missed her less at Duckwell than she would have done in the dull house in the high street. On the whole, she was not unhappy during these sultry summer weeks. Modest and humble-minded as she was, she had come to understand that she was considered pretty and pleasing by the ladies and gentlemen whose acquaintance she had made. No caressing words, no flattering epithets, no pet names had been bestowed upon her by her father's old friends and companions. She was just simply Rhoda Maxfield to them, never Primrose or Pretty One or Rhoda Dear. 
and the methodists however blind to her attractive qualities had displayed considerable vigilance in pointing out her backsliding and exhorting her to make every effort to become convinced of sin certainly the society of ladies and gentlemen was infinitely more agreeable then too there had dawned on her some idea that mr diamond felt a warm admiration for her perhaps something even warmer than admiration miss chubb who delighted to foster any amatory sentiments which she might observe in the young persons around her and was fond of saying with a languishing droop of her plump rubicund good-humoured countenance that she would not for the world see other young hearts blighted by early disappointment as hers had been had dropped several hints to that effect sufficiently broad to be understood even by the bashful rhoda and a little to her own surprise rhoda had felt something like gratification in consequence mr diamond was such a very clever gentleman although he wasn't rich yet everybody thought a great deal of him even dr bodkin decidedly the most awful embodiment of authority whom rhoda had ever yet known treated mr diamond with consideration and miss minnie was his intimate friend rhoda had not the least idea of ever reciprocating mr diamond's sentiments but she could not help feeling that the existence of those sentiments increased her own importance in the world and she had a lurking idea that it might if known to algy increase her importance in his eyes also as to mr diamond's part in the matter rhoda to say truth concerned herself very little with that partly from a humble estimate of herself and partly from that maiden incapacity for conceiving the fire and force of a masculine passion which often makes girls pass for cruel who are only childish she never had thought of mr diamond as seriously suffering for her sake but yet she was less cold and repellent to him than she had once been it is difficult not to thaw somewhat in the presence of one whose words and looks make a genial atmosphere for that sensitive plant youthful vanity rhoda's wardrobe which by this time had become considerable in quantity and tasteful in quality was a great source of amusement to her she delighted to trim and stitch and alter and busy her fingers with the manufacture of bright-coloured bows of ribbon and dainty muslin frills mrs seth looked contemptuous at what she called rhoda's finery and told her she would never do for a farmer's wife if she spent so much time over a parcel of frippery seth maxfield shook his head gravely and hoped that rhoda was not given up utterly to worldliness and vanity but feared that she had learnt no good at st chad's church but had greatly backslided since the days of her attendance at chapel for the seth maxfields still belonged to the wesleyan connection and disapproved of the change that had taken place among the family at whitford not that seth was a deeply religious man but his father's desertion of the wesleyans appeared to him in the light of a party defection it was ratting and ratting as seth thought without excuse of a bribe look how well father has prospered he would say to his wife he's as warm a man as father as e'er a one in whitford and the church folks bought their tea and sugar of him all the same when he belonged to the society but i don't believe the society will spend their money with him now as they did so that's so much clean lost i'm not so strict as some myself nor i don't see the use of it but i do think a man ought to stick to what he's been brought up to especially when it's had the manifest blessing of providence if the lord was so well satisfied with father being a wesleyan i think father might have been satisfied too still there had been no quarrel between the whitford maxfields and those of duckwell they came together so seldom that opportunities for quarrelling were rare and seth had too great a respect for such manifestations of providential approbation as had been vouchsafed to his father to be willing to break entirely with the old man so when old max proposed to send rhoda to the farm for a few weeks he paying a weekly stipend for her board his son and his son's wife had at once agreed to the proposition and as they were not persons who brought their religious theories into the practical service of daily life rhoda's conscience was not disturbed by having a high and stern standard of duty held up for her attainment at every moment the wesleyan preacher at that time in the district was a frequent guest at duckwell farm and in the long summer evenings one or two neighbours would occasionally drop in to the cool stone-flagged parlour where brother jackson would read a chapter and offer up a prayer and afterwards there would be smoking of pipes and drinking of home-brewed by the men while mrs seth and rhoda would sit on a bench in the apple orchard near to the open window of the parlour and sew and talk or listen to the conversation from within as they pleased rhoda perceived quickly enough that the duckwell farm species of methodism was very different from the methodism of david powell mr jackson never said anything to frighten her he talked indeed of sin and of the dangers that beset sinners but he never spoke as if they were real to him as if he heard and saw all the terrible things he discoursed of so glibly then mr jackson was rhoda thought a somewhat greedy eater he did not smoke it was true but he took a good share of seth's strong ale and was not above indulging in gossip 
perhaps to please himself, perhaps to please Mrs. Seth Maxfield. Rhoda drew a comparison in her own mind between Brother Jackson and the stately rector of St. Chad's, and felt much satisfaction at the contrast between them. How much nicer it was to be a member of a Church of England congregation, where one heard Dr. Bodkin or Mr. Warlock speak a not-too-long discourse in correct English, and with that refined accent which Rhoda's ear had learned to prize, and where the mellow old organ made a quivering atmosphere of music that seemed to mingle with the light from the painted windows, than to sit on a deal bench in a whitewashed chapel, and painfully keep oneself broad awake, whilst Brother Jackson or Brother Hinks bawled out a series of disjointed sentences, beginning with, Oh! and displaying a plentiful lack of aspirates. On the whole, perhaps, her stay at Duckwell Farm was a potent agent in confirming Rhoda in orthodox views of religion. Generally, as she sat beside Mrs. Seth in the parlour, or on the bench outside the window, Rhoda withdrew her attention from the talk of Brother Jackson and the others. She could think her own thoughts and dream her own dreams, whilst she was knitting a stocking or hemming a pinafore for little Seth. But sometimes a name was mentioned at these meetings that she could not hear with indifference. It was the name of David Powell. The tone in which he was spoken of now was very opposite to the chorus of praise which had accompanied every mention of him among the Whitford Methodists two years ago. There were rumours that he defied the authority of conference, and intended to secede from the society. He was said to have been preaching strange doctrine in the remote part of Wales, and to have caused and encouraged extravagant manifestations, such as were known to have prevailed at the preachings of Berridge and Hicks seventy or eighty years ago, and earlier still at the first open-air sermons of John Wesley himself at Bristol. Brother Jackson shook his head and pursed up his lips at the rumours. He had never much approved of Powell, and Seth Maxfield had distinctly disapproved of him. Seth had been brought up in the old sleepy days, when members of the society in Whitford were comfortably undisturbed by the voice of an awakening preacher. He had resented the fuss that had been made about David Powell. He had been still more annoyed by his father's secession, which he attributed to Powell's overzeal and presumption, and he, by his own example, encouraged a hostile and critical tone in speaking of the preacher. There was indeed but one voice raised in his defence in the parlour at Duckwell Farm. This was the voice of Richard Gibbs, the head groom at Pudcombe Hall, who sometimes came over to Duckwell to join in the prayer meetings there. Although Richard Gibbs was but a servant, he was a trusted and valued one, and he was received by the farmer and his wife with considerable civility. Richard knew his place, as Mrs. Seth said, and was not one of them as if ye give him an inch, they'll take an ell. And then he had considerable knowledge of farriery, and had more than once given good advice to Farmer Maxfield respecting the treatment of sick horses and cattle. Seth was fond of repeating that he himself was not so strict as some, finding, indeed, that a reputation for strictness, in a methodistical sense, put him at a disadvantage with his fellow farmers on market days. But whenever Richard Gibbs was spoken of, he would add to this general disclaimer of peculiar piety, on his own part, "'Not, mind you, but what there's some as conversion does a wonderful deal for to this day, thanks be. Why, there's Dicky Gibbs, head groom at Pudcombe Hall. Talk of blasphemers! Well, Dicky was a blasphemer, and now his lips are as pure from evil speaking as my little maid's there.' and he's the only one I ever knew as had to do with horses that wouldn't tell you a lie. At first I believe there was some at the hall, I name no names, didn't like Dicky's plain truths. There was a carriage horse to be sold, and Dicky spoke out and told this and that, and young master couldn't get his price. But in the long run it answers, oh, I'm not against a fervent conversion, nor yet against conviction of sin, for some. So Richard Gibbs sat many a summer evening in the flagged parlour at Duckwell Farm, and his melancholy, clean-shaven, lantern-jawed face was a familiar spectacle at prayer meetings there. Oh, "'I have been much grieved and exercised in spirit on behalf of Brother Powell,' said Mr. Jackson in his thick voice. The expounding and the prayers were over. Seth had lighted his pipe. So had Roger Heath, the baker from Pudcombe Village. A great cool jug of ale stood on the table, and the setting sun sent his rays into the room, tempered by a screen of jessamine and vine leaves that hung down outside the window now ah, and reason too said seth gruffly he's been getting further and further out of the right furrow this many a day they do say observed sour-faced roger heath that there's dreadful scenes with them poor welsh at his field preachings men and women stricken down like bullocks and screechings and convulsions like as if they was all possessed with the devil lark cried mrs seth eagerly why how is that then rhoda listening outside behind the screen of vine leaves at the open window could not repress a shudder at the thought that had david powell shown this new power of his a year or two ago 
she herself might have been among the convulsed who bore testimony to his terrible influence how is that mrs maxfield returned richard gibbs why how can it be excepting by abounding grace nay mr gibbs but how dreadful it seems don't it just think of falling down in a fit in the open field just think of living and dying unawakened to sin is not that a hundred times more dreadful i hope it don't need to roll about like bedlamites to be awakened to a sense of sin mr gibbs cried seth maxfield the lord forbid ejaculated brother jackson a likely tale added mrs seth cheerfully i'm against all such doings said roger heath shaking his head but if it be the lord's doing sir remonstrated richard gibbs speaking slowly and with an anxious lack-lustre gaze at the whitewashed ceiling as though counsel might be read there and i've heard tell that john wesley did the same at his field preachings brother jackson hastily wiped his mouth after a deep draught of ale before replying that was in the beginning when such things may have been needful but now i fear they only bring scandal upon us and strengthen scoffers i'll tell you what it is said seth taking the pipe from his mouth and waving it up and down to emphasize his words it's my opinion as david powell's not quite not quite right in his head tain't the first time that thought has crossed my mind said the baker who had once upon a time been uneasy under the yoke of powell's stern views as to weights and measures of course pursued seth argumentatively we've got to draw a line religion is one thing and rampaging is another from the first when power began rampaging i mistrusted what it would come to the human brain is a very delicate and mysterious organ said brother jackson ah ejaculated heath with an air of profundity as of one the extent of whose acquaintance with the human brain was not easily to be set forth in words you may well say so sir there you're right indeed brother jackson why there it is cried seth and powell he overtaxed the human brain it's like flying in the face of providence almost to want to go so much beyond your neighbours why he'd fast till he well-nigh starved himself but he gave all he spared from his own stomach to the poor put in gibbs looking sad and perplexed i call all that rampaging returned seth with a touch of his father's obstinacy dr evans read out an account of these things in wales from a newspaper in mr barker the chemist's shop in whitford last saturday said heath i heard it and dr evans said it was catching and that such like excitement was dangerous for you never know where it might end and dr evans is of a welsh family himself he added bringing out this clause as though it strikingly illustrated or elucidated the topic under discussion mrs seth drew her little boy close to her and covered his curly poll with her large maternal hand as though to protect the little human brain within from all dangers mercy me she said i hope powell won't come into these parts any more i should be frightened to go to chapel or to let the children go either oh you need not be alarmed mrs maxfield said brother jackson with a superior smile nay but if it is catching mr jackson persisted the anxious mother tot lass it didn't like measles said her husband the ale being by this time exhausted and the pipe smoked out brother jackson rose to depart and the baker went away with him seth maxfield detained gibbs for a few minutes to ask his advice about a favourite cart-horse well mr gibbs said the housewife when the conference being over he bade her good evening and when are your folks coming back to the hall not just yet marm young master has gone to westmoreland i hear to a wedding at some nobleman's house there he'll be back at pudcombe for the shooting a wedding eh said mrs seth with eager feminine interest in the topic not his own wedding i suppose oh no ma'am tis some friend of his i believe that he knew at whitford erringham i think the name is a young gentleman that's going to marry the nobleman's niece the housekeeper at the hall was telling some of my fellow-servants about it the other day but i'm ill at remembering the chat i hear and tis unprofitable work too good evening ma'am farewell seth stooping down to pat the little one's curly head may the lord bless and keep you mrs seth stood out in the apple orchard with two of her children clinging to her skirts and held up her hand to shade her eyes as she watched the departing figure of richard gibbs moving across the meadow in the rosy evening light then she turned to the wooden bench where rhoda was sitting huddled together with her work lying in her lap you didn't come in to prayers rhoda said her sister-in-law but however you can hear it all just as well outside as in if it wasn't for civility to mr jackson i'd leave a stay out there in these fine summer evenings myself and i was thinking my child what a white face you've got like a sheet of white paper for all the world and your hands are quite cold though it's been downright sultry mercy me don't go and get sick on our hands rhoda what will your father say 
"'Come, you'd best get to bed, and I'll make you a hot posset myself.' Rhoda passively followed her sister-in-law to the fresh lavender-scented chamber which she occupied, and she consented to go to bed at once. Her head ached, she said, but she declined the hot posset, and only asked to be left quiet. "'There's always some bother with girls of that delicate sort,' said Mrs. Seth to her husband, when she went downstairs again. "'Rhoda's mother was just such another. Looked as if you might blow her away. I can't think whatever made your father marry her. Not but Rhoda's a nice-tempered girl enough, and very patient with the children. But do you know, Seth, I'm afraid she's got a chill or something sitting out in the orchard so late. What makes you think so? Well, she had a queer, scared kind of look on her face. Nonsense. Catching cold don't make people look scared. Something made her look scared, I tell you. It's either she's sickening for some fever, or else she's seen a ghost. End of chapter 4《ボリューム2 Chapter 5 of A Charming Fellow》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope《ボリューム2 Chapter 5 》From Mrs. Errington to Mrs. Bodkin《Long Fells, Westmoreland, July 26, 18 blank》Dear Mrs. Bodkin, Amid the tumult of feelings which have recently agitated me, I yet cannot neglect to write to my good friends in Whitford, and participate my emotions with those who have ever valued and appreciated my darling boy at this most important moment of his life. It may perhaps surprise, but will I am sure gratify you to learn that Algernon is to be married on this day week to the Honourable Castalia Caroline Kilfinane, only daughter of the late Baron Caldkale of Caldkale, who is, though not a relation, yet a connection of our own, being the niece of our dear cousin-in-law, Lord Seely. To say that all my proudest maternal aspirations are gratified by such a match is feebly to express what I feel. Birth, with me the first consideration, dear Mrs. Bodkin, for I make no pretences with you, and confess that I should have deplored Algernon's mating below himself in that respect, elegance, accomplishments, and a devoted attachment to my son. These are Castalia's merits in my eyes. You will forgive me for having said nothing of this projected alliance until the last moment. The young people did not wish it to be talked about. They had a romantic fancy to have the wedding as quiet as possible, amid the rural beauties of this most lovely scenery, and thus escape the necessity for inviting the crowds of distinguished friends and connections on both sides of the house, who would have had to be present had the marriage taken place in London. That would have made it too pompous an affair to satisfy the taste of our Castalia, who is sensitive refinement itself. The dear Seelys are only too indulgent to the least wish of Algernon's, and they at once agreed to keep the secret. What poor Lord and Lady Seely will do when Algy leaves them, I assure you, I cannot imagine. It really grieves me to contemplate how they will miss him. But, of course, I cannot but rejoice selfishly to know that I shall have my dear children so near me. For, you may perhaps have heard the news, Lord Seely has, by his immense influence in the highest quarters, procured dear Algy an appointment— and, as good fortune will have it, the appointment brings him back to Whitford, among his dear and early friends. He is to be appointed to the very arduous and responsible position of postmaster there. But important as this situation is, it is yet only to be considered a stepping-stone to further advancement. Lord Seely wants Algy in town, which is indeed his proper sphere, and the result of some new ministerial combinations, which are expected in certain quarters, will, there is no doubt, put him in the very foremost rank of rising young diplomatists. But I must not say more even to you, dear Mrs. Bodkin, for these are state secrets, which should be sacredly respected. This is a most lovely spot, and the house combines the simple elegance of a cottage ornée with the luxurious refinement that befits the residence of a peer like Lord Seely. It is not, of course, fitted up with the same magnificence as his own town mansion, or even as his ancestral place in Rutlandshire, but it is full of charms to the cultivated spirit, and our dear young people are revelling in its romantic quietude. There are very few guests in the house, by a kind thought of Algy's, which I am sure you will appreciate, Orlando Parkins is to be the best man at the wedding. The young man is naturally gratified by the distinction, and our noble relatives have received him with that affability which marks the truly high-bred. There is also an Irish gentleman, the Honourable John Patrick Price, who arrived last evening in order to be present at the ceremony. He is one of the most celebrated wits in town, and belongs to an Irish family of immense antiquity. 
castalia will have none of her own intimate young friends for bridesmaids to make a choice of one or two might have seemed invidious and to have eight or ten bridesmaids would have made the wedding too ostentatious for her taste therefore she will be attended at the altar by the two daughters of the village clergyman simple modest girls who adore her the bride and bridegroom will leave us after the breakfast to pass their honeymoon at the lakes i shall return forthwith to whitford in order to make preparation for their reception lady seely presses me to remain with her for a time after the wedding but i am impatient to return to my dear whitford friends and share my happiness with them farewell dear mrs bodkin give my love to minnie who i hope has benefited by the sea breezes and best regards to the doctor believe me your very attached friend sophia augusta addington p s do you happen to know whether barker the chemist has that cottage in the bristol road still to let it might suit my dear children at least for a while from miss kilfinane to her cousin lady louisa marston longfell's twenty ninth july my dear louisa i answer your last letter at once for if i delay writing i may not have time to do so at all there are still a thousand things to be thought of and my maid and i have to do it all for you know what aunt seely is she won't stir a finger to help anybody uncle seely is very kind but he has no say in the matter nor as far as that goes in any matter in his own house you ask about the wedding it will be very scrubby thanks to my lady's stinginess she would have it take place in this out-of-the-way country house which they scarcely ever come to in order to save the expense of a handsome breakfast there will be nobody invited but the parson and the apothecary i suppose i hate longfells it is the most inconvenient house in the world i do believe and so out of repair that my maid declares the rain comes through the roof on to her bed ancram's mother arrived last week she was half inclined to be huffy at first when we told her our news because she had been kept in the dark to the last moment but she has got over her sulks now and makes the best of it i can see now that ancram was right in keeping our engagement secret from her as long as possible she would have been a dreadful worry and told everybody she is wonderfully like lady seely in the face only much better looking and has a fine natural colour that makes my lady's cheeks look as if they had been done by a house-painter ancram has invited an old whitford acquaintance of his to be his best man at the wedding he says that as we are going to live there for a time at least it would never do to offend all the people of the place by taking no notice of them it would be like going into a hornet's nest and the young man in question has been civil to ancram in his schoolboy days he is a certain mr pawkins who lives at a place with the delightful name of pudcombe hall he is not so bad as i expected and is quiet and good-natured if all the whitfordians turn out as well as he i shall be agreeably surprised but i fear they are a strange set of provincial bumpkins however we shall not have to remain amongst them long for uncle val has privately promised to move heaven and earth to get on from better position you know he is to be postmaster at whitford only think of it it would be absurd if it were not such a downright shame and i more than suspect my lady of having hurried uncle val into accepting it for ancram i suppose she thinks anything is good enough for us i wish you could see ancram he is very handsome and even more elegant than handsome and his manners are admitted on all hands to be charming it is monstrous to think of burying his talents in a poky little hole like whitford but there is this to be said if he hadn't got this postmastership we could not have been married at all for he is poor and you know what my great fortune is i do think it is too bad that people of our condition should ever be allowed to be so horribly poor the government ought to do something for us uncle val has made me a handsome present of money to help to furnish our house i am sure this is quite unknown to my lady so don't say anything about it among your people at home or it may come round to lady s s ears and poor uncle val would get scolded give my love to aunt julia and my cousins i hope to see you all next season in town for ancram and i have quite made up our minds not to stick in that nasty little provincial hole all the year round mrs errington is to go back there directly after the wedding to see about a house for us and get things ready of course if there's anything that i don't like i can alter it myself when i arrive good-bye dear louisa don't forget your affectionate cousin who signs herself perhaps for the last time c c kilfinane from orlando parkins to his sister mrs matchin stubbs longfells westmoreland monday evening my dear jemima i am sorry that you and humphrey should have felt hurt and thought i was making mysteries but i assure you i was quite taken by surprise when i got addington's letter telling me about his wedding and enclosing lord seely's invitation to me to come here i knew nothing about it before i give you my word 
you asked me to write you full details of the affair and i am sure i would if i could but i don't know any more than the rest of the world i don't think much of longfells the land is poor and the house almost tumbling to pieces lord seely is uncommonly polite but i don't much like my lady and she has a beast of a lap-dog that snaps at everybody Arrington is the same as ever, only he looks so much older in these two years. Any one would take him to be five or six and twenty at least. As to the bride, she don't take much notice of me, so I haven't got very well acquainted with her. I ride about the country nearly all day long. Lord Seely has provided me with a pretty decent mount. I shall be glad when the wedding is over, and I can get away, for it's precious dull here. Even your friend Jack Price seems moped and out of sorts, and goes about singing. The heart that once truly lives never forgets, or something like that, enough to give a fellow the blue devils i asked about what you wanted to know about the wedding dresses but i couldn't make out much from the answers i got miss kilfinane is to wear a white silk gown trimmed with something or other that has a french name perhaps you can guess what it is the bridesmaids are fat freckled girls the daughters of the parson i think i have now given you all the particulars i can i wish you and humphrey would come down to pudcombe in september tell him i can give him some fairish shooting and will do all i can to make you both comfortable believe me your affectionate brother o p End of chapter 5Algernon said smilingly, 
"'I hope you have not found it necessary to scold her, my lord. "'The phrase, having a serious conversation with any one, "'always suggests to my mind the administering of a reprimand.' "'No, Ancrum, no, I have not found it necessary to scold Castalia. "'I am very much attached to her, and very anxious for her happiness. "'She is the child of my favourite sister.' "'The old man's voice was not so firm as usual when he said this, "'and he looked up at Algernon with an appealing look. "'Algernon could be pleasant, genial, even affectionate in his manner, but never tender. "'That was more than he could compass by any movement of imitative sympathy. "'He had never even been able so to simulate tenderness "'as to succeed in singing a pathetic song.' Perhaps he had learned that it was useless to make the attempt. At all events, he did not now attempt to exhibit any answering tenderness to Lord Seeley's look and tone of unwanted feeling in speaking of his dead sister's child. His reply was hard, clear, and cheerful, as the chirp of a canary bird. "'I know you've always been extremely good to Castalia, my lord. We are both of us very sensible of your kindness, and very much obliged by it.' "'No, no,' said my lord, waving his hand. "'No, no, no, Castalia owes me nothing. "'She has been to me almost as my own daughter. "'There can be no talk of obligations between her and me.' "'Then he paused for what appeared to be a long time. "'In the silence of the room the damp logs hissed like whispering voices. "'Ancrum,' Lord Seely said at length, "'Castalia is very much attached to you.' "'I assure you, my lord, I am very grateful to her. <clears throat> "'Castalia's is not an expansive nature.' She was perhaps too much repressed and chilled in childhood by living with uncongenial persons, but she is responsive to kindness, and it develops her best qualities. I will frankly own that I am very anxious about her future. You will not owe me a grudge for saying that much, Ancrum. I never owe grudges, my lord, but I trust you have no doubt of my behaving with kindness to Castalia? No, Ancrum, no, I hope not. I believe not. I am glad of that, because the doubt would come rather too late to be of much use, would it not? Algernon spoke with his old bright smile, but two things were observable throughout this interview. Firstly, that Algernon, though still perfectly respectful, no longer addressed his senior with the winning, cordial deference of manner which had so captivated Lord Seely in the beginning of their acquaintance. Secondly, that Lord Seely appeared conscious of some reason in the young man's mind for dissatisfaction, and to be desirous of deprecating that dissatisfaction. At the same time, there seemed to be in Lord Seely an undercurrent of feeling struggling for expression. He had the air of a man who, knowing himself to have right and reason on his side in the main, yet is aware of a tender point in his case, which an unscrupulous adversary will not hesitate to touch, and which he nervously shrinks from having touched. He winced at Algernon's last words, and answered rather hotly, "'It would be too late. Your insinuation is a just one.' If I had any misgivings, I ought to have expressed them and acted on them before. But the fact is that this, the final arrangement of this marriage, took me in a great measure by surprise. So it did me, my lord. Lord Seely had been gazing moodily at the fire. He now suddenly raised his eyes and looked searchingly at Algernon. The young man's face wore an expression of candid amusement. His arched eyebrows were lifted, and he was smiling as unconcernedly as if the subject in hand touched himself no jot. "'I give you my word,' he continued lightly, "'that when Lady Seely first spoke to me about it, "'I was, oh, astonished is no word to express what I felt.' "'A dark red flush came into Lord Seely's withered cheeks "'and mounted to his forehead. "'He dropped his eyes and moved uneasily on his chair, "'passing one hand through the tuft of grey hair "'that stood up above his ear. "'Algernon went on, with an almost boyish frankness of manner. "'Of course, you know, I should hardly have ventured "'to aspire to such an idea quite unassisted, "'and I believe I said something or other to my lady, "'very stumblingly, I have no doubt, "'for I remember feeling very much bewildered.' I said some word about my being a poor devil with nothing in the world to offer a lady in Miss Kilfinane's position, except, of course, my undying devotion. Only one cannot live altogether on that. But Lady Seely was very sanguine and saw no difficulties. She said it could be managed. And she was right, you see. Where there's a will, there's a way. And I am really to be married to Castalia tomorrow. It seems too good to be true. Lord Seely rose and faced the young man, and as he did so, his lordship looked really dignified, for the sincere feeling within him had for once obliterated his habitual uneasy self-consciousness. Ancrum, he said, I am afraid, from what Castalia tells me, that you are greatly dissatisfied with the position I have been able to procure for you. Oh, my lord, Castalia ought not to have said so. If she can content herself in it for a time, how can I venture to complain? I am sorry to find, continued Lord Seely, that your circumstances are more seriously embarrassed than I thought." "'Are they, my lord? I profess I don't know how to disembarrass them. "'You are in debt? "'I had the honour of avowing as much to your lordship "'when my marriage was first discussed, as you doubtless remember. "'Yes, and you named a sum which I—' "'Which your lordship was kind enough to pay, certainly. "'But it now appears that the sum did not cover the whole of your liabilities, Ancrum. 
"'Castalia tells me that you have been annoyed by applications for money quite recently.' Algernon smiled and put his head on one side, as if trying to recall a half-forgotten fact. "'Well,' said he at length, "'upon my word, I have forgotten the exact sum which I did name to your lordship, but I have no doubt it was correct at the time. The worst of it is that my debts have this unfortunate peculiarity. They won't stay paid.' "'It is a great pity, Ancrum, for a young man to get into the habit of thinking lightly of debt. "'It is, in fact,' continued his lordship, growing graver and graver as he spoke, "'a fatal habit of mind. "'My dear lord, I don't think lightly of it by any means. "'But really, is it not best to accept the inevitable with some cheerfulness?' "'The inevitable, Ancrum? "'Yes, my lord, in my position debt was inevitable. "'I could not be a member of your family circle, a frequent inmate of your house, "'doing the things you did, going where you went, without incurring some expense.' "'It was no want of tact which made Algernon speak thus plainly and coarsely. "'He did not fail, as his mother might have done, "'to perceive that his words pained and mortified his hearer. "'He would by no means have aimed such a shaft at Lady Seely, "'knowing that nature had protected her feelings with a hide of some toughness, "'and knowing, moreover, that my lady would unhesitatingly "'have flung back some verbal missile, at least equally rough and heavy. "'But my lord was at once more vulnerable and more scrupulous, "'and although Algernon was the last person in the world "'to be guilty of gratuitous cruelty, "'yet if one is to fight, he had best use the most effective weapons, "'and take advantage of any chink in the enemy's armour "'to drive one's javelin home.' "'I regret,' said Lord Seely, with a little catching of the breath, like a man who has received a cold douche, "'I deplore that your intimacy with my family should have led you into a false position.' "'Not at all, my lord. My position in your family has been a very pleasant one. "'I ought, perhaps it was my duty, to have inquired more particularly into your means, "'and to have ascertained whether they sufficed for the life you were leading in London. "'You were very young and without experience. "'I reproach myself, Ancrum.' "'Don't do that, my lord. There is really no need, I am sure. Nobody is the worse for the few pounds I owe at the moment. Not even my tailor, who has cheated me handsomely, doing me the honour to treat me as one of your lordship's own class.' Lord Seely bent down his grey head and meditated with a pained and anxious face. Then he looked up and said, "'You know, Ancrum, that I am not a rich man for one in my station.' Algernon bowed gracefully. "'Had I been so, I should have made a settlement upon Castalia, but although I have no daughters of my own to provide for—' with a little sigh. Yet my property is very strictly tied up. There are claims on it, too, of various sorts. Lady Seely screws all she can out of him for that nephew of hers, was Algy's mental comment. And, in brief, I am not in a position to command any large sums of ready money. I believe I said as much to you before. Algernon bowed again and smiled. Well, I repeat it now, in order to impress on you the fact, that neither you nor Castalia must look to me for pecuniary help in the future. Oh, my lord! I do not say that Castalia might not have a right to ask such help of me, but I merely assure you that it will be out of my power to grant it. You perhaps scarcely realise how poor a man may be who has a fairly large rent-roll? I think I have begun to realise it, my lord. Lord Seely looked quickly into the young man's face, but it was smiling and inscrutable. Well, he resumed, I will only add that for this once, and presuming your present debts are not heavy— Oh, dear, no, a trifle— I will discharge them if you will let me have the amount accurately. I have a great repugnance to the thought of Castalia, and you beginning your married life in debt. A thousand thanks. It will be better for us to start fair. I hope, Ancrum, that you will use every endeavour to live clearly within your means, and to make the best of your circumstances. The fact is, this marriage has been hurried on. Algernon did not answer in words, but he gave an expressive shrug and smile, which said as plainly as possible, I have not hurried it on. Lord Seely coloured deeply, and seemed to shrink bodily, as if he had received a blow. He went on hastily, and with less than his usual self-possession. I—I I have felt, rather than perceived, a, a little touch of bitterness in your manner lately. There, there, we will not quibble about the word. If not bitter, you have not been at all events in the frame of mind I wished and hoped to find you in. You are young, and youth is apt to be a little unreasonable in its expectations— I own, I admit, that your worldly position will not be, ah, uh, exactly brilliant, but I assure you that in these days there are many gentlemen of good abilities and industry who would be glad of it. Oh, I am fully aware of my good fortune, my lord. Besides, you know, this is only a stepping-stone. Yes, we, we hope so, but, Ancrum, and this is what I had in mind to say to you frankly, don't neglect or despise the present employment in looking forward to something better. By no means— for your own sake, your own sake, I earnestly advise you not to give way to feelings of discontent. 
do i look discontented upon my word your lordship is doing me singular injustice there is a smiling discontent as well as a frowning discontent and i don't know but that it is the worst of the two algernon laughed outright well said he you must own that it is a little difficult to give satisfaction his light smooth tone jarred disagreeably on lord seely if the latter had thought to make any impression on the young man to draw from him any outburst of feeling he had signally failed algernon's words could not be objected to but the tone in which they were uttered was completely nonchalant his nonchalance increased in proportion to lord seely's earnestness a year ago algernon would have brought his manner into harmony with my lord's mood he would have been grave attentive eager to show his appreciation of my lord's kindness and his value for my lord's advice but now there was some malice in his smiling good humour a little cruelty in the brightness of his unruffled serenity he was genuinely tickled at seeing the pompous little nobleman embarrassed in speaking to him algernon errington and he enjoyed what comedy there might be in the situation none the less because his patron suffered in truth algernon was discontented his was not a gnawing black sort of discontent he neither grew lean nor yellow nor morose but his irony was sometimes flavoured with acidity and instead of being easily tolerant of such follies as zeal enthusiasm or fervent reverence he was now apt to speak of them with a disdainful superiority and he had too an air of having washed his hands of any concern with his own career of laying the responsibility on destiny or whomsoever it might concern of awaiting with sarcastic patience the next turn of the wheel as if life were neither a battle nor a march but a gigantic game of rouge et noir with terrible odds in favour of the bank lord seely was no match for this youth of two-and-twenty lord seely had intended to impress him deeply to read him a lecture in which olympian severity should be tempered by mercy to convince him by dignified and condescending methods of his great good fortune in having secured the hand of castalia kilfinane of caldkale and of his great unreasonableness not to say presumption in not accepting that boon on bended knee instead of grumbling at being made postmaster of whitford but in order to make an impression it does not suffice to have tools only the surface to be impressed must also exist and be adapted to the operation how impress the bright cool shining liquid bosom of a lake for instance oar and keel pebble and arrow wind and current are alike powerless to make a furrow that shall last lord seely laboured under the disadvantage in this crisis of feeling for other persons with some keenness a circumstance which frittered away his power considerably and made him vacillating algernon's capacities for feeling were on this occasion steadily concentrated on himself and this gave his behaviour a solid consistency which was felt even beneath the surface lightness of his manner i hope said lord seely rather sadly than solemnly i do most earnestly hope ancram that you will be happy in this marriage your lordship is very good i assure you i feel your goodness he said it as if he had been accepting an invitation to dinner and and that you will do your best to make castalia happy you may rely on my doing my best there are discrepancies perhaps disparities but those marriages are not always the happiest in which the external circumstances on both sides seem to be best matched you are young you are untrammelled you have no irrevocable past behind you to regret i do not see no i do not see why with mutual regard and respect you should not make a good life of it these are the most lugubrious nuptial felicitations that ever were offered to a bridegroom i should fancy thought algernon and he had some difficulty in keeping his countenance so vividly did he feel the ludicrous aspect of his lordship's well-meant effort at impressing him i should feel some sense of responsibility if if things were not to turn out as brightly as we hope and believe and believe they will turn out oh don't distress yourself about that my lord cried algernon he had very nearly said don't apologize there is the dressing-bell he added with alacrity taking his hat up from the table if your lordship has no further commands i think i yes go ancram i will not detain you longer remember said lord seely taking the young man's hand between both his own and speaking in a tremulous voice remember ancram that i wish to serve you my intention all along has been to do my best for you you have been a very pleasant inmate in my home ancram be good to castalia for good or for evil you are her fate now no one can come between you be good to her my dear lord i beg you to believe that i will make castalia's happiness the study of my life and oh i have no doubt we shall get on capitally with your interest it can't be long before we get into a better berth i know you'll do your best for us for castalia's sake oh and mine too i'm happy to believe yes certainly i really am in such a state of mud that i believe my very hair is splashed it will take me all the time there remains for dressing to get myself presentably clean positively au revoir my lord and thank you very very much 
With his jauntiest step and brightest smile, Algernon left the room. Lord Seely returned to his chair before the hearth, resumed his moody, musing attitude, and sat there alone, with his head sunk on his breast, until they called him to dinner. End of chapter 6《ボリューム2 Chapter 7 of a Charming Fellow。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。A Charming Fellow by Francis Eleanor Trollope。Volume 2 Chapter 7 。In the first week of August, Mrs. Errington returned to Whitford. She had got over her annoyance at not having been entrusted sooner with the news of Algernon's engagement to Miss Kilfinane. By dint of telling her friends so, she had at last persuaded herself that she had been in the secret all along and if she felt any other mortifications and disappointments connected with her son's marriage she kept them to herself but it is probable that she did not keenly feel any such she was not sensitive and she did believe that by connecting himself so nearly with lord seely's family algernon was advancing his prospects of success in the world these sources of comfort combined with an excellent digestion and the perennial gratification of contemplating her own claims to distinction as contrasted with those of her neighbours kept the worthy lady in good spirits and she returned to whitford in a kind of full blow of cheerfulness and importance her reception there at the outset was however far from being what she had looked forward to she had written to rhoda announcing the day and hour of her arrival and requesting that james maxfield should meet her at the blue bell inn where the coach stopped with a fly for the conveyance of herself and her luggage to her old quarters. Mrs. Errington had not previously written to Rhoda from Westmoreland, but she had forwarded to her at different times two copies of the Applethwaite Advertiser. In one of these journals a preliminary announcement of Algernon's marriage had appeared, under the heading of Alliance in High Life. In the second there was an account of the wedding and the breakfast, and the rejoicings in the village of Longfells, which did much credit to the imaginative powers of the writer according to the applethwaite advertiser the ceremony had been imposing the breakfast sumptuous and the village demonstrations enthusiastic mrs errington had bought twenty copies of the newspaper for distribution among her friends and she pleased herself with thinking how grateful the maxfields would be to her for sending them the papers with the interesting paragraphs marked in red ink she also looked forward with much complacency to having rhoda for a listener to all her narrations about the wedding and life at longfells and the great people whom she had met there rhoda was such a capital listener and then besides and beyond all that mrs errington was fond of rhoda and had more motherly warmth of feeling for her than she had as yet attained to for her new daughter-in-law mrs errington's head was stretched out of the coach window as the vehicle clattered up the archway of the bluebell inn it was about seven o'clock on a fine august evening and there was ample light enough for the traveller to distinguish all the familiar faces of the streets through which she passed james will be standing at the inn-yard ready to receive me she thought and i suppose the fly will be waiting at the corner by the booking-office i wonder whether the driver will be the lame old man or young simmons she was still debating this question when the coach turned sharply round under the archway and stopped in the great rambling yard of the old-fashioned bluebell inn mrs errington got down unassisted james maxfield was not there she looked round in bewilderment standing hot dusty and tired in the yard where after a bustling waiter had tripped up to her to ask if she wanted a room and tripped away again no one took any heed of her a fly was not to be had in whitford at a moment's notice after waiting for some ten minutes mrs errington found there was nothing for it but to walk to her lodgings she left her luggage in the coach office to be called for and set out carrying a rather heavy handbag and hurrying through the streets at a pace much quicker than her usual dignified rate of moving she wished not to be seen and recognized by any passing acquaintance under circumstances so unfavorable to an impressive or triumphant demeanor arrived at jonathan maxfield's house the aspect of things was not much improved betty grimshaw opened the door and stared in surprise on seeing mrs errington she had not been expected mr maxfield was over at duckwell at his son's farm james was busy in the storehouse and as for rhoda she was away on a visit to Miss Bodkin at the seaside, and had been for some weeks. A letter? Oh, if a letter had come for Rhoda, her father would have sent it on to her. It was a two-day's post from where she was to Whitford. And the newspapers? Betty did not know. She had not seen them. Her brother-in-law had had them, she supposed. Yes, she had heard that Mr. Algernon was married, or going to be married. The servants from Pudcombe Hall had spoken of it when they came into the shop. Jonathan had not said anything on the subject as far as she knew mrs errington knew what jonathan was he never was given to much conversation and it was betty's opinion delivered very frankly that jonathan grew crustier and closer as he got older but wouldn't mrs errington like a cup of tea
Betty would have the kettle boiling in a few minutes. Mrs. Errington felt rather forlorn as she entered her old sitting-room and looked around her. It was trim and neat, indeed, and spotlessly clean, but it had the chill, repellent look of an uninhabited apartment. The corner cupboard was locked, and its treasure of old china hidden from view. Algernon's books were gone from the shelf above the piano. A white cloth was spread over the sofa, and the hearth-rug was turned upside down, displaying a grey lining, instead of the gay-coloured scraps of cloth. She missed Rhoda. She had become accustomed to Algernon's absence from the familiar room, but Rhoda's absence made a blank in it that was depressing, and perhaps Mrs. Errington herself was surprised to find how dreary the place looked, without the girl's gentle face and modest figure. She gladly accepted Betty Grimshaw's invitation to take her tea downstairs in the comfortable bright kitchen, instead of alone in the melancholy gentility of her own sitting-room. Betty was as wooden-faced and grim and rigid in her aspect as ever, but she was not unfriendly towards her old lodger, and, moreover, she was entirely respectful in her manner, holding it as a fixed article of her faith that gentle folks born were intended by providence to be treated with deference, and desiring to show that she herself had been trained to becoming behaviour under the roof of a person of quality. It was little more than nine o'clock when Mrs. Errington rose to go to bed, being tired with her journey. As she did so, she said, "'Mrs. Grimshaw, will you get James to send a handcart for my luggage in good time to-morrow?' "'Oh, your luggage,' returned Betty. "'Well, do you think it's worth while to send for it, if you're not going to stay?' Mrs. Errington was so much astonished by this speech that she sat down again in the chair she had just quitted. Then, after a minute's pause, her mind, which did not move very rapidly, arrived at what she supposed to be the explanation of Betty's words. "'Oh, I see,' she said. "'You took for granted that on my son's marriage I should leave you and join him. "'But it is not so, my good soul. "'My daughter-in-law has implored me to live with them, but I have refused. "'It is better for the young people to be by themselves, "'and I prefer my own independence also. "'No, my good Mrs. Grimshaw, I shall remain in my old quarters "'until Mr. Algernon leaves Whitford for good. "'And perhaps even then I may not give you up altogether. "'Who knows?' "'Betty hesitated for an instant before replying.' then jonathan has not said anything to you about giving up the rooms good gracious no i have not heard from mr maxfield at all i suppose he didn't expect you back quite so soon and there i suppose i won't take upon myself to speak for him i shouldn't have got on with my brother-in-law all these years if i hadn't made it a rule to try for peace and quietness and never interfere but mrs errington persisting in her demand that betty should explain herself more fully the latter at length confessed that during the past two or three weeks jonathan maxfield had declared his intention to get rid of his lodger and of not letting the first floor of his house again your sitting-room is to be kept as a kind of drawing-room for rhoda as i understand jonathan she said a drawing-room for rhoda mrs errington could not believe her senses why what is mr maxfield thinking of she exclaimed oh you don't know what a fuss jonathan has been making lately about rhoda before you went away you know marm as he had begun to spend a deal of money on her clothes and since then more and more it's been all his talk as rhoda was to be a lady the notion has got stuck fast in his head and wild horses wouldn't drag it out mrs errington rose very majestically i much fear she said i much fear that i am responsible for this delusion of your brother-in-law i have a little spoiled the girl and taken too much notice of her i regret it now but really rhoda is such a sweet creature that i don't know that i have been so very much to blame either it is true i have introduced her to my friends and brought her forward a little beyond her station but i little thought a man of mr maxfield's common sense would have been so utterly led away by kindly meant patronage well i don't know as it's so much that ma'am replied betty in a matter-of-fact tone as it is that jonathan has latterly been thinking a deal about his money and he knows money will do great things money can never confer gentle birth my good creature no for sure ma'am that's what i say myself i know my catechism and i was brought up to respect my superiors but you see jonathan's heart is greatly set on his riches he's a well-off man is my brother-in-law more so than many folks think he's been a close man all his life and for that matter he's close enough now in some things and screws me down in the housekeeping pretty tight but for rhoda he seems to grudge nothing and wants her to make a show and a splash almost if you can fancy such a thing of jonathan but there's no saying how men will turn out not even the old ones i'm sure i often and often thank my stars i've kept single no offence to you ma'am mrs errington went to bed in a bewildered frame of mind tired as she was the news she had heard kept her awake for some time 
leave her lodgings leave old max's house which had been her home for so many years it was incredible and indeed before long she had made up her mind to resist old max's intention of turning her out i shall give him a good talking to-morrow she said to herself stupid old man he really must not be allowed to make himself so absurd and then mrs errington fell asleep but the next day old max did not return to be talked to nor the day after that james maxfield went over to duckwell and came back bringing a formal notice to mrs errington to quit the lodgings signed by his father what does this mean james asked mrs errington with much emphasis and wide-open eyes james did not know what it meant he did not apparently much care either he had never been on very friendly terms with the erringtons having indeed come but seldom in contact with them during all the time they had lived under the same roof with him and had perhaps been a little jealous in his sullen silent way of their petting of rhoda at all events on the present occasion he was not communicative nor very civil he had performed his father's behests and he knew nothing more his father was not coming back home just yet and james volunteered the opinion that he didn't mean to come back until mrs errington should be gone all this was strange and disagreeable but mrs errington was not of an irritable or anxious temperament and her self-complacency was of too solid a kind to be much affected even by ruder rubs than any which could be given by james maxfield's uncouth bluntness i shall take no notice whatever of this she said with serene dignity when your father comes back i shall talk to him meanwhile i have a great many important things to do the good lady did in truth begin at once to busy herself in seeking a house for algernon and in getting it furnished there was but a month to make all arrangements in and all mrs errington's friends who could by any possibility be pressed into the service were required to assist her the dockets rose and violet MacDougall, mrs smith the surgeon's wife and even miss chubb were sent hither and thither asked to write notes to make inquiries to have interviews with landlords and to take as much trouble and make as much fuss as possible in the task of getting ready an abode for mr and the honourable mrs algernon errington a house was found without much difficulty it was a small isolated cottage on the outskirts of the town with a garden behind it which ran down to the meadows bordering the wit and was the very house belonging to barker the chemist of which mrs errington had written to her friend mrs bodkin it was really a very humble dwelling but the rent of it was quite as large as algernon would be able to afford mrs errington said i prefer a small place for them if they took a more pretentious house they would be expected to entertain and you know my dear sir or madam as the case might be that there is a great mixture in whitford society and that would not suit my daughter-in-law of course you perceive that don't you and then the person so addressed might flatter him or herself with the idea of belonging to the unmixed portion of society indeed this terrible accusation of being mixed was one which mrs errington was rather fond of bringing against the social gatherings in whitford and she had once been greatly offended and a good deal puzzled by mr diamond's asking her what objection there could be to that and challenging her to point out any good thing on earth from a bowl of punch upwards which was not mixed but however this might be no one believed at all that the mixture in whitford society was the real reason for young errington's inhabiting so small a house they knew perfectly well that if algernon's means had been larger his house would have been larger also and yet mrs errington's flourish was not without its effect on some persons they in their turn repeated her lamentations on the mixture to such of their acquaintances as did not happen to be also her acquaintances and as there were very few individuals in whitford either so eccentric or so courageous as mr diamond this mysterious mixture was generally acknowledged with shrugs and head-shakings to be a very great evil indeed at the end of about a fortnight old max one day reappeared in his own house and marched upstairs to mrs errington's sitting-room well ma'am said he without any preliminary greetings whatsoever i suppose you understood the written notice to quit that i sent you but as my son james informs me that you don't seem to be taking any steps in consequence of it i've come to say that you will have to remove out of my abode on the twenty seventh of this month and not a day later so you can act according to your judgment in finding another place to dwell in mrs errington was inspecting the contents of a packing-case which had been sent from london by lady seely it contained as her ladyship said some odds and ends that would be useful to the young couple the only article of any value in the whole collection was a porcelain vase which had long stood in obscurity on a side-table in lord seely's study and would not be missed thence lady seely at all events would not miss it as she seldom entered the room and therefore she had generously added it to the odds and ends mrs errington looked up a little flushed with the exertion of stooping over the packing-case and confronted mr maxfield her round red full moon face contrasted in a lively manner with the old man's grey lank harsh visage 
the years as they passed did not improve old max's appearance and as soon as she beheld him mrs errington was convinced of the justice of betty grimshaw's remark that her brother-in-law seemed to have grown closer and crustier than ever of late why mr maxfield said the lady condescendingly how do you do i have been wanting to see you come sit down and let us talk matters over old max stood in the doorway glaring at her i don't know ma'am as there's any matters i want to talk over with you he returned you had better understand that i mean what i say you'll find it more convenient to believe me at once and to act accordin do you mean to say that you intend to turn me out mr maxfield i have given you a legal notice to quit ma'am you needn't call it turning you out unless you like he had begun to move away when mrs errington exclaimed but i really don't comprehend this at all what will rhoda think of it maxfield stopped hesitatingly with his hand on the banisters at the top of the landing rhoda said he gruffly oh rhoda has nothing to say to it one way or t'other but i want to have something to say to her i assure you it was a great disappointment to me not to find rhoda here on my return i am very fond of her and shall continue to be so as long as she merits it it is not her fault poor girl if other people forget themselves maxfield took his hand off the banisters and turned round since you're so fond of rhoda he said with a queer expression on his sour old face you'll be glad to know where she is and the company she's in i know that she is at the seaside with my friends mrs and miss bodkin she is at the seaside with her friends mrs and miss bodkin miss minnie is a real lady and she understands how to treat rhoda and knows that the lord has made a lady of rhoda by nature mrs errington stared in utter astonishment the suspicion began to form and strengthen itself in her mind that the old man was positively out of his senses if so his insanity had taken an extremely unpleasant turn for her i really was not prepared for being turned out of my lodgings after all these years she said reverting to the point that most nearly touched herself i have not been prepared for many things as have happened over all these years but i am ready to meet em when they come well but now mr maxfield let us see if we cannot make an arrangement if you have any different views about the rent i the rent what do you think your bit of rent matters to me i want the rooms for the use of my daughter miss maxfield and there's an end of it oh he certainly cannot be in his right senses to address me in this manner thought mrs errington maxfield went on i see you've got a box of rubbish there littering about the place i give you warning not to unpack any more here for out everything'll have to go on the twenty seventh of this month as sure as my name's jonathan maxfield mr maxfield you are certainly forgetting yourself rubbish indeed these are a few a very few of the valuable wedding presents sent to my son and daughter by lady seely old max made a grating sound which was intended for a laugh although his bushy grey eyebrows were drawn together in a heavy frown the while then he suddenly burst out in a kind of cold fury pooh he cried presents valuable presents you don't deceive anybody by that look here if the old carpet or any of this furniture in this room would be of any assistance to you you can take it i'll give it to you a free gift the place is going to be done up and new furnished for miss maxfield furnished handsome fit for a young lady of property fit for a young lady that'll have a sum of money on the day she marries if i'm pleased with her choice as'll make some folks mouths water it won't be reckoned by twenties nor yet by hundreds won't miss maxfield's fortin you can take the old carpet and mahogany table and the high-backed chairs and put em among your valuable presents they're too old-fashioned for miss maxfield's drawing-room and with a repetition of the grating laugh old max tramped heavily downstairs and was heard to bang the door of his own parlour mrs errington sat motionless for nearly a quarter of an hour staring at the open door mad she exclaimed at length drawing a long breath quite mad but i wonder if there is any truth in what he says about rhoda's money dear me why she'll be quite a catch End of chapter seven